I didn't want Benno for, didn't want him. He was a dog that wasn't trusted. I don't want to go out there and have a dog that's a liability to the assault force that nobody trusts when he's off leash. Benno is seeing red. He's ready to bite. Like I just pulled him away from him wanting to bite. Dogs have no concept of, concept of lead flying through the yeah. air. He just hears the gunfire and thinks that there's something to eat. I got Benno really in tune, and really I got the people around me in tune and trusting that dog. Benno looked at those people as his pack now. I would come in to the coughs when we were back home, and I would cut him loose in the coughs, and he would run around like an idiot, and everybody would Benno and love on him and shit like that. The, the bond and the relationship with me and that dog, when you go back in your room and it's just you and him, yeah, that dog, that dog heard me cry. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent nine and a half years in the Army, uh, predominantly as a ranger and a ranger canine handler. He's conducted eight deployments uh, between Iraq and Afghanistan, all of which combat-oriented. Uh, he is a Purple Heart recipient. He was Benno's handler, rest in peace, as well as uh, Canine Leica, which uh, is a very famous dog. He's been on Nat Geo uh, cover and, and a host of other uh, publications. He is a big supporter and integrated with uh, pro <clears throat> the Duco Project with Rick Hogg, who's been a guest on here. He's the CEO of Swamp Fox Canine as well as Trent Canine. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Julian McDonald. Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> Thanks for coming on, man. I know uh, we've been working on getting you here for, for a while. And, uh, you know, this is one of the uh, most uh, excited podcasts that I, uh, or, or one of the podcasts I've been the most excited about for a long time, just because of your background, uh, everything that you've done dog related uh, with my um, affiliation with the industry, if you will. Most of the guests I have on uh, are either special operations guys or they're just canine handlers. I've had, had a few that, that were soft canine handlers, but uh, just the stories that, that you have and the things that you've been through with the dogs that you've been through at the time that you were in, um, you know, is is just a kind of consummate textbook, uh, best case scenario to uh, to be honored to to be able to sit down and interview you. So thanks for uh, for making the time and coming here. Yeah, man, honor honor to be here. Um, really. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, what uh, what's the last book that you read uh, and completed? Um, it was Seeds of Terror. And what uh, is that like a? An, ex an extremist fundamental uh, type type of uncovering or no it, you know it kind of goes over afghanistan and opium oh, okay. right and the afghanistan and the opium and the and the heroin and the the riches that are in the ground that kind of you know kind of keep the war going on there kind of yeah. keep the war machine rolling there um did uh, did reading that um convolute or or taint your idea of the time that you spent there like did it did it leave a bad taste in your mouth or change how you think about it? It definitely, <clears throat> I read it on my very, read it a few times, right? And so I read it on my very first deployment. I was in um, Afghanistan in 2006. And um, and so we were at very many different outposts, Salerno, um, Salerno being primarily one of them. And um, and honestly, like my first, my first mission I ever ran was an objective called Snake River. And um, it was a, a two platoon assault um, with uh, with SEAL Team Six, and um, upon Xville, one sixtieth, where it was Xfilling um, the first platoon that was getting out of there, and uh, and the enemy actually had interlocking sectors of fire with two dishkas, and uh, they were able to take down that one sixtieth helicopter. Yeah. And so we were put into a position very quickly to surround that helicopter and protect that piece of equipment until they could get they could wake up the powers that be to authorize a, a bomb strike on that on that helo so it quickly turned into a a very serious situation and and as a young ranger you know 20 years old um very first mission i'd ever been on i thought that's how every mission was gonna yeah. be you know what i mean like i i really did i and in my head i was like man this is why everybody looks so young is because everybody yeah. die. you know everybody's yeah. dying you know yeah. what i mean and so that kind of set a. Uh, uh, a thing in my head where it was almost like, you know, at any, any given day, anything can happen. 
and and you could die at any moment and so um you know uh, i i picked up that book and i found that book when i was in um afghanistan on that deployment and i started reading it because i wanted to know kind of get inside the enemy's head and i wanted to know what exactly they were fighting for and and uh and stuff like that and like obviously they don't like us um i get that we're americans um but you know even though we, we we go in night in and night out and we're just destroying them right like why are they still coming out and fighting how do they have the means and the funds to do this right like how do dirt farmers acquire ak-47s and ammo and dish guns and pkm machine guns um in order to you know essentially in order to try to kill us um and so i believe that a lot of that has to come with heroin i believe that has to a lot of that has to come with the, the heroin production that's there i think and what afghanistan is responsible for 90 percent of the world's heroin i mean I, I don't know if you can put a dollar sign on that you know what i mean mike i mean that's yeah. a lot of money uh, i'm gonna take a, a quick break i, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. No, I mean it's it's been a weird, not weird. It's it's been a uh, a tumultuous history with you know the United States, the DEA, and and you know what comes out of that country. And there's a lot of uh, I think misconceptions um, you know publicly with with most uh, you know of our society that <clears throat> that views uh, things very differently than than what they are. You know, and it is unfortunate that you know it's kind of a weird hamster wheel of of irony in that you know you've got forces that are fighting there and, and, you know, what they're growing there is, is fueling money, you know, from the United States societally that, that's fueling the war efforts that's also combating Americans fighting them there. And, and it's just this weird, ironic, circular fucking shit sandwich. Oh, know? absolutely. And then when you look at the, <clears throat> when you look at where Afghanistan's located, right, you have Russia and you have China, right? What, what forms that is what they call the, the ancient Silk Road, right, of trade. Yeah. Um, to me, that's still a very active uh, trade route. And so um, there's a lot of people that surround those borders that have those very special interests in what is being cultivated in the earth, right? Yeah. Because that is lots of money. Yeah. And so when you're, you know, as it grew, you know, 2011, 2012 timeframe, when you're up in the mountains and you're, the enemy is foreign fighters, green eyes, red beards, and, uh, and, you know, the, the guys you're killing all have, you know, Reebok high tops on, no lie. Reebok high tops on, they're in uniform, and all their AKs are China-stamped AKs. Yeah. You know what I mean? It makes you, yeah, you know, it, 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 really, <clears throat> it really puts things into perspective. And then when you look at it, you know, as a young man in my head, you know, kind of being as wild as I was in my younger years, my teenage years, I'm kind of looking at this, and I'm like, I'm like man, I... I you know, you're always like in your head, you're like, oh, I think I have a solution to end this war. You know what I mean? And um, in my head, the solution would have been to firebomb and destroy every heroin crop out there in that whole landscape and completely shut off their their means of funding. You know what I mean? And, and completely shut down that effort right then and there. Yeah. You Was know? that something that you ever tried to bring up the chain of command? No, yeah. no. I mean, I, I, you know, I mentioned it through frustration, but yeah. like, like I said, like a, a dude that's a PFC specialist, yeah. like sure you know, thing, E5, buddy. E5 yeah. you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not getting any, anything through to, you know, yeah. <laughs> Admiral yeah. McRaven. Yeah. He's like, not asking <laughs> you what you think. No, no, they're yeah. like, Hey man, you get paid on the first and the 15th yeah. and your SGL is 400 K shut the fuck up and yeah. sit down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's, but the, it's, you know, when you start having friends that are dying, over there, right? And you have animals that are dying and you're seeing the sacrifice that they're putting in, you know, year in and year out. You want to know why, yeah, you know? And so that was, that's always left a big hole in me because um, it is, it's fun hunting them down, right? It's, it's fun hunting the enemy down. It's fun using a dog to do it. 
it's awesome being able to get into a helicopter and do direct night action raids where you're landing on people's front doorsteps and and you know what i mean just like you know taking out killing or capturing the enemy but when you start having like really good friends die on the battlefield you you want to know like it, why yeah. you know what i mean you want to know why it's it's it goes beyond it has it has to go beyond the the, the twin towers right yeah. like that's just you know that's like the overall right osama bin laden like that's like the overall thing that that that's like the ultimate like that's like the boss right um there has to be other reasons why. Yeah. and so when you start looking at it and you start wondering why you know why aren't we doing this and why haven't we been doing this and you're going on missions and raids and you're finding heroin production plants you know on yeah. missions that you're running and you're not blowing those up yeah like like why the fuck not yeah like yeah. why not like that's money that's money that's killing us yeah. like what are we doing yeah so yeah <laughs> no, no no it's it's interesting i mean it's neat to see um you know reading a book especially at that age and, and reading it multiple times because uh, that shit is important you know the the why is is really the secret to to life what you know no matter what you're doing why are you doing it and are you fulfilled and is there purpose behind it if if the answer is no to those then you know most people are, are typically pretty miserable what uh what is your best childhood memory oh man my best childhood memory um my calling my papa he's my grandfather um, he was kind of the man that raised me, right? And so I was raised by a, you know, by a man, and he, you know, from the time I was a child, probably 12 years old, all the way until I was <clears throat> 20 years old, and I joined the military, or 19 years old and joined the military. Uh, my grandfather was my father figure. And so the best memory I have with him was, um, was killing deer, going hunting with him, and yeah. going fishing with him. So anything that has to do with him and hunting and fishing – I learned a lot of life lessons yeah. uh, with him. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and he's and he's still alive. <clears throat> wow, he's still alive. And so that's incredible. He's, he, fuck, man, he had a he had a stroke like two months ago, and uh, he's already had a triple bypass back when I was a teenager. But he, he had a stroke here recently. Within a month, he traveled all the way to Florida to come see his grandkids. Wow, you know what that's I mean? Funny. Like he's just he's a machine. Yeah, and uh, and funny. I asked him, I'm like, hey man, like what? How do you like? How do you do it? Like yeah. you know everything. And he's like, you just don't stop. If you stop, you die. Yeah. Is he you know? Irish also? What's that? Is he where the Irish comes from? Yeah. 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 Fucking good old hard, hardcore Irish guys. Dude, right? he's. I mean, let me tell you, yeah. he's he's something. And he was a Vietnam veteran, yeah, uh, cool. Bronze Star Valor recipient, um, multiple multiple tours in Vietnam. Yeah. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, what is your morning routine on a on a normal morning where you're in town and it's just kind of a standard day? What time do you get up? Do you eat? Do you work out? What What does that first few hours look like? Yeah, so uh, wake up at 4 a.m., um, make my coffee, collect myself. I have about 30 minutes of drinking my coffee and getting ready for the gym. By 4.30, I like to be out the door. I do um, an hour at the gym. Um, I'm working whatever specific uh you know, muscle group I'm, I'm working that day. And then when I get done with the hour at the gym, I go to another gym. It's really a rec center. And I sit in the steam room and I do, um, I do a hundred pushups and I do probably about four, 400 or 450 reps of different ab exercises. It totals out to be like 400 and something reps. And it's all in a steam room and it's done at about 30 minutes, you yeah. know, 30 minutes sitting in there. So it's 30 minutes off and on in there. And, um, <clears throat> I call that, uh, by by the time you're done, you're you're definitely touching the dragon, yeah. if you will. You know what I mean. You're definitely like you're you're exhausted, you're tired, and um, just the, the the release of endorphins afterwards yeah. um, is is amazing. And then once I get done with that, you're looking at I mean at seven o'clock by then, right? Yeah. If I haven't done all this by seven o'clock, I'm starting to get pretty stressed out that I'm not yeah. having a fulfilled day. Yeah. And uh, and so then I get home, shower, and then it's um, it's it's breaking and training right? It's breaking and training the dogs. And then it's, um, I like to have the dogs all broken trained by 10. So that gives me about three hours, two, two and a half, three hours. And then, um, you know, obviously I have to set an alarm to eat lunch. Cause if I don't, then I forget and then yeah. I don't eat, um, eat lunch and then, uh, and then right back to dogs. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you not eat anything the first five hours of the day? Oh man, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> my bad. Yeah, so you forget to even yeah, say that. Yeah, I do. I do forget to eat. Yeah. But um, after the gym, what I eat is I eat real light. So it'll be um, like the the Chobani's, um, like they're like yogurt yeah. drinks. So I'll I'll tank two of those, and then I'll eat um, two Chobani's, 
uh, yogurts. Yeah. And then gotcha. that's, I, I eat real light. Yeah. And then, but for dinner, I pack it on. Yeah. I, I eat heavy dinner. <clears throat> If you spend 30 minutes in a steam room after you work out, do you, I mean, do you spend the rest of the day fucking mainline in water to, to rehydrate? Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. You're looking at, you know, when you do that five five times a week, um, I mean, you're drinking at least a gallon of water, at yeah. least a gallon of water, yeah. and that's by noon. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I like to see my piss clear by, by yeah. noon. Yeah. From Coke to clear in three hours. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so like in an instance like this trip where, you know, you stay in a hotel, how, how do you modify being that regimented and that active that early to where like now you, you don't have the dogs to deal with, you're not at your gym, you, you know, you, you don't have that. Because that's a pretty specific, hardcore and disciplined routine that's very thorough and, and time consuming. So mm. when does that throw you way off if, if you're here and you don't do that? Or do you try to supplement or? If it's... So, you know, like, for example, like this trip, I'm here, you know, less, less really a little over 24 hours, right? Like right when I get done here, I'm going to be, I'm going to be traveling back. I got here yesterday at noon from traveling, woke up at one in the morning to actually get, get down here. Um, so I could pick up that, that, uh, rescue dog I was going to go pick up. But like today I didn't set an alarm. I was like, you know what? I don't need to set an alarm. Uh, and lo and behold, it doesn't matter. Like my internal alarm kicks off and, and I'm up at four in the morning. I woke up at four this morning and um, I already knew I wasn't going to go back to bed. Uh, so, you know, I just, you know, took my time, took a shower, got on my phone, looked over everything on my phone, you know, went through my planner, made sure my planner was good, kind of set, kind of set down people I needed to call while I was making my trip back home to just kind of uh, better um, kind of dial in my shot group. You know what I mean? Like, okay, like if I can't work out or I don't have enough time to work out or that's just not in the works, then what can I do to, to, to improve my fighting position in life? Right. And that was just to, um, just plan and let's overly plan what we got to do. Um, and you know, that'll, that'll keep you busy on the drive home. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, where, uh, where are you originally from? Oh man, I was born in, uh, so when my, my dad, he's also air force, he retired 25, 25 years um of being in the air force and so i was born at cannon air force base in new mexico okay and so <clears throat> i was born there um when i was two we moved to england so lived in england for two years as well and then moved back to clovis new mexico do you remember england at all i remember statues really like that's really what i remember out of england i remember statues i remember kind of their their preschools were different to where I mean, it was super proper. Like you had to keep your hands on the desk like this, and if if you got out of line, they swatted your hands with a ruler, and you had the to sit. Bit, you, huh? yeah, 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 like you had to sit at a desk a certain way. And um, by the time I had gotten back, like I've seen VHS video of me, and by the time I've gotten back, like I'm proper proper English. I'm oh, speaking, sure. and what you happened? Know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lost it all. I know, and yeah. so uh, so yeah, we you know we moved there um, back to Clovis, and then from Clovis moved to Texas. And then um, my parents got a divorce, and um, and my dad, being heavy heavily careered in his Air Force thing, he kind of deta he 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 detached himself from from me and my brother. I think for more or less mental health reasons, and he was dealing with his own things. Um, I think so. He kind of detached from us, and me and Andy, my brother, we went to uh, live in Arkansas, where that's where my mom, that's where my mom was um, essentially raised was oh. in the same little small hometown so me and my brother we went out there um to a little town called harrison arkansas and uh and we were you know that's that's where we lived and so <clears throat> my mom you know god love her she you know her job was to love me right and she did a great job loving me as a kid um the burden of raising me to be a man was left to my grandfather and he you know he never asked to do it nobody ever asked him to do it that was just something that he took upon himself um, and he knew that in order, I think, to produce, um, you know, in, in order to produce two men that were um, good for this world, that he was going to have to take charge, right? Because me and my brother get pretty loose, pretty loose and wild. And Younger so, brother? Yeah, yeah, I have an older brother. Oh, older brother. O older brother, yeah. He's, he's at seventh group right now as yeah. a master sergeant. That's so badass. He, he really dialed us in and um, kind of let us know, like, you know, hey, you're you know, this is what you are. This is the blood you have running through you. You know, you're, you know, act like you've been there before. Say yes, ma'am. Say no, sir. Say thank you. Say please. Be polite. And he was like, you know, 
do all those things, but have, you know, have a plan to kill everybody in the room. I yeah. mean, that's how he raised us. Yeah. He was like, nobody, nobody loves you like family. Yeah. Was he uh, hard on you guys as far as like the, the disciplinary, like if you didn't adhere to those rules, like would he <laughs> yeah. just whip your ass? Yeah. Or yeah. So, well, he only had to spank us once. Um, we had, me and my brother had done, you know, we had done some hood rat shit on the school bus getting home. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Smith, God love him, um, he had a direct line to my grandfather. And he told my grandfather about it, like, that day. And so we're, we're on the school bus doing more hood rat shit as the school bus driver's dropping us off. And as he's dropping us off, my grandfather is standing. And we live out in the country. He's standing by the bus stop in front of our house with, like, a paddle that You're he had like, whittled oh, out fuck. all day. <laughs> he had whittled it out with his fucking old-timer's knife all day. And uh, the bus full of kids still. He got on that bus and beat our ass with that paddle with a bus full of kids off that school bus. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. And from then on, we were like, we, we towed the fucking line with him. <laughs> we were like, no. And he, he did it. And after he got through beating our ass and he beat our ass good, um, that's probably one of the only times I've ever seen him cry. Really? Like he, yeah, he was. That upset. Yeah, right? he was upset about it. Wow. You know, and what, so. Uh, about what year was that? Oh, fuck. <laughs> I mean, ballpark the 80s 90s? Uh, 90s no it was definitely it was definitely uh, it was probably early it was either late 90s or early 2000s oh, wow. i mean fuck nowadays dude to get arrested for doing something like that it'd, oh, be, yeah. it'd be you know there'd be 13 fucking ca cell phone cameras video in it and oh, yeah. do to go to jail for that but uh yeah, that's wild. What was the hood rat shit you were doing on the bus? Do you uh, we were just causing problems, and you know, that's just we were doing exactly what teenagers do. Yeah, we were causing problems, around. and and you know, picking fights and picking fights with one another, and picking yeah. fights. You know, me and my brother, we would fight one another, and then if anybody tried to jump in on us, me and my brother would beat them up and then continue to fight each other. <laughs> like this is not your lane. Stay out of yeah. this. Yeah. Like right. Like I can beat them up. Yeah, you can't beat them. Up. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. so like this is what we're doing right now. Yeah. Like stay out of this. Yeah. Um. Was there any discussion later that day, afternoon, night, what, what have you? Like, you saw him cry. Did, did he talk to you guys afterwards, or was it like just didn't need to say no, anything? There was no, there was yeah. no need to say anything, yeah. really, about, about anything after that. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is going to probably sound random and weird, but I'm curious. Uh, as you were growing up, specifically, like, you know, in Arkansas and, and with him raising you, what, what uh, was your diet like then? Oh, man. Um, you know, I... I would probably say my diet back then, my they try to keep me off sugar, right? Yeah. So I had I was diagnosed with um, ADD in Clovis, New Mexico, at five years old, and so at that point in time, Ritalin was kind of a startup drug, and so <clears throat> I was actually one of the prospects to go take Ritalin. And so I remember I would go on base, they would have me do these puzzles when I wasn't on Ritalin, and then the next day I would come in, they'd give me Ritalin, and it was all guinea timed. pig shit. Absolutely, oh, and I shit. was timed, and so that's the, um, the military. Uh... It's fucking wild, man. And so um, I was timed, and they would time <clears throat> it, and my everything was a lot better. I I did honestly like I couldn't read or write until I was um, my second time going through first grade. Wow! So I was held back, and yeah. so my my mom and my parents and my grandfather they all really did a good job of keeping me off sugars yeah. and keeping, because, you know, I was a very active person, right? Um, so kind of have the heart and the mind of a Malinois, if you will. Yeah. And so uh, that's probably why I understand them so well. But, um, yeah, man, they, you know, they, they, they kept my diet pretty strict. Even to this day, like, I don't eat steak with seasoning on it. Yeah. I don't, you know, if, if I eat anything, it's like it's fruit-based, yeah. Um, I try to stay off of sugars as much as possible. Um, too much caffeine for me will rev, so rev me like up. Them. It'll like, it'll rev me up. And then the crash is almost like it's yeah. way hard. Yeah. You know? Yep. Uh, that's interesting. So, um, going into high school and I guess, you know, generally speaking in your childhood were, were sports of any kind a big part of it? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, football, yeah. football contact sports. And I wasn't a big guy. Like, you know, I, I graduated, you know, I didn't graduate high school. I actually tr dropped out of high school in 11th grade. But, um, you get your GED. In yeah, yeah, I definitely got my GED. I already knew it was like when I saw the Twin Towers fall, I knew exactly yeah. where I was going. I already, I knew exactly where I was going before that happened. I didn't know I was going Ranger, but I know I was going to go to the Army. Yeah. And, um, it just really just the services. And that's a funny story, too, because, um, I digress. But no, so I did the, Football thing, I was very undersized, especially with everybody who was in my class. Um, 
but you know, I, I, I like to be out there. I enjoyed the contact. I enjoyed the, the socializing with the, with the other kids out there. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say probably, like I said, like 11th grade, I had kind of, I'd gotten in a lot of trouble at school. And so I'd actually gotten expelled. Oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah, was it just fighting type shit? Yeah, was it, was just, it, it, was, it was fighting. It was disciplinary. I had a problem with authority. Yeah. Um, it's I had a good a thing you joined the Army. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had a, well, the, the, my problem with authority was, um, as, as you can tell, I don't know if you can tell, I was kind of a jackass. And so I was a smart ass. And I would say things and I would question it and I would question their authority and I would yeah. question the things that they were saying to me. A lot of the time, teachers that have a classroom full of students don't really appreciate that too much, yeah. which is, as a, as a man, I can understand that. Um, as a kid, I was just looking for laughs and shock value. Yeah. Um, so um, they kind of had enough of it. And um, I remember I'd, you know, I'd gotten in trouble. It was, you know what in-school suspension is? Oh, yeah. So I did a full month in like solitary <laughs> in-school suspension. Um, I was super yeah. happy, right? Like I'm carrying my books down the, down the hallway and, um, you know, Mr. Carpenter, God, and God, I don't know if these people are alive or not, but, you know, Mr. Carpenter, he was the ISS teacher, and me and him had gotten along somewhat, you know, being, being together a lot. Like, we had gotten along, you know, somewhat. And anyway, we're, I'm walking down the hall, and he's at the other end of the hall, and he says something smart to me, and I say something smart to him back, and he's like, for that, you get another week of in-school suspension. And I, I honestly, I fucking lost it. I had, like, my... My, all my books in my arm was going to my locker, and I dropped all the books, and I just started fucking kicking them across the hallway. You know what I mean? Just pissed off. At that point in time, the 315 bell rings, right, yeah. letting school out. And this lady called Miss Stoller, she walks out of her math class, and she's like, Mr. McDonald, you need to go to the office now. And I said, it's 315, bitch. You can book me another fucking day. Right, like wow. it's 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 guess what? It's, I'm clocked out. Yeah, I'm you're clocked like out. in eleventh grade at this. Yeah, point. Yeah, I was in eleventh grade, and I, I walked out, got in my vehicle. My house wasn't. It was out in the farm, out in the country. But I drove home, and um, Officer Brightwell, who I talk to to this day, he actually it was funny. He actually gave me back some of my um, my knives that I had brought into school <laughs> and got caught with. <laughs> he had given them back to me yeah. um, uh, after I joined the service and yeah. stuff like that. He was super proud of the man I'd become. Um, but I, but I did, I had a lot of teachers that were tell me I wouldn't amount to anything and yeah. that I would never be anything and, and stuff like that. And so anyway, officer Brightwell had followed me all the way to my house in his cop car and my stepfather being a criminal defense attorney in that town, I had actually, um, stopped in front of my house, like right in my driveway where he couldn't pull in and he got out of his vehicle and I was like, unless you got a warrant, I was like, let me get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? Like you're not yeah. supposed to deny that's how I talked to him. I was yeah. like, you don't need to be on this property. Da, 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 da. And uh, he turned around and left. And then <clears throat> the next day, the vice principal, who went to school with my mom as kids, yeah, he calls he calls up the house, and my mom's like, the vice principal, my mom's pissed, right? She's heated, right? My mom had no qualms with like beating the shit out of me with a blow dryer or high heels or a fucking Xbox controller. She had no problems doing that. But <laughs> so I could see her like she's boiling over, and she's like, Mr. Smith wants to talk to you. And he gets on the phone, and he's like, hey, you know, Trent, I just wanted to let you know that you're going to be, you're going to be expelled. And I was like, I called him a fucking coward. I said, you couldn't say that to my face. I was like, you had to call me at six o'clock in the morning to tell me this. I was like, you're a fucking coward. That's what you are. And obviously I've made my, you know what I mean? I yeah. became a man and all that stuff. And now they, it's kind of wild, right? Like in the school, like they have like pictures of me up and yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, honored and yeah. shit like that. And even though I didn't graduate from that high school, they had me come in for uh, my high school reunion oh, sure. um, and stuff like that. Really? And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they invited me there. And so it was, you know, it was kind of cool. And, um, and it's just, it was wild because like you, you know, you, you go on all these deployments and then, you know, you, you leave and you're like 155 wormy, yeah. loud mouth, little son of a bitch. And then, then nobody sees you for like three, four years. And then when you come back, you're like 210 pounds yeah. and you're a fucking machine. Yeah. And people are like, what happened? And yeah. You look at him and you're like, I fucking hunt humans, man. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I literally wake up every day and, you know, I'm, I'm regimented by regiment, yeah. you know, and to, to be a, a fucking human hunter. Yeah. And so you got to look the part, you yeah. know what I mean? You either look the part or you don't make it there. Yeah. Well, you, you know, got, so, you got to be the part, right? Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Like you, you know, you got to, and that's how I worked out. You know, that's how a lot of us work out. I think we work out with, uh, we work out with that. You know, I would always tell my, my buddies and stuff like that, and they'd be like, oh, man, you're, you're looking big, Mac. And it was like, 
yeah, man, I want to be able to eat that 45 round and keep on going. Yeah. I want to be able to eat that AK round and at least keep, keep moving forward. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't want, I don't want that shit to stop me. Yeah. You know, not, not just one, you yeah. know? So, um, you know, that was, that was a cool thing kind of going to the, the high school reunion. And by that time, honestly, I had already gotten out of the military yeah. when, my, when my high school reunion happened. And so people were all like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm retired. Like yeah. these, like these cats yeah. are like, they spent their whole lives in college and everything yeah. else. And, you know, I've seen the world and I've seen the, the worst of the world at this point in time and been through all kinds of things. And so when I got there, it was cool to see it, but I could definitely tell um, I was out of like kind of a dub, like they had been, they had been in regular society long enough, if you will, in civilian world where they were more developed than me. Yeah. Right. Whereas with me, I had seen a lot of the world and I had, you know, seen friends die and I've seen all this other stuff. But the one thing that I was, um, the one thing that I didn't possess is I didn't possess the abilities that they had as far as being able to be normal, norm, you know, like, a, I guess like a regular civilian type person. And so that's kind of where, that's where I've had to learn over time. Yeah. You know what I mean? To kind of develop and be. Yeah. And so, but I remember going there, I was just like, these people are kind of, they're fucking clueless. Yeah. Uh, I would like to take a real quick break and talk to you about uh, my bookie. I want you to uh, go to mybookie.com and use my promo code Mike Drop, uh, which you'll instantly get a deposit bonus up to one thousand dollars. Remember to use my code Mike Drop and bet with me only at my bookie. Primarily, the only way watching these fights could get any better is to get paid doing it. And my bookie makes that a possibility. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean. They're fucking no, it's, yeah, it's, it's a weird mix. I mean, you know, for for guys to go, uh, especially at that age, to go do what our nation asked them to do for you know where where they asked them to do it for as long as they asked them to do it, uh, and then just to, the expectation is to come home and and just integrate right back into society and and be you know next door neighbors with Joe, the accountant and, you know, fucking Bob, the insurance guy and what it like, it, it's not realistic, you know, and, and it's tricky. It's a, it's a dicey fucking road to, to hoe for sure. But, um, so did nine 11 happen when you were in high school? Yeah, it happened when I was in uh ninth grade, ninth grade, ninth grade. So that, that was the switch of like, I'm fucking going to do that. And, and yeah. you were pretty laser focused. Yeah, I was pretty laser focused at that point in time. And I, I'd went like that. Like I said, i it was funny. I was trying to go into places, and so um, I like I didn't know the army was going to be my my jam. Um, I first walked into the Marine recruiter station, and I walked in. I'd already had my GED, and um, you know, walked in. I went to the Marines, and I was like, you know, hey, like, if, you know, I want to be a Marine. I want to go fight. I want to go kill bad guys. That's exactly what I told them. Like, I want to go kill bad guys. And so they were like, oh, great, yeah, sit down. And then they were like, you know, do you have a high school diploma? And I was like, I have a GED. And they're like, this is what the Marine recruiter told me. We don't take quitters. No oh, shit. Yeah. Wow. And he was like, we, we, you're not needed here. We don't take quitters. Wow. Because I quit high school. Yeah. And so I st stood up, walked out, literally walked right next door. We went yeah. to the Army. And I was yeah. like, hey. <laughs> like, this gave him my How same spill. How do you feel spill. about a GED? I gave him my same spill. And I was like, GED. And the Army recruiter's like, sit down, sit down. Yeah, come on, sit down. <laughs> Got you just know? a spot for you. Absolutely. He was like, can you pass a drug test? And I was like, not right now because I was smoking <laughs> a lot of weed. And he was like, we're, we're going to get through that. And uh, I was like, cool. And so um, I ended up shipping out 2005, um, November 22nd, which is crazy to me, right? Like, been blown up. There's Sometimes I can't even remember what I fucking ate yesterday. But I can yeah. remember that, yeah. you know, November 22nd of 2005, I shipped out the 30th AG yeah. um, and went to uh, went to basic and my experiences in base, basic were, were super interesting because, um, you know, I gr grown up on a farm, right? And I grown up kind of, you know, you, you earn everything you get. And so um, there would be dudes like laying in bed and crying. And in my head, I was like, what the fuck are you crying about? Like, why, like really? Like, you're crying? And um, I wouldn't say that to him. It's just in my head. I would just be like, oh, my God, you know? Um, it kind of really took me back. Um, and so anyway, um, when I was in basic, I just wanted to, I wanted to just, I kind of wanted to stand out. I wanted to stand out. I wanted to be the best. Anything I've ever done in life, I've always wanted to be the best at doing it because what's, is, is it worth doing? Is it even worth doing if you're not going to be the best at it or try or strive or try to be the best at it? Um, and that's kind of something that I've always taken with me my, my entire life. And yeah. so I just wanted to be the best at this, right? And this was my outlet to get away from my hometown. Um, 
which I, you know, super toxic place for me. You know what I mean? Just with the people and the drugs and everything else going on there. Um, and it was a, it was a way to make my family proud of me. Yeah. Right. And so, um, I just wanted to be the best at it. And so I did, I, I got my PT up to like 300. I was supposed to go to the 173rd in Vicenza, Italy. And, um, it was probably like, it's probably like a week before we were supposed to graduate, uh, basic. And so the Ranger recruiter came down there, talked to us. And he was like, <clears throat> he was like, is there anybody interested in becoming a Ranger? At this point in time, I'd known that like, you know, what a Ranger is, you, you know, you're running formation and everything else. I really didn't know. I still didn't know. And so, you know, I asked him, he popped in a video. I saw like, you know, the green night vision video and tracer rounds going off and everything else. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that. And so, you know, he, you know, he, right from, right from then on, I was no longer going to the 173rd in Vicenza. And now I was going to go do airborne school. And right after airborne school, I was going to rip. Now it's called RASP. But I was going to RIP, which is Ranger Indoctrination Program. And um, so went there, you know, went there. And, like, I'll never forget the, the last thing that that recruiter told me was uh, he told me he was like, you know, he was like, if you do this, you just don't quit. He was like, don't quit. So I was like, roger that. And so I went to RIP. And to be honest with you, basic training was kind of a joke physically, mentally. Um, airborne school was a joke kind of physically and mentally, besides getting used to running in boots everywhere you went, um, Ranger Indoctrination Program was an absolute kick in the dick, like mentally, physically, everything, man. Um, you know, and it was just, it was, you know, it was just different on how they, they taught things back then. Back then it was just like, we're going to destroy you physically and mentally and we're going to watch you quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was almost like their goal to be like, hey, we have, we have 100 students here. Let's try to get 100 of them to quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so you like some of the things that went on, probably a little unethical, you know what I mean? But, it, you know, yeah, it's hey, debatable. Yeah, you know, but it, hey, you know what? It made me well, made me into the man that, that I am. Yeah. And it's a selection course, yeah. ultimately. And, you know. and we're at war. Do you, you know remember I mean? how many started and how many finished? No, not off the top. I mean, I, I remember ballpark. it was like one night, like 20 dudes quit. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it, a ballpark percentage of how many, how many finished, like tw tw less than 20 percent that started. Yeah, I'd probably put it at that, 20, 25% yeah. less than. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, you, you learned your, you learned your, uh, like what you were good at and what you weren't good at, right? And so I knew I was good at like being really physical. I knew that I could do my push-ups, you know, and all that other stuff. But what I needed help on was um, kind of retaining knowledge, right? ADD, stuff like that. I needed help retaining some knowledge because that's part of the course curriculum that you have to pass right as yeah. ranger history medical medical side of things um stuff that's written on paper and so <clears throat> I, re I had remembered i had actually there was a there was another guy who i went through basic airborne and rip with um he's now a silver silver star recipient wow. he's got like four bsms with valor he was actually squad lead, one of the squad leaders and team leaders um, that I was attached to when, when I was a handler with Benno. Oh, wow. uh, phenomenal dude. He's now an SRT surgeon, went to go be an officer. Dude is just meddled out, right? It just any situation that was combat related that you ever put him in, like you ever like was ever around, he was just always in the action somehow, some way. Yeah. And uh, anyway, going through it, like, and when you look at this guy, like at the, at the time he was, I mean, that dude probably weighed like 120 pounds skinny. Yeah. Didn't like beat BCGs, the big yeah. old glasses. You know what I mean? Didn't, didn't look like he was going to ma make the cut whatsoever. And one day we're getting smoked on the blacktop um, outside rip. And this is in July heat. You know what I mean? That blacktop burns, burns so bad. You have blisters on your hands when it's done. And the cadre is walking around just destroying anybody that can't keep their feet up on the log. And, um, and I'm sitting there like shaking. My hands are burning. I hear my friend struggling next to me. And I tell him, I'm like, hey, man, put your feet on top of mine, right? Like, hold your, because he kept dropping his feet. And I was like, so I held his feet up there um, the whole time. And then so what he did for me was, is when it came to test time, he Sit sat next to me. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> sat, he, he sat and he oh, would like, crazy. he would do the paper and he would roll it over to me. And so, you know, is it cheating? Yes. But is it, is it teamwork? It's teamwork, yeah. man. And so, you know, he's to this day, fucking top notch guy. Yeah. just doing his thing i'm super proud of him and uh you know like 
Yeah, it was. Yeah. That's 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 how I was able to get through that. Yeah, that's wild, you know. Shit. And so, and that's we, and it was it was cool. Like, to, you know, and then for us to be attached to the same company, yeah, and then work together with the same platoon, yeah, like it was yeah. fucking cool. Man. Oh, I don't doubt it. Sounds like it. So you went to airborne to rip, and then straight to first. Yeah, straight to first bat, and then so it was kind of interesting, right? So went went straight to first bat, got hooked up with my platoon. Um, and then it's kind of funny, right? Like you think that, oh, okay, like you pass rip, it was fucking hell. Life's going to be easy. Absolutely not. Like yeah. just because you got a tambourine and a scroll, that don't mean shit. Like you're going to a place where um, these dudes have got, you know, these guys have multiple combat deployments. They've they've seen their friends die, all that other stuff. They're salty. And, uh, and now you have to prove yourself. You have to prove yourself as a worker. You have to prove yourself to be competent. You have to prove yourself to be able to follow direction. And you have to prove that you can lead. Yeah. And so a lot of that is um, trial by fire, and you're kind of learning on the go with all of it. And so I was kind of told at the very beginning, they were like, hey, look, we're deploying to Afghanistan in two weeks. Because I showed up while everybody was on their leave before the deployment. And so everybody came back after that two weeks. And then two weeks later, we deployed to, to Afghanistan. At that point in time, they had made me um, an AG, AB, and, uh, and an ammo bearer. So... I just humped heavy shit and yeah. followed a machine gunner around. Like yeah. that that's what what my job was. Um and so <clears throat> you know, we uh we get to Afghanistan and you know, we're not they're not running very many ops. I think we in 05, I think maybe they ran like two or three and they kept telling me like you're not going to do anything. This is where you learn and so I would wake up every day and that's what I would do. I was learning, you know, learning um learning about the weapon systems. I was learning about, you know, the weight, learning how to clean everything, learning how to walk under nods. I mean, I had, fuck, man, I probably had only four hours collectively walking under nods before I was thrown into Afghanistan. And so um, all of a sudden that mission with Snake River came down and they were like, hey, we, you're going you're gonna to be on this op. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, oh, fuck, you know what I mean? Like, this is the real deal. And the way everybody was talking about it, like, you just – you shut up and you listen, right? And so just kind of the way everybody was talking about it, it was like, this is going to be some pretty serious shit that's going to go on tonight. And so, um, you know, I get out there and, uh, and I, you know, it was just wild. Like, you know, we landed on the, we landed on the X. And um, like I said, it was a two platoon hit with a, with a team of, of SEAL Team 6. And um, just to watch to watch and hear the sounds and everything else. And like, I'm trying to focus my nods. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm, 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 I'm all fucked up out there. You know what I mean? Like just some 20 year old, just way out of his fucking element. And my, you know, my machine gunner has like a IR Kim light in his pocket that he's just like, follow this, <laughs> like follow this. You know? oh, and so, great. and then when the helicopter goes down, like you have like this dude, that's an Australian special forces guy, like fucking pulling grenades and throwing them. And yeah. you know, he looks over at you and he's like, is the sun coming up he's like hey you can put your nods up now like you know what i mean like you don't need those anymore and you're just yeah. like well you yeah. know just a sit shit sandwich out there and um and i'll never forget it man like we we got back from that op we didn't take any casualties wow. out, out of all that shit no casualties and um we got back and had first sergeant salerno uh, um man is it yeah yeah first aren't first aren't sal we called him first aren't sal we get off the helicopter, and I'm, like, one of the only privates that got to go run that mission, like, one of the only new guys. He gets off there, and he starts, like, headbutting me with fucking – he has his helmet on, and I have my helmet on. Like, he has his helmet off, and my helmet's on. He's, like, headbutting me. He's, like, that's the way to pop your fucking cherry. Blah. And I'm, like, the whole time I'm just thinking to myself, like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, what's going on? What's going on, you know? But, um, did but you, yeah. Did like, you light it up at all? Uh, I never no. I was I, I was I was too busy just trying to fucking keep up. Yeah, keep yeah. up, man. You know what I mean. I was yeah. just trying not to fuck up. Yeah, you know, much much less shoot my weapon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I uh, I uh, yeah, it was definitely I got got done with that, and like in my head, I was like, I'm gonna die real soon. <laughs> like yeah. this this is just how this this is just how this goes. And uh, but I was baptized by gunfire. Yeah, like that's kind of what I tell people. Like, yeah, by that, like your first mission's that. Like definitely yeah. baptized by. Yeah. By gunfire in that situation. And you sure. learn really quick that life's short. Yeah. You know, for, for the rest of that deployment, was it similar in terms of, um, just on the job really like drinking from a fire hose or did you settle in fairly quick and start, 
start doing shit on that that particular deployment? No, I mean it was really drinking from a fire hose. Like so back, you know, back then there wasn't the there wasn't strikers. I mean, I had never top gun. I had never been trained to top gun on a on an open jeemer. Um, and so I, you know, we were rolling around Afghanistan with Humvees, and I was a top gunner on a fifty cal. Yeah. And so like I'm I'm having to learn functions check on a fifty cal the day before we roll out. You know, but the thing was, is after that mission, they trusted me to go out. Yeah. And then they, so they started bringing me out um, all the time. And so that was just like really, yeah, I mean, it was just such a learning experience that first go around. I mean, yeah. I wasn't anything spectacular. I was just trying not to get fucking destroyed every day for fucking up and, yeah. you know, just trying to, trying to listen when I'm on target and, yeah. and everything else. So, yeah. but it was, it was wild. And, you know, the one thing I did take away from that deployment is uh because you you know just kind of have like i told you earlier like kind of how you see things shift so like the you know the the SEAL team six guys like i remember we were late we we're all laying on an airfield waiting to go on an op and like these men come out <clears throat> and they look like old men like gray all in their beards like you know fuck man they could be older than my dad and so i even laughed and made a joke being the asshole that i am i'm like fuck man look who who are these grandpas coming out on this target? My team leader was like, that's fucking still team six. Shut the fuck up. And I was like, all right, like I'll shut up. But like, but now that when I think about it, right, like now all those dudes, when you look at them, they're super young. You know what I mean? They're super yeah. young. They're 32 with great. You know beards. what I mean? Probably they have experience, but not like that. And when you start thinking about the age range of those dudes and where they came from, they were probably like your Kosovo era navy navy yeah. seal you know what i mean like yeah. probably that era of of man i mean and these dudes like they would like they would come in and they would look at you and i would i would always make jokes i'd be like hey don't stare at him in the eyes or you'll lose like five years off your life <laughs> you know what i mean like they will fucking steal it yeah. you know yeah. but like you would see those guys and they were just like they would come back off target they'd be covered in blood they'd have like these beards and they'd have like mp5s you yeah. know what i mean and you're like Jesus Christ, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, who are these fucking <laughs> yeah, guys? Yeah. yeah, so I just remember that as 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 at my first deployment, like, Jesus, yeah. that's crazy. And, you know, even even back then with, with detainees, like, they had us guarding. Like, we didn't have all what was intricate yeah. back in the 05 era. Like, they had private, private watch watching detainees yeah. and shit. And you would have, like, you know, you would have, like, the CIA guys or the FBI guys coming in and, like, yeah. you know, telling you X, Y, and Z, you know what I mean? And so... Anyway, it was just diff different time. Definitely yeah. different time. Yeah. Um, it, was, was there any? Were there any operations during that deployment that were um, just you know crazy, catastrophic, or or either went horribly wrong, went exceptionally well? Anything that stands out, like specific operations? No. They, honestly, after the whole Snake River um, run in with that one sixtieth bird getting shot out of the sky, um, everything kind of. I would say we probably ran maybe eight more missions after that out yeah. of a three month period. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was really just kind of quiet. Yeah. Um, whether it be due to weather or um, other people running missions. Like I said, I was so young at that time. I just did what I was told. Yeah. You know, they stay off Facebook and Instagram. You yeah. Call your mom. Like, you know what I mean? Like stick with privates. Like, yeah. Do what we tell you to do. And so yeah. that's that was really it. But what was really cool about it was um, my uh, I actually met my cousin there and so <clears throat> we were going back to the snake river thing so like we're i was walking to the chow hall one day and um this this oh i want to say he was like a oh two or oh three ryan ryan walters right he was my my cousin and um anyway he's like mcdonald and i was like i saw the rank and i'm like oh shit yes sir you know what i mean and he was like i'm thinking i fucked up or i'm in trouble and uh, and he was like relax relax i'm your cousin Oh, shit. I was like, I was like, oh shit! And Did I, you not know that? No, no, no. Uh -huh. I didn't. I I knew that he was there, but I didn't know that he was. Um, he came in after after that helicopter got shot out. He came in and he picked up the first wave of us, right? Oh, and you. he flew us out. So he was like kind of the QRF one sixty yeah, bird. And so <clears throat> it was really cool, man, because I was like, oh fuck, like that's family. You know what yeah. I mean? And so, you know we really didn't stay like in touch close contact right but um 2011 2012 he flew me and all all my operations wow. right he was he at that point in time he had made chief flight lead dude that is fucking um, incredible of, man. of 160th out in kentucky and he was flying me and he actually re-enlisted me 
and my platoon sergeant why we were on the back ramp as he was flying us out of target. Dude, that's bad. It was fun. fucking cool, man. That's really it cool. It was man. fucking cool. So wow. that's uh that was something that was really, really neat. And um and he was like, you know, with with him being with him being like that in that rank, he, and being that far down like 2011, 2012 time frame, um, he was like really big on X and Y landings. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fuck walking, X, Y landings. Like, we have the assets. Yeah. We'll, we'll do, it. do it. You yeah. know what I mean? So he was in just top-notch pilot pilot yeah. skills, like all those 160th. Yeah. For them, to, for them to drop a ramp and put it on a mountain. Yeah. I mean, fuck. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, all right. So you come back from that deployment. Um, can you kind of walk us through the, the subsequent deployments and just, since there's eight of them, uh, yeah. you know, just kind of walk through each one and, and hit the highlights of kind of what you did, <clears throat> any any operations that stick out and, and some takeaways from each, if, uh, if you can remember them. I mean, Absolutely. I know they probably all blur together a little bit. But. So I want to say we did we did Afghanistan, our, our 06 deployment. Um, 07, I want to say we did Balad, went to Balad, Iraq. Um, Balad, Iraq, it was, this is the first time you're seeing Iraq, right? Iraq compared to Afghanistan, so modern, you know, in comparison, um, you know, they, they actually have power. They actually have, um, they actually have TVs, you know what I mean? They actually have shit and, uh, you know, and just kind of the ROE at that time was kind of different, right? Like it was, it wasn't a a relaxed rule. It was a very relaxed rules of engagement for us. Right. And I mean, we were putting it on the enemy. I mean, if it ran, if it ran, you put it down, and that's that's what we were told to do. And so, um, there was a lot of that going on in, in that Iraq Iraqi deployment. A lot of breach banger dog action going on. This is kind of like when, you know, we didn't have a dog program, but we were incorporating civilian trainers or civilian handlers to come be dog handlers with us. No shit. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, we had we had civilian fucking contractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we had like con- on target, con- on target. No shit, on fucking target with us, man. Wow. I mean, what but, was their background? I, no, you idea. know, no, no idea. I know some of them had already. So, for example, my my head trainer at one seven five was one of them, right? And he had a marine handler's background. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And so, um, yeah, they were rolling out on target with this man. Wow. And so, and that was. If that's not reflective of relaxed ROEs, I don't know what is because, yeah. like nowadays, there's zero chance that's happening. Yeah, yeah, it you was know? it was fucking wild, man. Yeah. And so I remember I was more more or less my main job on that deployment was I was a striker driver because we had strikers at that point in time. And for anybody who doesn't know what strikers are, they're the the big eight wheel um, eight wheel vehicles that have like a computerized top mount machine gun on the top, where the machine gunners in the bottom. And you have a driver that's uh, that's up front, and then you have a TC that's standing, which is what we call a tank commander that's standing right here. And it's a it's a man pack vehicle, so you can probably fit you know eight eight personnel, eight a, a squad essentially yeah. inside one of those. And so um, I was a uh, an RWS gunner. I was a driver. Um, I did the maintenance, um, and uh, and so I was everything striker at that point in time. On, on that deployment. Were there any gnarly operations that you went on where like you just fucking slayed, slayed the dragon? Yeah, man, there was, you know, there was a, we were going out to support the British SAS. Um, one of the top, they were going after one of the top tier dudes in the area. And, um, and they had received uh, heavy contact upon um, breaching an entry of the, of the compound. And um, they, like I said, they took a lot of casualties. And so they, Position they had they had us position the strikers um, around the around the area. They actually had a sniper. The SAS guys had a sniper that was actually on top of that targeted area, and um, and we hammered that first floor with fifty cows. No shit. Yeah, we hammered it and suppressed that first floor with just you know probably four or five fucking M2 Browning fifty cal machine guns um, in order to provide protection for that sniper to get off the top. And then once he got off the top and linked back up, it was. All open fire. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, you know, and it was probably, they declared that area hostile. So for anybody who doesn't know, when they declare an area hostile, it means everything within like a 300 or 600 mile radius is, is deemed shoot to kill. I'm right. assuming you meant meters and not miles. Yeah, 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 meters. Yeah, meters. <laughs> just so, talking fucking nuke. Too much tactical coffee. nukes. Too, too yeah. much. So, yeah. so no. So I, you know, and I'd probably only been probably only been on three three or four of those type type missions in my whole entire career and so when you when you hear that you really know 
Yeah. Shit, shit's getting yeah. shit's shit's getting out of hand and um there's a potential that we might be overwhelmed. And yeah. so um I don't know how many casualties they took. I know they lost a few guys. Um and I know I know the enemy lost a lot of guys. Yeah. Um and Iraq was just different, just the the like the money that was there, a lot of American money there. A lot of American money there, a lot of hush money there. Um a lot of people who were hiding because they were like Iraqi pilots at one point in time. And um, it was just kind of a wild, just, it was just wild. And the things that you see right there, like you see it kind of changed my perspective on the things that you see, right? Like you see grown men sleeping in bed with little boys, you know, and you see blood on the sheets, you know, where they've been raping, you know what I mean? Like you see, you see what they do to like their, their special needs, People they chain them to walls, you know what I mean? Because they're, you know, they're they're essentially they're they're retarded, and so you just see how they treat their people, and it's just like gives you a complete different perspective of how you look at, at humans. Yeah, you know what I mean. That, their society. Yeah, it's yeah. just it, it definitely did it. It uh definitely to this day like has had had has an impact on me for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like how can you treat humans? Yeah, like this and um. You know, and it, it was funny because, like, you know, I did I did Blod, then I did Tikrit, right? Is it same deployment or next? No, it's the next deployment. Then I did Tikrit. I did Tikrit twice. So, so three, and, three and four were Tikrit? Yeah, yeah, three three and four were Tikrit. And then so um, Tikrit is actually where they found Saddam Hussein. Now, yeah. by the time I was there, they had already found him and everything else. But I think that's where he was born, was Tikrit. Yeah, yeah. And so... <clears throat> Tikrit was an interesting place. Um, you know, it was still, you know, the ROE had been, you know, obviously the rules of engagement was a lot more uh, hearts and minds as yeah. far as for the people um, that, that we were going after and stuff like that. But uh, just lots of little bird. I remember getting on little birds a lot, lots of landing on X's on little birds, um, seeing the, the M2 Carl Gustav. Uh, mm -hmm. get let loose um that was the first deployment i got to see that pretty heavily was there operations where you effectively use them and know for sure that, that you uh that the other side sustained casualties oh, yeah, yeah. Can, oh yeah can you share one of those stories because yeah, i was a gustav gunner and uh, fun fact we uh we actually rolled into into decrit um and took saddam's palace down back uh oh. you know at, at the very start of it which was wild but anyway go ahead sorry. yeah so um you know, same deal. We we did an offset infill, which for anybody who doesn't know, offset means that you're you're walking for one or two k. You know what I mean? So they can't hear you or can't hear, hear the vehicles that you infilled on. <clears throat> and we get up to a compound. It's isolation, containment, uh, push to assault. We go <clears throat> the assault element goes to push to assault the compound. And at that point in time, we take small arms fire. Um, we take small arms fire from it. Um, Unfortunately, we're kind of put into a position where we can't use the air support because of the blast radius, right? Like there's going to be too much. There's too many other civilian targets around in the area that we don't want to have any of those, any unnecessary casualties, if you will. And so they went ahead and they called up the goose gunner and, uh, and he used um, flechette rounds. Yeah. And so he fucking launched flechette rounds, two of them, into the building Shot one, boom, blew up. Shot a second one, blew up. And by the, like, this was a hard structure. And by the time the second one went off, there was nothing left of that structure. Wow. I mean, you were you were going through rubble, um, you know, looking for your looking for the enemy combatants so you could get SSE off of them and swab them with a with a Q-tip so you could grab their DNA. Um, but the, I mean, it was that M2 Carl Gustav is a game yeah. changer on the yeah, battlefield. Super super cool uh, machine. I'm sorry, not with machine, but weapon system. Um, 84 millimeters of go fuck yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I love that. Yeah. Thing. I mean, like, I would fucking hate to be a gunner because, like, yeah, you carry, because you carry that motherfucker and you have yeah. an AG that carries all those rounds and the probability of you getting to use yeah. that a lot is very low. But, God damn it, when you get to use it. Yeah. Like, that's Things epic, know, man. Yeah. You know? uh, that's like, uh, reminds me of the call sign Puff the Magic Dragon yeah. back from, uh, uh, from Vietnam, which I know was an air platform, but still it, it kind of gives you that same vibe. Uh, yeah, I remember like we, we would construct these backpacks to carry four rounds, you know, and they're, you know, seven or eight pounds a piece, depending on which, which round it is. And yeah, it was like you, you, uh, you know, getting to use them was, 
was a wet dream in two ways. One, just to get to use them, and two, because you can drop 30 pounds if I can, <laughs> yeah. uh, of your loadout you know, in, in a matter of seconds. But, um, yeah, it's, a, it's such a fucking amazing weapon. So when, when you were going through the, the rubble, did you guys come across a, a lot of enemy combatants? Or Yeah, yeah, we, we came across, there was six, yeah. six from what we could find. I mean, you got to think, flechette rounds, there's, yeah. there's not a lot. There's not a lot left yeah. of, of that person. Yeah. Um, you're pretty much just kind of looking for hunks of meat and yeah. blood. Any, and so, any surprising uh, SSE finds going through anything that, that was like, holy shit, I can't believe this is on that guy or, or something, anything like that? Man, we found like really the, I would tell you the most surprising money find we found was probably over $100,000 yeah. of American money. In a situation like that? You no, know, it, was, it wasn't a, not a situation like, like that necessarily where we had where we had killed a bunch of people but um just like regular ssc yeah. doing ssc like looking under something or finding like a false wall or something yeah. like that and finding finding just american cash just yeah. kind of laying there you yeah. know it's very like holy shit you yeah. know like yeah. not only have i've never seen that much money but to f see it in a Iraqi third world country shit and yeah. a fucking shithole man like that's wild so i started dipping when i was in high school um uh, I started with pouches, as most kids do. Uh, ultimately, in the military, uh, I dipped the entire time I was there. A lot of us did. Um, you know, one of the things about dipping is that it, it kind of turns into a, a ritual where, it, you know, it's really part of uh, part of the culture almost. Uh, oftentimes, in the military and in a lot of fields that uh, that are are that way. And and uh, one of the things, obviously, you know, real real tobacco uh, isn't the best for you, um, but because of that ritual being such a, an ingrained part of that culture, it's something that a lot of times we miss. And even when I got out of the Navy, uh, I still dipped for a number of years. Uh, I wish that I had had this product, Black Buffalo. It's a, a tobacco-free alternative uh, that I can tell you it looks, smells, tastes, uh, feels everything like the real thing, uh, but there is no tobacco in it. And uh, it's a phenomenal product. Uh, they have mint, wintergreen, blood orange, uh, straight peach. Um, what's cool is they also, they, they've got, um, the, the straight, as far as the, the cut, uh, they've got long cut, they've got pouches. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a one-stop shop for tobacco free alternatives that way. Uh, but they also have a zero, uh, version, which has absolutely no nicotine. So you can get it with nicotine if you want the nicotine, uh, or you can get it without nicotine. If, if you don't, uh, it's all food grade ingredients. Um, green green cabbage essentially uh, as well as pharmaceutical grade nicotine if that's the the option that you choose uh, but it's just a, a an awesome company it's veteran started uh, and they're big supporters of the mic drop podcast uh, and it's a product that uh, that i stand behind and and uh, absolutely endorse it, it it's a great great crew of guys what's really cool about uh, black buffalo is it it's uh you know it's the look the feel the smell the taste the texture, everything the same as, as regular dip. And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's the, the big thing missing from all, all and any other alternatives, little pouches of nicotine or, uh, any of the other stuff that doesn't use a, um, a product that, that really has that same, same feel. It, it doesn't feel like you're actually dipping it. So, uh, black Buffalo has done a, a masterful job at creating that same experience. Uh, the flavors are all on point. Uh, the long cut and the pouches are, are both just like the the real thing. And again, the fact that you can you can get it with nicotine if you want, uh, or you can get it completely nicotine free if you want. So again, if you're 21 years or older uh, and you dip and you want uh, that tobacco free alternative, go to blackbuffalo.com and the code is mic drop for 20% off. Did you guys have any any idea of what the correlation uh, of why that money was there and that amount and how it was being used? Yeah, you know, I think. You know, now I, I can't speak on fact, right? I can speak on on opinion. Um, I think a lot of that money is probably being used as um, some hush money, some some money for um, right because like they got to get paid when you have informants, right? And that's what we did. There was a lot of human hits, which is a lot, you know, when you have informants or, or resources or people on the ground that are indigenous. Um, there was a lot of human going around, a lot of human targeting. And so um, I think a lot of that money was used to pay them. Yeah. Um, I think there was a lot of different sources, not only from Ranger Regiment, but, you know, your, your FBI sources, your CIA sources, your, your CAG sources, your SF sources. 
um, and all that where they have these human people and they have this money and they they're they're paying for information yeah. right and i think that's how a lot of the money got got out there um there's probably a lot more shadier reasons how a yeah. lot of that money Probably got out there yeah, yeah yeah but like i said i can't i can't speak on that because i don't know yeah. that to be fact but um I but i do know you know i do know there's there's a lot of money going around and like you know it was you know, it just goes back also to like afghanistan right like you could you you could bomb out you could bomb something out and you could you could accidentally have a civilian casualty right and the people of the house wouldn't give a fuck about the the civilian casualty that they had, right? Their their friend, their 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 child, their grandmother, whatever it may be. Um, but by God, you will pay top dollar for that cow that you killed. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like that was fucking so bizarre to me, man. Yeah. Like it was like we they value their they value their their crop or their you know whatever whatever it may be more than they value the, yeah. the human like yeah. their loved one. It was fucking wild. Yeah. Man. Well, I think it's just reflective of how how dire economically a situation is, where the 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 intrinsic value placed on anything is is a direct reflection of what it's worth in day to day life. You know, uh -huh. and if a loved one is is an elder that you know isn't providing anything, or or even somebody young for that matter, the same thing. Like if they're not actively bringing something to the table, then then yeah, to them a cow is is worth more because it. It's tangible, you know, absolutely. which is sad. But. Absolutely, and they and they will like, especially in the Afghan countries. Like, okay, grandma, like you can't work the field anymore, you can't cook anymore, you can't clean anymore. Like you're too old. Like they might as well they'll, they'll just take you out back and yeah, old yeller crazy, you. Man. You know what I mean? Dig you a hole and put put you down. Yeah. You know because you're because at that point in time you're taking resources away from them yeah. and not providing like yeah. you said. Yeah, I mean it's like like a fucking tribe of animals, honestly. <laughs> you know, but. Um, all right, so in, in those first four deployments, the first to Afghanistan and the subsequent three to Iraq, <clears throat> were there any missions that you went on where it was a really close call for you personally? No, I mean, to be honest with you, like those those deployments like really made me feel like we were invincible. Yeah. I mean, we had 1st 75th Ranger Regiment didn't take any casualties wow. within those first four deployments whatsoever. Just slaying I, people. Yeah, yeah, I take that back. We took a casualty, um, Anthony Cookie. We called him Cookie Davis, and uh, he just had an anniversary here recently. And so he was attached to two Bravo. I want to say he was a, uh, a recce guy, a recon guy, um, senior dude. This was in, I want to say this was in Tikrit, um, and he, uh, he assaulted a room and got shot and got killed. Oh, so wow. that, was the first, that was the first time that I realized that we weren't invincible. Yeah, But it wasn't a massive shootout. It was just... Pop kind of shot lucky got lucky. Shot, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, so I did, like, you know, when you do all those deployments and you don't have any casualties, like, nobody's even getting shot and hurt. Yeah. Like, nobody's getting blown up and hurt. I remember we were rolling to a target one time, um, and I felt, you know, you all, you all catch your, your extra Zs whenever you're in, your, in the striker going out to target or inside the helicopter, um, which might seem crazy for a lot of people to think, like, you're fixing to go into – you know, you're fixing to go into something where your adrenaline should be going and, and you're you're falling asleep until yeah. you hear like that 30 seconds or the yeah. one minute call, you know, and then you're waking up and you're like, oh, okay, like, oh, here, here we go. That's your, uh, you your adrenals begging for a break. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you, you know, we, we had broke, we had rolled over an IED and it blew up and like, it woke me up and I woke up and everybody was like, hey, is everybody okay? Da -da -da. And I woke up and looked around and I was like, I was like, we good? And they're like, yeah, we're good. And I was like, cool. And I went back to sleep. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, fuck, you know? Yeah. And so it's just, it's just wild. Like when you're, when you grow up in that environment yeah. and you've, you've seen as much as you have, like shit like that, it just yeah. does, doesn't bother you anymore. You know what yeah. I mean? You're like, ah, I'm not dead. Like if, if it was big enough to kill me, there ain't nothing I can do about it anyway. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. I mean, you know, again, the, the, the correlation of, uh, of, you know, what your body goes through, physiologically to get to that point is uh it's impressive that the human body can take it you know is that that fight or flight like that that can only be active and activated <clears throat> for so long before your body basically just says doesn't matter what's happening you got to shut the fuck down yeah you know and, and it's your, your body's way of, of essentially keeping you alive yeah uh, but it is uh, you know it's a fascinating while it's it's both sad and and uh and detrimental and and I would say incredibly harmful. Uh, it's it's equally fascinating in you know the human body's ability to deal with 
chaos and stress and pressure at that, that level for that amount of time yeah. and, and be able to kind of juggle that the way that it does. <clears throat> but, um, I, I got, I got more like, it was, yeah, as far as your adrenaline, I got a lot of just to hit on that subject up, I'll, I'll hit on it down the line whenever we get into the Afghan stuff, because that's where Afghanistan's where the rubber met the road with mm -hmm. like that, that second, <clears throat> you know, that fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth deployment, right? Mm -hmm. In Afghanistan. Um, those, so all the, the last four were all in Afghanistan? Oh, I'm sorry. There were Afghanistan, Iraq. Last three, last three, last okay. three were in Afghanistan. Yeah. And so, so after the two to Tikrit, you went back to Iraq one more time before no, Afghanistan. It was Tikrit, Tikrit, and then it was Afghanistan. Okay. So I only did two to Tikrit, and you know it was <clears throat> we were working a lot more with um, to, to get back on Iraq. We were working a lot more with your um, your your Iraqi police force yeah. and stuff like that, and kind of giving them the reins. It, it seemed to me that way um, on a lot of that, and they were actually doing some of the hits on their own, and we were just kind of spectating and watching them and helping them out. Um, and, uh, you know, it, to me, Iraq looked really hopeful, right? When you're there and you, you see it change and you see it evolve, like when you're going there year in and year out, sometime to the same places, um, you see it evolving and you see it changing and you see, like, people walking the streets and they look happy they have cell phones you know what i mean they're like they have facebooks they're the like texting yeah it's like it's like this like there's hope here and where you saw the hope is you saw hope in the younger generations right the people the kids who are up and coming and coming up right like those kids have been exposed to this war for a long fucking time right and so you know they're tired of it and um you know all they like the and that's the thing, like the mass majority of those people that are out there, um, despite popular to believe, like despite popular beliefs with um, the majority of Americans and some veterans who hadn't really pounded the ground um, and like actually ran ops, like the majority of those people are good people. You know what I mean? Like they, they really are. And, um, and they really want peace and they really don't want to have to live under tyranny and they really don't want to have to live um, dealing with nothing but war. You know, they, they want to live a peaceful life. And so to see those people living, right, going out at night, I mean, there's we, we were rolled through to crit and they would, you know, they had took off the nighttime curfews and there was a nightlife, you know, and it was like kind of fucking wild to see, you yeah. know what I mean? And like they had, you know, candy shops open and gas stations and it was just, it was kind of cool. It was like, you know, the universities and stuff yeah. like that. Kids are going to school again. And so um, that was cool to see, man. Yeah. That was really, really, they were, that gave me a lot of hope for yeah. that country. Where it went fucking wrong, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a uh, politician. I couldn't tell you where it went wrong, but they can. Yeah. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know. they'll lie to you about how, how it happened and why, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a fucking, it's a Greek tragedy how, uh, how that went from what it was to, you know, ISIS rolling in and just fucking steamrolling everybody because. <laughs> Uh, because of politics, fucking, yeah. fucking terrible. But, yeah. uh, all right, so you, you're essentially halfway through your operational career, and now the the last several deployments are are all to Afghanistan. Yeah, all to Afghanistan. Um, and what what year time frame range uh, was that? Like oh nine to twenty twelve. Oh nine to twenty twelve. Yeah. So oh nine to twenty twelve, you know, to 2012, and those deployments were more more pushed out longer right we had uh we had a thing called team merrill where we were doing six month stints you know there were s select groups of uh ranger ranger companies that would do six month stints and, and things like that and so um i want to say towards i want to say the 2011 deployment was uh, was our six month stint but was that um, the first one where you were a handler no oh nine okay oh nine was so i went to i did so you know I, after that oh eight deployment <clears throat> i re-enlisted uh with the um, with the expectation to be a handler, right? I said, "Hey, look, I'll reenlist. I'll do five 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 more year reenlistment. Um, I want to be a dog handler." And uh, before you get into that, had you guys worked with dogs in house prior to that? Had you started doing that? Yet? Yes. Is that what drove you to want to do it? Yes. So, and you know, what drove me was we'll go back. What drove me was um, it was a, a to crit deployment. No. Yeah, it was a crit deployment, and um, we were, we still had our civilian. We, I want to say our first crit. Take that back. No, it was a 
It was Balad. I'm sorry. There's a lot. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, no, no apologies. I can only it was imagine. It was Balad deployment. And so we were having our civilian contractors as handlers. And um, matter of fact, the, the, head, the guy who ended up being the, um, the master trainer uh, for first bat, he was actually one of our civilian trainers. Or, yeah, he was actually one of our contractor handlers. And, um, and I was talking to him about it because I was, I was looking at getting out. I was wanting to get out, and I, was gonna, I wasn't wanting to do what he did. Um, I didn't want to be a team leader. I didn't want to be a squad leader. Um, I didn't have that desire to, to do that. I didn't want to be a sniper. I didn't want to go into recce. Um, and I didn't want to do the computer stuff with, or in the cell phone stuff like that TSC did. Um, I saw the dog. I had worked with animals as a kid growing up on a farm. And, uh, and that's something that I was gravitating to. And so I was looking at getting out of regiment and becoming a contractor like that guy um, so I could uh, handle dogs, you know what I mean? And, and hopefully get to where he was at, where I was handling dogs with Ranger Regiment. And so I was talking to him, and he told me, he said, don't get out. He goes, we're coming to you. Like, we're going to be setting up our own program. We're going to be coming to you. Don't get out. And I was like, okay. Well, then they opened up the dog program literally that that very next training cycle they had opened up the dog program and that that contracted civilian handler was now the head trainer and they had grabbed it was like a startup so i want to say they had grabbed like six dudes to be handlers right six dudes to let's see we had three active companies so three six, seven, was that nine. just just within the first bat yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was with you know that was th that was you know six dudes to nine platoons, right? Yeah. And so, you know, they were still needing needing handlers, but they was almost like a startup to kind of see how they were going to do the program or how it was going to unfold. Um, and so, you know, then that's when we started doing like I started noticing like we had our own dogs on target through the last two to crit deployments where it was a lot of heavy breech banger dog. Um, a lot of, there was a lot of dog action going on and it was probably the most canine action I had ever seen as an assaulter. Um, and that's really what drove me, drove me to it. And actually it was, a Benno had grown a name for himself, um, at that point in time as being just a complete asshole. And I had known him because I had worked with him and he had bitten, I'd, I'd seen him bite, <clears throat> I'd seen him like Jeremy Katzenberg, rest in peace. He he passed. You know he was also killed in Afghanistan. But I saw him bite uh, my buddy Jeremy Katzenberg in the ass. I saw him bite another one of my my buddies in the knee and take him down. Um, he had went went to Afghanistan and killed goats. Like you know they a guy I guess a guy ran into a into a goat pen and they sent him in there and he, he was notorious I guess for killing goats and so oh. he had, he had killed multiple goats on that target before they got him on the man. And um, he was just a dog, and he he had gotten he actually got had gotten kicked out of Afghanistan, mm. right? The, the the people in charge were like, "Hey, this dog can't be in Afghanistan anymore." And then they sent him to Iraq. They sent him to Iraq to be with one of the more competent handlers, right? And, and the, this competent handler is a, a guy named Stephen May, um, who is now the head uh, civilian trainer uh, at First Bat now. So. Um, and I looked up to him, right? He was our, he was our dog handler while we were, uh, while I was an assaulter. And yeah. so, and then he ended up actually becoming my section leader. Um, so I looked up to him greatly still yeah. do. And so, um, uh, yeah, man, to, to watch him work Benno as well. And he had a lot more success than a lot of other people did. Um, but, <clears throat> but he was still a lot of dog. Yeah. Is there an operation that stands out prior to you handling him? Um, where you saw him work that really like flipped that light switch of like, fuck, I want to do that. Yeah, man. We had actually, we had actually, you know, we, we had landed on a, we had landed on a, a long Y, which means that we had to, we had to do a lot of running and we could see the target, but we had to do a lot of running to get to the target. Um, we had gotten to the target, had a guy flee. Um, I was, you know, my, 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 uh, my squad, I was attached, we were attached to the dog or the dog was attached to us that night. And so our main job was to go after squirters and squirters are people who flee from the target compound. And so <clears throat> we're chasing down this guy. Um, this guy's in the, the middle of a, uh, the middle of a field. 
Um, and he's wearing something like a heavy, heavy, like they're the enemy at this point in time is like, they know if they run, we're sending the dog. So at this point in time, like they're protecting themselves and wearing heavy shit. Um, so if the dog bites, they can slip it and run. And so, um, they, he had sent, he had sent Benno onto the bite. Benno had gotten onto the bite. Um, the dude had slipped, slipped the, uh, slipped like this blanket or whatever that he was wearing and uh, started running, and, and once Benno realized that he was getting no more no more screaming and no more play out of it, he dropped it and ended up engaging the dude again. And by the time we had gotten to him, this dude's ear was hanging off of the side of his head, and uh, and Benno was just dest- just destroying him. I mean, this was an eighty five pound mal, yeah. and so he was just manhandling this guy for everything that he was, you know, essentially stealing his soul. And yeah. so when I saw that, I was like. I really want it's like I really I like I really really want to do this and and to see a dog like that um with that much power and strength do do it and like you you know you see the you know you you see the dog and you see like the um like the excitement like Mm -hmm. not on his face but through throughout his whole body like the dog is really really enjoying this yeah um and when the dog really, really enjoyed it, even though I wasn't his handler, I was really, really enjoying it. And yeah. so it was just, it's just something that, that when I saw that, I was like, yeah, this is really what I want to do. Yeah. Like this is, this is something that I think I'd be good at. Yeah. Um, taking care of, taking care of privates and specialists as a team leader and a squad leader and, you know, worrying about them going out downtown at night and drinking and partying and beating their wives or whatever it may be. That's not for me. Yeah. I knew that wasn't for me. Um, you know, I wasn't built for that. You know, writing ne- writing negative counselings and positive counselings and paperwork, that's not Trent. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there's there's also an element of, if you want to call it street justice or, or immediate tangible du- justice in situations like that, that, you know, wrong, right, or indifferent uh, is satiating. Yeah. You know, as a human being, that, that when you're, you know, opposed uh, other human beings that are try- actively trying to take your life and they decide, okay, I'm going to live to fight another day. And, and you manage to to catch them and seeing a dog, you know, for lack of better terms, essentially pun- punishing them and delivering immediate fucking tangible justice that you can watch. It's impossible not to enjoy that, you yeah. know, because it's the same thing with police departments. I mean, you get some guy that you know, sexually assaults a, a five-year-old girl and takes off running, like the dog goes and grabs him, like, there, there is an element of you're getting exactly what the fuck you deserve yeah. right now that, that is just always going to be there. And, and there's people that would argue that that's immoral or mm. against the law or, you know, uh, you know, primal or fucking caveman like archaic, you name it, uh, whatever. The, the, the reality of it is, is that that's a, a significant mm. driving uh, force and component, I think, for a lot of handlers and for a lot of operators just wanting dogs to be with them during <clears throat> during raids. Absolutely. Um, all right. So you, you, uh, experience that you say, that's my fucking, my speed. I want in on that. Um, what was the, the first kind of foot in the door? Like once you, you reenlisted, you got accepted to the program. What was the, the first interactions like, and how did that go? Um, so, you know, like as far as like, um, reenlisted went ahead, they, they sent us like, we got paired up and like, so it was interesting, right? Like, um, I didn't want Benno for, didn't want him. I was actually super upset that I was getting this dog because <laughs> in my eyes, like I, you know, like I said in the beginning of this thing, like I want to be the best, you know yeah. what I mean? I want to be able to produce. I want to be able to be used, right? Like I don't want to go out there and have a dog that's a liability to the assault force that nobody trusts when he's off leash because now all I have is a mascot that is dragging me around three or four K every night. You know what I mean? And so, um, he was a dog that wasn't trusted. And so I was really upset. And so I remember we were out on a baseball field. The handlers had just gotten accepted. You know, they were going to go down there and select like four or five more dogs to fill the spot, the, the slots for the, the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the platoons for every platoon to have a, a dog handler, um, with them. And, uh, yeah, like we, you know, they, they bring Benno out onto the field to do, like, an obedience demonstration. And, um, God, it was a fucking shit show, man. <laughs> How old was he at this point? Uh, I would probably I'd probably put him at five years old yeah. at this point in time. Five or six. Uh, but yeah, probably five. So they get him out there. And so it's, like, really simple obedience thing. Like, they have, like, a, 
a bite suit and some tennis balls scattered everywhere. And you're supposed to like heal the dog to one cone, then down him, and then go to the other cone or whatever. And so this guy handling him, you can clearly see on his face that he already knows like this dog is going to just not give a fuck about anything and do exactly what he wants to do. <laughs> and so he tells him to heal and he heals him and it's all off leash and it's with an e-collar and he heals him. And uh, he sees the bite suit. Boom, he grabs the bite suit. He then tries to, like, correct him off of the bite suit, and he sees the tennis ball. So now he, now he grabs the tennis ball and the bite suit in his mouth. And then now when they're trying to correct him and get him back to him, he is running to the outfield. Yeah. He's like, fuck you, I got what I want. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and at that uh, point in time, the, the civilian trainer looks at me, and he goes, he goes, how do you feel about taking Benno as your dog? And I, I looked at him, and I was like, really? And he was like, you two are like rock eaters, man. You guys will get along so good. He was like, and he, was, he told me, he was like, honestly, Mac, I think you're the only one here besides, uh, besides May that has the shoulders that can handle him, yeah. right? Like, you're, like, you guys are very strong, you know, powerful dudes. And what made me strong was obviously humping all that machine gun weight around for four straight deployments. So, you know... You know, he, so I was like, in my head, I was like, well, fuck, like, fuck me, man. Like, how, how am I going to get, how am I going to get this animal better? And how am I going to do better with this? And so, you know, they, they sent us to Von Lick. And so, um, kind of, kind of funny stories is that, you know, here they are, they're putting me on a aircraft with a dog like Benno, um, flying civilian. And we are in the cabin. Oh shit. Yeah. We we're like in the cabin fucking of these fucking genius airplanes. Genius idea was that. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I just do what I'm told. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so they have us like in the cab, we're riding civilian and, uh, we're flying out of the Atlanta airport from, so from Savannah to Atlanta, super easy flight from, um, from Atlanta to, uh, Indiana, uh, kind of a shit show with it just being overpacked and everything else. But, um, in Atlanta, there's a big, there's a big Muslim movement out there in Atlanta. So like when I say that, I mean like when we got off of the airplane, um, lots of people running around in man, man, man jammies is what we call them. And, you know, distoshes and stuff like that on their heads. And um, Benno knows what a duck looks like. And so if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and talks like a duck, well, it must be a duck. Yeah. And so, you know, he's seeing these people and I refuse to take the, the tram. I refuse to take like I'm like, I have to walk him from all. The, you know how big yeah. Atlanta is like I have to go underground and walk yeah. him all around that place. And um Boy, every time he would see a Muslim, he would, I mean, that dog didn't bark. He screamed yeah. like he, I don't think he really knew how to bark, but he, yeah. and I'm just like walking him and just trying to look forward with him with a muzzle on and Jeez. just like praying to God, I get to the fucking terminal and like, I don't get fired. So really like anytime I had my leash in my hands with that dog, I would say for the first six months, I was like, I'm getting fired. Like I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting fucking fired. You know what I mean? Like, God damn it. Yeah. So um, so we get there, we, we get to the Von Lick school. I, I, I don't excel one bit at that school. You know what I mean? I learn a little bit of things. I learn more from just having my hands on the dog. You know what I mean? With just personal time. Um, I guess, I, I guess I get more comfortable, you know, pulling them off strong off the bites and stuff like that. Um, and kind of using my equipment and, you know, learning how to be a decoy and, and leash handling and stuff like that. And that's really what that school was, was made for, I think. Um, but I did, by no means did I excel at that school. I was subpar probably at best. I was just trying to not get fucking fired. I mean, yeah. a, a funny story about that, right, is like I would take and utilize my weekends, right, our days off, and I would strap an e-collar on him and I'd be like, all right, let's go. You know, we go out to where this lake was at and there would be like a wide open field and stuff like that. And so I would bring him out there just to kind of cut him loose and let him be a dog and try to be friendly with him. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, um, knowing my fucking luck, there's like a herd of deer or whatever <laughs> they, they fucking kicks up and, um, he goes after him. And like, I turn that Tritronics on six, six high. And I start nuke, trying to nuke him back to me. And he he just Doesn't eats through he eats through it and yeah. he just keeps fucking going towards those deer. I ran through those woods like exhausted, and I finally caught caught up to him. And he had ran after these deer for so long that he had just exhausted himself and just finally lay down in the middle of the woods. Holy and he was shit. just <laughs> like whistling. And I was like, "You motherfucker! Like you're gonna you're gonna kill yourself out here? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what are you doing?" Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's. You know, have you, have you seen Thor Ragnarok? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my relationship with Benno, if I want to put it in a, any sort of like Marvel perspective, is 
whenever Thor and the Hulk meet each other in the arena, yeah. that was every day. <laughs> that was fucking every day. Like, what are you doing? Uh, We're friends. Like, great. what? Why? You know? <laughs> what the fuck? You know? So uh, that's, that's awesome. what it was like. And it was like, fuck, I, I, can't, I can't beat you hard enough, man. Yeah. Like, you don't care. Um, and so, it, you know, it wasn't into, like, in any way. So we get done with the school. You know, nothing really big. You know, no really big accolades. I'm just happy I got through that school without getting fired. And, and so they send us back. And so from Indiana to Atlanta, um, packed flight. The, pack, the, the flight's so packed that, like, we're sitting. I'm, I'm now sitting with, like, I'm sitting with this old lady that's, like, my grandma's age with an attack dog that we're telling people is a search and rescue dog God and a damn. muzzle on, right? And so <clears throat> Benno crawls up in this lady's lap, right? Like, we have our, you know, the little small <laughs> chairs. He crawls up in the lap, and this lady is covered in hair. And she's just petting him, and she loves him, and Benno loves it. He's yeah. like, muzzle on, loving life, loving life. Plane lands. Everybody gets off in Atlanta, except for, I think, people who were staying on the flight for some odd reason. I don't know what was going on there, but in front of me was a family of Muslims, right? So the lady, the little old lady gets off. My buddies get off. I'm like, ding. I hit the little thing, and I call in the stewardess, and I'm like, hey, is there any way you can get them to exit into the lobby, and then you can let them back on? And she was like, why, what's up? And I was like, he doesn't like him. And she was like, you know, then the stewardess is like, well, I thought he's a search and rescue. Well, he is a search and rescue dog, but he just doesn't like him. And she was like, I don't think I can do that. Because, you know, it's yeah. kind of at this yeah. point, you know, people are scared, you know what I mean, to like kind of say anything. So I'm like, oh, fucking great. Uh, I do a muzzle check. I make sure his muzzle's good. And I, I take him from the heel position that's on the left side, and I make sure I put him on my, my right side so, you know, I can control that and he doesn't he doesn't see him. So I'm walking him out, and I see the people, and all of a sudden, like, his nose fucking kicks up. And he, and he like, boom, looks at him laser-eyed, and he's, and he, like, he's, this <laughs> fucking poor family, like, three, three, like, kid, wife, husband, they're, like, pinned up against the fucking, <laughs> the skin of the aircraft, like, screaming, and I just grab him, and I just keep walking, like, a straight-faced, cold Jeez. sweating, you know what I mean? Just, like, trying to get the fuck out of there. <laughs> All right, guys, as you know, I'm into uh, health and fitness, uh, and specifically how nutrition relates to it. Um, coffee has, has been a staple of mine, and, and I think most people's for a long time. Um, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Mudwater, which is a sponsor of this show. They have been uh, for a while now, and, and we have a great partnership. I love their product. Um, it's a phenomenal alternative to coffee. Um, for me, you know, coffee, there's jitters, there's mold in it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it tends to, to kind of upset my stomach. Uh, but Mudwater has adaptogenic uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a fraction of of the caffeine that coffee has. There's a little bit, but it's very, very little. Um, and it, it really leans on, on mushrooms and the blend of matcha and chai for kind of that sustained energy that, that continues to go and, and doesn't crash the way coffee does when, uh, when it runs out. Uh, they use lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to support physical performance, chaga and raishi to support the immune system, turmeric for soreness and cinnamon for antioxidants. Um, I, I really enjoy that first cup of warm liquid in the morning by taking mud water instead of coffee. And I'll put uh, just a splash of, of heavy cream uh, or even some protein powder, uh, some collagen powder. Um, and I'll also throw uh, usually a couple drops of uh, stevia or uh, monk fruit vanilla to make it kind of a, a thick, normal morning coffee ritual type of uh, concoction. And uh, I got to tell you, it, it, it does wonders for me, and, and I'm really, really glad that I switched. It's been, you know, a better part of a year now, uh, you know, that I've been taking that uh, and using that as part of my uh, daily morning routine, and it's fantastic. I love it. I, I can't re recommend it enough. Uh, it's 100% USDA, uh, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified, uh, and they also donate to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics, which is uh, – you know, groundbreaking and leading research to help veterans with PTSD uh, and other uh, associated illnesses and, and uh, syndrome. So uh, great cause, great company, phenomenal product. If you go to Mudwater, that's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike to su support this show and the product uh, and use the code Mike Mud, 
M-I-K-E-M-U-D, all caps, for 15% off. That's, again, Mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike. And the code is Mike Mud, M-I-K-E-M-U-D, all caps, for 15% off. Go check them out. Why the fuck didn't they have you guys drive? I mean, didn't oh. you have a rental car the whole time you're there? Yeah, we did. We like, did. We did. I, it, that's baffling to me. Like, I don't know. Just, dude, was, rent a car where you have you have one anyway. Just drive there. Common sense tells you to yeah. do that. Um, me being a specialist at that time, <laughs> I was just, <laughs> I was just trying not to get fired. Yeah. Holy shit! I don't I don't have an opinion at this yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, so yeah, man. So like we we get back and obviously like. You know, the platoon that I'm working with knows him well because, you know, the that platoon fired him and he got kicked out of the country. Yeah. And this is this is two Bravo. So I was in three Bravo as a machine gunner. And then boom, now I'm in now I'm in two Bravo. Um and two Bravo is where my buddy who's a silver star recipient and all that, um, that's where he's at. And so he knows me well and me and him are good friends. And so that really kind of helped with me integrating in um with this platoon, right? Because, you know, the platoon knows who you are. Um, outside of their platoon, right? Like you're coming into their platoon, you're you're a new guy, you're a yeah. new fish, right? And so you still have to you have to impress, you have to show them that you're competent, you you have to show them that you can be trusted, and that you know what your weapon system is, and your weapon system is that dog. And so I wanted to I wanted to strive to make to be the the best possible handler I could be for those dudes, right? Because I wanted to be utilized. Um, I didn't want to be a liability. Um, and unfortunately, that's what I had in my hands at the time was a massive liability. Uh, and so, you know, we go out, you know, we do the training cycles, nothing, you know, nothing really too spectacular there, nothing to write home about with the training cycle with the platoon. We deploy. Um, we deploy to Kandahar, right? Uh, at this point in time, Kandahar's starting to become a city, right? Like we're like our own. You remember how they kind of built up Kandahar like towards the end or whatever? Yeah. Like, well, Kandahar is like massive. It's like a, a city within the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like you know, the, the military base right. is like a city. It's fucking huge. And so, um, that's that's where we were. That's where we were stationed at uh, or deployed at the first time. And um, the ROE had changed much differently uh, for the people of Afghanistan. It really seemed like we were putting on um, the boxing gloves and not really taking taking the fight too hard to that enemy at that time, which um, at that point in time with me having all those deployments kind of blew my mind um, because they were definitely a more well-trained uh, enemy, right? Mm -hmm. to, to me, a lot more deadlier than, than your Iraqi, yeah. uh, Iraqi insurgents. So, um, you know, and I, I think that had a lot to do with a lot of uh, foreign fighter influences as well as, um, you know, just, just the Taliban. I mean, just to, you know, that, that, that enemy in general, to, to watch them off drone plan and ISR, to watch them use ranger school tactics in um, movements, you know what I mean? Crossing LDAs, like you could watch them on, you know, from the from the drone feed, and you can watch them like do LDA crossings, which is, um, you know, your your linear 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 danger areas, which is like crossing a road. They do that textbook to watch them move in a wedge formation, like textbook. Like when you watch it from above, I mean, those were well well trained fighters, and uh, it just always blew me away that we were throwing on. Uh, boxing gloves to fight them yeah and uh but you know and and you know afghanistan right like now i'm now i'm a lot older i've been to a lot more deployments <laughs> i'm seeing things kind of a little bit more clear and from a different perspective and so um i start to notice that like you know just the people in general right like they they don't have sewage right they're if it gets too cold they're shitting and pissing in the corner of their house right they they don't have refrigerators they, they bury meat you know, and or, or they bury they bury portions of their food, um, and you just start to notice how, uh, you know, beyond third world country that that place is like that. That I mean, sometimes you would go to places out there in those mountains, and it'd be like those those people may have never seen. There could have been Americans that have been there three, four years, and they've never even seen that before. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like when they look at you, they look at you like you're a fucking robot. Yeah. You know, and so like an alien. You know, it was just fucking wild to me. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, get get to Afghanistan. I'm I'm hooked up, right? Like my third platoon's there as well, the old platoon that I worked with, and so we're it's second platoon and it's third platoon, and we're all on the same little Kandahar base. 
Um, and I had my, I had my, uh, my mentor, um, May with me, right. And he was working with, he was the handler for three Bravos platoon. So it was good having him there because me and him could train, he could help me out and whatnot. And so, um, you know, I ran, you know, the first time I deployed Benno onto, uh, onto a bad guy, um, he actually went and I deployed him onto a team leader's calf. Oh shit. You know, yeah. Just complete shit show. Right. Like just not not good um not good for my my ego not good for my confidence um you know the second time second time i deployed him i want to say like we got a we got a really good bite um it was you know it was nothing really to write home to nothing anything that i thought was m memorable what were the circumstances in which you sent him uh there was a, a dude in a room and he wasn't coming out yeah. and so that's when i i unarmed but non-compliant yeah, yeah yeah non-compliant and so i sent him in i sent him in and um I had sent him in too far in the back of the stack, right? And so as he ran up, he saw the, the kid, he just took what he saw, right? Yeah. And I was like, motherfucker. Um, and then kind of the, there, I only got like two bites at deployment. And then the second one was, um, was same deal. Like dude, dude was hiding in a, um, in a haystack, you know, like loose hay. I sent him in there, Benno, Benno bit him. Um, you know, I want to say it was like on the, on the arm, on the forearm, I got him off the bite and then, um, in the, 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 the team, the team attached to the squirter chase team at the time they did their thing, you know, and it was just me learning at that point in time, it was a learning curve on me having to do the proper paperwork. Right. Yeah. Cause if your dog bites somebody and you don't kill them, well, you're doing a mass amount of paperwork in order to provide evidence, you know what I mean? And, and take pictures and whatnot. Um, but <clears throat> the thing I would probably say our most, we had a few memorable missions on, uh, on that. And so it was always funny. Like you always knew, in Afghanistan, when you were gonna get into the shit, whenever you would fly and you would be flying in on infill and you could smell weed from hundreds of feet up in the air while you were in the helicopter. Um, and then they would land you in weed fields because it kept the brown out down. Instantly when you landed in those fields, you knew danger, 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 danger. And you would land in those fields and you would see flares shooting up, right? And that's, that's how they did their early warning systems. They had ICOM radios, right, which are just like handheld two-way radios, and they would be chattering back and forth to each other, right? The enemy would be like, hey, they've landed. We can hear them. You know, the the valley's echo, you know what I mean? That that flat, flat landscape echoes. Um, and then also their flares and then their cattle bells, they would ring just for early warning systems. I mean, like I said, when I tell you this was, this was a very well-trained uh, enemy. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, anywho... Um, uh, my, my, we, we were walking and at this point in time, we were actually doing missions with, um, we had like FB, some FBI agents attached to us, which in my head, I was always like, why? And I think the FBI agents were actually taking pictures of all the heroin mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that we were coming across. Um, but it always, and still to this day, it kind of blows my mind why a state state agency is running, you know what I mean? Running yeah. combat ops in a wartime theater. Yeah, that's beyond me to know. Don't <laughs> don't know, don't care. But that's what they were yeah. doing with us. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, we had we were going to our targeted compound, which was kind of in in the city of uh, Kandahar, um, and we started taking contact um, from the targeted compound as we were walking up and putting in isolation and containment. So we like we, as we're walking up and um, in our our ranger file. Boom, we take contact. Instantly, everybody's setting up a hasty uh, uh, containment around the around it, and they're starting to work the assault angles. Um, once again, we cannot drop uh, any air support on that compound because there are too many civilian targets um, in that area. There'd be too much um, too much civilian damage. You right? Too much collateral. Yeah, 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 too much collateral damage to that area. Um, we kill two dudes outside of the compound. And there's obviously, there's still a few more guys that are inside because they keep fighting us. Um, we throw, we throw, you know, this is probably within 45 minutes, they throw multiple thermal barrack grenades um, inside of that structure. Um, and the dudes are still fighting, right? And so then they th they're starting to throw thermal barracks. They're starting to throw grenades. Um, they're, you know, they're shooting fucking laws at it and everything else at this compound and um, trying to just fucking kill the enemy. And, uh, and the guys, they're, they're still hammering away. Well, I want to say they threw, like, another thermal barrack, and it got got quiet, right? We, we did our seals, which is, you know, you, you, you 
you sit, you listen, you you um you sit, you listen, you fucking uh you observe, you know what I mean, the uh the target. Um everything was super quiet. And so everybody's trying to peek in, everybody's trying to get a look at to see, you know, if any everybody's dead, if you know, if there's somebody still alive, if they can hear somebody still breathing with the swords on, whatever it may be. Um and none of that, you know, none of that was going on. So we were like, okay, let's prep to assault. Right. And so anytime that situation happens in my head, I already know that they're going to want canine leading. Right. So I already have the dog prep camera up, everything good to go. Like this is our time to shine Benno. Let's get it. So <clears throat> I come up, I come up, I I'm, have Benno and I'm in the kneeling position and I have him in between my legs. Right. And so I take off his muzzle I have a hold of his uh, his carrying handle on his canine storm vest. I let him know. I'm like, hey, seven, this is Tango, ready to send canine. He's like, roger that, send the dog. And I'm like, yeah, buddy. Yeah, you ready? You know, like kind of talking my dog up, letting him know what we're fixing to go do. And I'm like, go find him. And about that time, like PKM rips through the breach. Ba, 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 ba. So I grab him, right? And I fucking slide him back in between my legs and I sit down on him with all my weight. And I am pound, like pounding and grounding this dog. Like I am like, you have got to stop. Because at this point in time, like Benno is seeing red. He doesn't give a fuck. He's ready to bite. Like I just pulled him away from him wanting to bite. Dogs have no concept of, concept of fucking lead flying through yep. the air, right? He just hears the gunfire and thinks that there's something to eat. And so um, I put him in between my legs and I'm just I'm pounding and grounding this dog, man. Um, and my whole intentions with each punch is to knock him out. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I have got to knock you out because I don't want him to go in there and die. I don't want him to drag me in there and die. You know what I mean? And both of us die. Um, we're at the breach, you know? And so, uh, finally, he, he, uh, he, made it, he made it easy, I guess, on us. And he was like, fuck you punching me. And he reaches up and he, like, he bites me in my hand. And like doesn't let go. Like I have a I have a scar right there on my hand, but he bites me in my hand and I come up, so I have him in between my legs, and I come up and I, I'm picking him up like this now. And he's on his back legs. And I'm like walking to the back of the stack, right? While everybody else is paying attention to the gunfire. The PA is sitting right there. Um Major Fisher, Major Fisher, he's a he's a fucking legend within uh within first bat. He was a, a three seven five guy. Uh, I'm sorry, a 275 guy. Um, or, yeah, I want to see yeah, a 275 guy way back in the day, like 1993. Then he became a PA, and now he's like our PA, which he's always going out on target with us. And uh, and I did the majority of my deployments with him as our PA. Um, Physician's assistant. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And so that's kind of a lucky thing we get to have in the special yeah, operations sure. is we have those guys who go out on target with us, and they're fucking top-notch. And anyway, he pulls out a fentanyl lollipop, um, <laughs> and he looks at me, and he, he's like, it's already unwrapped and everything. He's like, I want to give this to you, and I want to help you, but you have to put the muzzle on your dog first. Yeah. By the way, this dog's still hammering on my hand. And yeah. so I, I pin him up against the wall of this, this house, right? Everybody's still in contact, paying attention. And I take the palm of my hand, <laughs> and I am hitting him on the fucking nose oh, fuck. as hard as I can. I'm like, ah. Ah, uh, he comes off of the bite. He comes off of the bite and instantly wants me to pet him. Like, no aggression whatsoever. Like, he just was seeing red. Yeah. You know, he came off the bite and was like, ooh, pet me. At this point in time, like, I'm trying to put this muzzle on this dog's face, and my this hand's just, like, locked up yeah. and not working. And so, like, I get the muzzle on his face majority, and then Major Fisher helps me clip it to the back. And I'm like, fuck, thank God. And he, like, oh, gives me that fentanyl lollipop, and I'm like, Phew. Like, and let me tell you, like, those things taste just like grape, and they work really fast. <laughs> <laughs> like, they work fucking really fast. I mean, and so, um, you know, within, like, 10 minutes, I couldn't feel my hand anymore. Wow. Um, I mean, what, what's the liability as far as you being that under the influence? And You could take, take your weapon. I mean, you still got the dog, though, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, I know he's muzzled, but. Um, at that point in time, I. So it's like, here's the lollipop, give me your gun. Yeah, it, but it, it did, didn't really go down that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's it how it's was, supposed to go yeah I, I think that's typically how it's supposed to go um like i said i've known major fish knew major fisher for a long time i think he kind of looked at me and he stayed close to me the whole time we yeah. were still in contact so he, he needed to pay attention obviously if we were going to take any more casualties like that that's probably where his focus was but he did he looked at me um and he was like hey i probably need to take your weapon from you 
And he was like, but I'm not. Mm. And he was like, but, and he, he looked at me and he was like, I need you to take a knee and stay out of sight, out of mind until you're needed. Yeah. And I was like, got it. And so that's what I did. Yeah. Um, wow. At this point in time, we're out on target so long that the sun's coming up. Um, and, uh, and they feel pretty confident that they've killed the guy that's inside now. Um, so they ask for canine again to stack up onto the breach. And we stacked up, we stacked back up onto the breach. Now you're high as a kite. I fucking love it. Right? <laughs> I'm like, at, the, at this point in time, I'm like two fentanyl lollipops deep. Like not just one, I'm too deep. And I'm fucking loaded. And uh, I get him back up on the breach and I'm like, fucking pop it, go find him. You know, dog goes in there. The assault force flows in behind the dog. Um, you know, dog finds the one casualty. I'm actually, I, I step in. I'm like the last person in there. I don't even have my weapon up. You know what I mean? Like there's, I'm not there to do that right now. And, uh, and I was too high to do that anyway. And so I, I go in there and Benno is dragging this dead body from room to room, proud as fuck. And like everybody, like he just wants everybody to look at him dragging this dead body from room to room. And people are like petting him and loving on him and everything else. Um, and, uh, and that was like, to me, that was like a super cool, that was kind of cool to see. Right. He was like, Oh yeah, we're good for, uh, we came off that target. And when we came off that target, we, we went out to a field. 160th typically doesn't fly in the day. Um, and they had sent, um, Blackhawks and Chinooks to come pick us up. And, uh, and we were taking contact off of our, um, HLZ. And so I was, I was so, and I remember I was, now I'm like three fit in all lollipops deep. And I was so fucking high that when the, when the helicopters were coming in and we were taking contact, I was like, hot HLZ. <laughs> and like, they were just like, shut the fuck up. That's fucking frat, so, yeah, frat yeah. boy screaming. Yeah, yeah, dude. So, they, uh, so I got, get off there. We get on the helicopter. We land. We land and instantly like I start vomiting. Right, yeah. right? It's just way, way too much narcs and everything else. So I vomit, whatever. I have... I have my E5 board the next day, wow. right? And so my buddy, Joe Miramoto, who's a sniper, he sat sat up with me and he helped me clean all my stuff. Like I would nod out and pass out and he would just, he still continued to clean my weapon and my kit and everything and get me ready for the E5 board. How fucked up um, was your hand? Bad. Yeah. It was I mean, bad. So when, when, did he bandage it or stop the bleeding or, or address it at all when he was giving you the fentanyl pops? Uh, we, we, we wrapped it, yeah. we bandaged it. Um, there's actually a, there's actually a picture of me. Um, I'm standing in front of a big hedgerow of weeds, like weed. Yeah. And uh, I have my hand bandaged up. Yeah. And uh, I'll show it to you later. But yeah. if you look in my eyes, I am lit. Yeah. I am lit the fuck up. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's when we were leaving. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> and that, that was that night. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah. But when we got back, like when you get bit like that, and as you know, you've worked with dogs, like you got to let that drain. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's a lot of scrubbing and cleaning yeah. and pain, and you got to let that drain. And yeah. hand bites are some of the worst bites. Oh, they are the worst, yeah. And, um, and like I said, I still wear that scar yeah. to this day. And, wow. and uh, it, 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 it was rough. I mean, he bit me. I started, I started puking instantly when he, yeah. when he bit me. I mean, wow. that's how much pain it was. Yeah. Um, that's just how my body decided to react. Um, after that, for like three, I did the board, passed the board. E5 McDonald now. Woo. So for about three days after that, <clears throat> he wouldn't eat. He didn't really? eat. He wouldn't eat food. Benno wouldn't. Like he knew he would see my hand. He would come up and lick my hand. He wouldn't eat. He was just really, um, you could tell he was really, really ups upset with himself. Was that a, a turning point for you guys relationship wise? Yeah. 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 That was for him to be conscious of that as a, Simple association animals, pretty, uh, pretty yeah. profound. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was super because he would, he would like, I would cut him loose in my room, and it'd be me and him hanging out because, like, we we lived in like our own little room together, him and I did, with nobody else around. So, you know, I would cut him loose, and when I cut him loose, like, you know, I try like be as hard as you want to be, but when I would cut him loose, I was fucking scared of him, yeah. like for for a long time. Oh, yeah. Like I would cut him loose, and he would like dart to me, like he yeah. would, like he wanted me to pet him, and I'd Asshole be like, pucker up." Yeah, I'd be yeah. like, "Fuck, man!" Like, yeah. goddamn. And so, it took me a while to kind of get rid of that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just for us to become buddies again, and um, because, and to be honest with you, we weren't we weren't fucking at that point in time. We still weren't buddies. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it was very very like I said, it was Thor meeting the Hulk in the arena. You know, every every night, and so um, then we. Uh, you know, then, you know, you, you go on like my, so we'll, we'll keep going. So 
Third platoon had a casualty, right? A guy got shot in the ass. He didn't go home. He was just, you know, he was walking wounded on a target, um, but he was a saw gunner. My good buddy, Justin Castellanos, he was a team leader, and he had came to me, and he was like, hey, do you mind being, do you mind being our saw gunner on target? And I was like, yeah, no problem. Um, and I did it because they were down a dude, and they needed a dude, and just so happened we were in the same theater, and we weren't going out as platoons, like, together every night, right? Really never. Like, first platoon would go out one night, or, I'm sorry, second platoon would go out one night, third platoon would go out the next night, yeah. right? So now I found myself where I was running missions every night, right? So I was, boom, I'd throw kid on, go, go run mission as a, as a fucking saw gunner with three Bravo, right? And I did that because... W- one, I love those dudes, right? Three Bravos, where I grew up. A lot of those same dudes were there. My good friend Justin Castellanos is asking me to do this because he he doesn't like he doesn't want to die if shit shit happens, right? He wants somebody who's competent around him that's willing to pull the trigger. And so um, I I did that I did that strictly out of love. Yeah. You know what I mean? Out of love out of love for him and a love for that platoon. So I would kit up and I would go out and I'd be a saw gunner. And the next night. I would have a separate kit, which was my dog training kit, and I would kit up and I'd go out and be a dog handler. Um, and so I did this, and then I did this off and on, and then we had first platoon kind of rolled in, right, from wherever they were at in country. They kind of rolled in uh, because our platoon got, two Bravo got kind of, um, we, got, we got shut down. We got shut down for, uh, for various reasons. Um, I don't really want to talk about it, but we got shut down, um, and uh, and. So now first platoon was taking over our missions. And so I was going out as a dog handler. So first platoon was taking out two dogs, right? Their dog handler, which was the Jenga, which she was a phenomenal dog who died in combat. And then they were taking out me and Benno and um, two Bravo shut down. And then three Bravo, I was going out as a saw gunner. And so I was working those two platoons pretty heavily. And um, what was it? It was uh, October it was the day I was pinning E5. It was October 1st, 2009. Um, <clears throat> you know, basically the mission was we saw these dudes huddled up. Um, we were doing an offset infill to go ahead and, um, and break up their meeting, right? Figure out what they had going on with this meeting and whatnot. So we do an offset. We're walking to the target. We take contact from a machine gun. Um, <clears throat> that, that right there in that instant was the first time that I had ever... I had ever been in the danger space in the beaten zone of a machine gun. And when I, when I say that, it's because I was taking a knee um, next to a wall, and when the machine gun fire erupted, rounds impacted, boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? Like the, like the beaten zone. And when I saw that, I had to actually get up and remove a different cover. Um, one, of our, one, of, one of the snipers got shot through the stomach, right, right, right underneath this kit. Thank God it didn't hit anything crazy vital. Right, it came out, boom, boom, um, came out his back. Uh, we called in our Xville. We killed the dudes. Called in the Xville uh, the medevac bird. Medevac bird pulled them out. We walked to target. We walked to target. Textbook cover. Um, we isolation containment around the dudes hold, holding their little powwow campfire. They don't hear us. <clears throat> we do a call out. Hey, you. This is us with a bullhorn. You know, come out with you. You know, come out with your hands up. Da 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 da. Anyway, they go to pick up their weapons that are sitting there. And instantly when they pick them up, we light them up, right? Kill them, kill, I want to say three or four dudes, kill them. And, um, and at this point in time, we complete SSE, SSE is complete. We get up and we are now walking out of the target and going to our Xville HLZ. And, uh, and it's starting to become daylight. Um, Robert Sanchez, he sees, uh, like I'd probably say 250 meters away from where um, we killed those dudes at, uh, he sees like an AK and a RPG body kind of propped up against a, um, a mud hut, right? That's along our route. Uh, it grabs his attention. He goes and inspects it real fast. He looks at me and he says, um, Hey Mac, do you mind moving? Right. And so I'm like, no issue. And he's asking me to move because he's asking Corey Rimsberg to take the camera out of his back. Right. Cause he has pouches and he has his camera back there. He's going to take a picture of it. You know, they were going to check it all out, and then they were going to leave. At that point in time, I took, like, three or four steps forward, and boom, explosion. Um, I, You know, I, it was like all I saw was, like, red dust and everything else, and then <clears throat> I don't think I was out too long, um, but when I woke up, Benno was punching me in the face with his nose, 
And, uh, and I instantly woke up and I grabbed his ears and I said, uh, I did, I said it out loud. I said, well, I got both my arms. And then I stood, I remember I didn't even look at my legs. I just stood up as fast as I could. And I stood up as fast as I could. And I looked down at my legs then. And I said, well, I have both my legs. Right. And then I was like trying to, trying to check myself out, making sure I was good. Um, that's intense, man. Yeah. And so I walk, I walk back to the blast site. Um, this blast site is like a fucking crater, right? Like this, this IED was meant for, uh, vehicles, right? It was a pressure plate meant for vehicles. And, uh, and when I walk to the blast site, I can see, um, there's a, a guy named Tori Honda. He's, he's laid out on the ground and he's missing his, he's missing his foot. Like it, it wild, like it sheared his, his foot off right at the ankle. Right. And, uh, you can see the tendons and stuff hanging there and he's screaming for his life. And, um, and I look over and I see uh, a guy named Goucher and he's underneath a wall and, um, and I instantly start digging him out of a wall. Right. And so like, cause everybody else is kind of running to the blast site at this point in time as well. Um, and so we're, I'm digging Goucher out of the, this wall and I start dragging him. Um, and as I'm dragging him, Benno, Benno is dragging him as well. And, um, and I remember I was thinking, I was like, I kept asking him, I was like, is he biting you? Is he biting you? He's like, no, 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 no. He's not biting me. Wow. At this point in time, Goucher's back's blown out, <clears throat> but it, it didn't hit me until a few days later. That he, he was actually helping me. Yeah. Right. He was helping me. What an like, exceptional dog. Yeah. Man. Like he was, he wasn't, he wasn't there to engage. He was there to help me. And so he was dragging him back. Um, I'm sitting there trying to figure out what the fuck's going on with my life. Right. Like my, I just got rocked. Um, my back's kind of stinging. Uh, but I just think it's probably just from debris and stuff that, that hit it like no big deal. Um, and I'm sitting there talking, taking a knee, making sure I'm checking Benno's equipment. And all of a sudden that APU dude taps me on the shoulder <clears throat> and he's like, Mr. 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 You're back, you're back, you're back. And at that point in time, um, Sergeant Spencer, who's the platoon sergeant, um, he was just got through, I think he's retired now, but he just got through being the, um, the Sergeant Major at first bat. And so anyway, he sees me, he runs up to me and he looks at my back, he looks at my back real fast. And he was like, are you okay? And I was like, what do you mean? Am I okay? And he was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I think I'm okay. And he was like, like hit me on the helmet real fast. And he was like, okay, I need you to take a knee. He was like, I don't need you to move. I need you to take a knee. And so at this point in time, I'm like kind of freaking out thinking that I'm fucked up. You know what I mean? Cause my back's on fire. And uh, I, th I think he handled it really, really well. But now I'm now I'm in a point where I'm observing, and I'm noticing a lot of chaos. And so they're they're trying to look for somebody, and I don't know exactly who they're looking for. Um, and come to find out, I, I saw it, and that's when um, that's when I saw Sanchez, uh, and Sanchez was missing. I mean, he was like a, if you think of a Lego man, um, he is he still had his helmet on him, he still had his weapon slung, he still had his kit on him. Um, he was missing, he it was like somebody took his, his legs and just pulled him off. Like he was missing his legs from the hips down. Like they just disintegrated. Um, and I don't think they found anything uh, of, of his legs, but you know, and I remember watching them put him in an aviator's kit bag, right? Oh, like a wow. fucking, like that's, that's what was left of him. They put him in a fucking aviator's kit bag. And I remember thinking to myself, like that was the first time I'd ever seen, you know, Cookie Davis. I never saw, I never saw his body. You know what I mean? But to see a dude like that and, uh, and to see the guy, and I won't mention his name, a um, really good friend of his, find him, right? Like he, he picks him up and you can clearly see that, um, that it, ha it hasn't fully registered to him yet either. He picks him up and, uh, and he's almost like talking to him, right? And he looks down and when he looks down, he, he, fuck, he fucking collapses on top of him because he realizes he has no legs. He realizes he's dead. But he's trying to like, you know what I mean? It was fucking wild like i've never seen anything like that um during this time like your your medics your first responders everybody's doing their job the ccp's getting fucking set up um they're calling in fucking medevac right now uh 160th is coming in you know turning and burning and i look over and you have <clears throat> you have major fisher who is um he is a, they found Corey rimsburg he's head down in the in this drainage canal and he's essentially drowned and um, you, I, I, I literally watched Major Fisher like hand pump, hand pump, and get this dude's lungs clear of water and bring him back to life. No shit, right there. I mean, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, we get on the helicopter. 
we get on the helicopter, the SRT surgeons are there. The, the, the senior medic still left on the ground. The SRT surgeon's on there on the helicopter. The PA uh, is on the helicopter with another PA. And, um, and then I notice, like, here I am with the dog. You know what I mean? And, like, like yeah, I've been, I've been hurt. They just don't know the extent of it quite yet. And um, I remember, like, I, like, Major Fisher calls me to him, and he walks up, and I'm like, he's like, hey, I need you, I need you to watch. I need you to watch him. And I was like, okay. He was like, I, for real, I need, I need you to fucking watch him, Mac. And I was like, got it. And so I de-linked Benno to the skin of the aircraft. Wild, Benno never gave me any shit from on that on that whatsoever. Um, and so I de-linked Benno down to the skin of the aircraft. I actually took my kit and helmet off, right, so I could be more mobile. And um, and I'm just checking vitals, and I'm talking to the people who are who are talking. Um, that was the first time I'd ever looked at, been inside of a forty seven. And um, it is full with nothing but casualties. It was a mass cow situation. And so <clears throat> there are people who are dead. There are people who are in the process of dying. Um, and there are people who are seriously missing limbs and, and fucked up on that thing. You know what I mean? And so it was a massive gut check for me. Um, but you have to keep it together. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, I, and so we, we get off the bird. I leave Benno on the bird when we're at the cache. And, uh, and I grab up <laughs> Rimsburg with um, Fisher. And so I have Rimsburg, and he, Fisher looked at me, and he said, do not fucking drop him. That's, what, that's what, what he told me. And I was like, got it. Like, I'm not dropping this guy. And so we get him, we get him onto the, the vehicle that takes him to wherever he's got to go to go get his surgery done. And so I then grab Benno up. I take him. The vets come, and they grab Benno because now they're doing checks on him to make sure he's not hit. And that's when I realized that um, that my back has been, you know, fucking pretty much hit with a mass amount of shrapnel. I had a lot of shrapnel come up the back of my helmet as well. Um, and so, you know, like I, I still have my, I still have that multi-cam uniform that if you hold it up to the light, at least just switch cheesed. Wow. You know what I mean? And so, um, but, you know, I, I get there and I'm, I'm sitting in the, the hospital in the operating room. And, um, and like, I remember the, a guy named Rippy, a guy named Rippy came over. He could tell that I was really in my head. And, uh, I mean, I wasn't crying or anything like that, but I was definitely in my head about the whole situation. And he was the, he was the senior medic on, on the target. And he sees me, and he fucking smacks me across the face. And he was like, get it together. No shit. Yeah, and me and him went through Rip together as well, but then oh. he went to so, sock him or whatever to his medical thing. And, he, and I'll never forget that to this day. I mean, he slapped the shit out of me and told me to get it together. And I was like, okay, pff, here we are. Well, then all of a sudden I start noticing um, high-ranking people asking me questions about what, 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 like, hey, what happened? What did you see? And that's when I realized, like, there's nobody, there's nobody that's, that's conscious that can, tell, that can tell any of this. You know what I mean? And so, like, I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, I got super, one, I got super lucky. And then all, and then you honestly you start feeling like a, a sense of guilt as Survivor's well. Survivor's guilt. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then also like job wise, right? Like, yeah, you know, like say if this was me, two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve time frame, a lot of confidence, right? Dog hasn't bitten me in the hand on target. Everything else, I probably would have just cut him loose off leash, and you know, maybe maybe you would have found it yeah. before anything had happened. Um, I've shoulda, coulda, woulda that situation so many times, and it's so unhealthy. Uh, to do it and uh and i do my best uh not to do it um especially on that day but yeah man um a lot of a lot of emotion there dude that's heavy yeah so super heavy yeah I mean, uh, and so uh i would probably say uh, i took two days off right back on target yeah right back so uh, physically, were you, um, how bad of, of shape were you from the shrapnel? And like, did you have to, did you have that pulled out? Do you still have some in you? Do you yeah, they pulled, they pulled some of it out. Um, while I was, you know, while I was in country, they pulled a lot of it out. Um, you know, the, the long-term effects and toll that it played on me is I had to have three shoulder surgeries. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, you know, and a lot of that is, is probably my, a lot of that's my own, my own doing, right? I'm an extremist. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Um, if I feel like I'm good enough where people depend on me, as, as I told you with, the, with that third platoon thing, like I'm going to go out there and I'm going to overextend myself so my buddy has the support and he's comfortable knowing that I have his back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, if one Bravo needs a dog handler, you know, I'll go out there and do it. 
because the reality is, is that <clears throat> um, I requested to go out with him. Nobody forced me to go out there. Nobody, you know, it wasn't even my, my mission, essentially, as a handler. Um, I requested to go out there, and I did it. Um, and I did it because, you know, I did it because I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there for, for the dudes. I wanted to be there for them. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, two days later, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the saddle. We're back doing, doing the damn thing. Um, really, throughout that deployment, I remember I had, was married at the time, and my wife was fucking pissed at me. And she was like, because, you know, you have the FRG that they, they, they start talking and whatnot. And they're like, you know, she starts putting two and two together, and she's like, why were you out there with that platoon? Why are, and she's I'm, giving you shit about it? Yeah, she was kind of giving me shit oh. about it, right? Because she was like, you're not supposed to be out there. Like, that's not your platoon. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, well, you know what I mean? Like, uh. And so I'm kind of fighting that battle with her, and she's back in my hometown with my mom, and my mom and her are kind of going back and forth at each other too. So every time I call, I have to deal with that shit as well. Jesus, man. Um, and so it was a lot for me to, and I, to this day, I've never forgiven him for that, yeah. by the way. Never. I mean, even throughout my sobriety and everything like that's just something that I can, I can never forgive one. Maybe, maybe my ex-wife was too immature, but my mom should have known better um, with, with, you know, with it. But uh, there's a lot of things that on my side of the house happened really um, with all that kind of that really, uh, really kind of changed the way I looked at some of my family members. Yeah. You know, so anywho. Um, so as far as things being like, I, I slowed it down and I was like, okay, I'm not going to go out every night with three Bravo and I'm not going to go out every night with one Bravo. I'll just go out with, with my platoon. I'll make the house happy. You know what I mean? No harm, no foul. Cool deal. So I did that. Um, really from there, not a whole lot, not, a, not really a whole lot of crazy stuff happened from there, from that deployment. Yeah. You know what I mean? Other than the, the bond and the relationship with me and that dog was a lot. Cause <clears throat> You know, when you're outside your room and you're at the gym and you're with your dudes, you're putting on a, a completely different face, right? Like you have to almost. Um, when you go back in your room and it's just you and him, yeah, that dog, that dog heard me cry. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think he knew it. Uh, and yeah, he, he bonded after that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart. And that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him. And his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder, as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So um, it is Whole30 approved. Um, it's uh, sports certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. 
Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health, and, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things, uh, in Glenn Bubbs honor. So, uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. That's heavy shit. The, uh, I mean, even in some of the stories that you've talked about, I mean, even something as simple as him recognizing certain key pivotal moments in, <clears throat> in experiences that you guys had together of, of when to basically knock it the fuck off. Yeah. And, and he did, you yeah. know, and, and that's fucking rare. Yeah. Uh, you know, to, to have a dog that's that driven, but, but that's also that emotionally intelligent, uh, intelligent and uh, adept to um, kind of reading the room in a, in a bigger picture that way is is pretty special. Yeah, you know, and 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 it's really uh, it's it's really neat to hear, um, you know, that that amongst all of that chaos, that you had a dog that that had the wherewithal and and kind of the the perception to understand the gravity of what was happening and, and act accordingly. Absolutely. And that, yeah. and that was the thing, right? Like everything I've told you about him up to that point, you're like, this dog's fucking out of control. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when he, when he does shit like that, you're like, wait, yeah, like that's this dog gets it. Yeah. This dog, this dog gets it. And yeah. so, you know, get, we'll, we'll get back, get, get back from that deployment. Um, I have my son, my son is born, you know what I mean? Uh, that's, that was another key big thing that kind of played into people getting pissed off at me. My home side was, was he born while you were gone? No, no, no. He was in the process. Um, he was incubating. <laughs> yeah. in, in the petri so, dish. Yeah. So, uh, you know, son, son is born. Um, that was kind of a cool thing as, as well. I'll, I'll kind of get into him and him and Benno here shortly. Um, and, but I, what I do is, is I buy, I buy at the, that next training cycle, I buy a puppy, right? Puppy Malibu. Um, the expectations of me of buying this puppy was I was really getting into the game. I really wanted to understand um, what was going on. And I, in my head, I just kept seeing us buy these dogs and get them from like Von Lick and other vendors. And in my head, I was like, we can do this better. Like, there's no way like this is the best. There's no way this is tier two, the best that we can fucking give and put on the battlefield, right? Like we can do better than this. And so I got this puppy and um, with guidance from my trainer, I, I trained this puppy on explosive detection. I trained him on laser, right? And I trained him on obedience. I trained him on gunfire. Um, I trained him on everything tracking. I trained him on everything that our dogs are fucking trained on. And, um, and what I did was, is I used that during that training cycle. I used what I was learning and I would bleed it over onto Benno. So now I put Benno on laser. Now, now I put Benno on laser. Now, I'm, I'm working with the platoon, right? Because a lot of the times with the dog handlers, the dog handlers would kind of, you know, they would become dog handlers to kind of escape the platoon atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. So they could just hang out at the kennel and, you know what I mean? Like they go, they go, they go do like one, two training events with the, with the platoon every training cycle, but they, they kind of, they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, I didn't do that. I made sure I made myself available um, just about any time they ever did anything. And, uh, and it was, you know, it got to the point where, like, the people who were in charge of me, because, like, I became, like, the government purchase card holder of the kennel <laughs> at this point in time and shit like that. And so the people that were in charge of me would actually get fucking annoyed at me because I was constantly training dogs. And, um, and so I kind of made a deal with them. I was like, hey, look, how about I give you guys every Friday? And, like, I come in, I fucking do all my admin shit on Friday. I, I make whatever government purchases and get the signatures you need. And then I can just train dogs. And they're like, cool. Yeah. They're like, deal, 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 yeah. deal, deal. And so at that point in time, I'd gotten some notoriety and some respect and stuff like that where I can I can kind of talk, talk to these guys, you know what I mean? And, you know, we've kind of grown up with them as well. And so they were like, okay, cool, deal. And so um, I was working with the platoon a lot. And I always figured, like, you know, if, if I'm working with the platoon, then how hard can my fucking leadership bitch at me? You yeah. know what I mean? Like nobody else is, yeah. you know, so yeah. uh, nobody else in the section is. And so that's what I did. And so I got Benno really in tuned and really I got the people around me in tuned and trusting that dog yeah. and learning how to like cast him and learning how to, for him to be around him at all times, <laughs> shooting at the range and everything else. And so what I built there was, and when I look at it, 
you know, now what I built there was, is Benno looked at those people as his pack now, mm -hmm. right? Whereas beforehand he didn't. Yeah. Um, he looked at them as if they were just objects or things in, in the know, way. Yeah. In the way. Right. And so I made it to, made it to a point where he was like in, in tuned and like, Hey, this is my pack now. And you know, I didn't put them away. Um, I would come in to the coughs when we were back home and I would cut him loose in the coughs and he would run around like an idiot and everybody would bend oh and love on him and shit like that. Whereas beforehand, his other handlers kept him away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he didn't get that kind of interaction. Yeah. And so, you know, in his head, he's like, why, why the fuck should I do this for you? If fucking you're just going to put me in a box, you know? Yeah. So I let him be a part of the team, right? Yeah. Not just an asset or something that you use a tool. Not a tool yeah. yeah. And so, um, I saw him shift from that 2000, you know, 2000, uh, yeah, from that 2011, 2012, 10, 11, 12, I saw him shift, saw him shift hard. And um, we started utilizing, like I said, a lot of red laser. Me and, me and the sniper, we were all good friends. Like we all, at this point in time, I'm really good friends with everybody whose leadership positions within two Bravo. And so um, either that or I'm well-respected. And so, like, I'm working with uh, the sniper guy to be like, hey, look, we're going to get Benno on red laser. And whenever you set up, um, whatever you set up Overwatch and we send him into a compound, you can actually guide him into each room with your laser. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then me, I had it an SOP to where I would, if I was utilizing the camera, I would turn it on and hand it to the PL. Yeah. Right. Because the PL can watch that shit. Yeah. I, I I can't look at this and, and guide a dog. Right. Yeah. Like not a screen this fucking big. It's yeah. not not gonna work. So oh, the hand is using the storm vests. Yeah. 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 It, storm vests with a shitty TSE camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that thing's fucking trash. Yeah. Made made with Radio Shack parts. I swear <laughs> to God. But they want ten Gs for it. Like yeah. oh god. Anyway, yeah. um, and honestly, what I would use the TSE camera for mainly was if we were doing area searches, I would keep it down. And turn it on so it illuminated mm. my dog's whole back. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Instead of cracking Kim's and all that yeah. shit, just turn it on. Pff, yeah, set it down and it would illuminate the back of the dog. Oh, right. That's cool. Because if you flip it up, what it does is it whites out the assault force. Yeah. And I fucking hated that. Yeah. But it, like you turn it on, psh, it illuminates yeah. the whole ground and everything around him, and it's like cool. Every you can't miss him at that point. In time, yeah. Right. He looks like a big fucking spotlight running yeah. around. <laughs> you yeah. know. And so, but yeah, that's that's how we would do it with the man. Um, and so it was super cool. Like we were at Fob Leatherneck, which is some shithole in Afghanistan um, on that second deployment to Afghanistan that I did. My, my second go around after the 09 one, after they got blown up. And so had a lot of success with, uh, with Benno there. Um, I think we probably got like eight bites. Um, are, are doing, can you share a couple of them? Um, the ones that stand out as a... Uh... Well, there was, there was a... Um, I'll share one of them with you. It was a, uh, a tunnel bite. And so we had, we had hit the compound. Um, couldn't find anybody, right? There was like nobody in there, but ISR had seen people going in and out of there uh, throughout that day. And a matter of fact, they saw them, you know, coming in and out of there 30 minutes before we showed up. Um, so it's not like they just disappeared into thin air. And so we had found a tunnel. And, um, and when we found the tunnel, uh, they asked me, they were like, hey, do you feel comfortable uh, sending Benno down there and I was like fuck. like that's kind of a situation where you're like fuck like he's he's got to go yeah you know what I mean like this is super high threat uh but he's got to go you know what I mean I'm I'm not I'm not gonna have my good buddy uh fucking take his kid off and go down there like a fucking Vietnam soldier with a flashlight and a tunnel ramp. fucking pistol you know what I mean like we're we'll we'll handle this this way so I hooked him onto a Petzl EXO rope which is a 70 foot um rope and it's meant to Really, it's like a rescue rope. Yeah. It's a like help. climbing rope. Yeah, yeah, climbing rope. And so, I sent him down into that tunnel. Um, sent him down into that tunnel, and uh, and he ended up finding he ended up finding a bad guy down there, engaging him. Um, was was able to drag him out, um, drag the dude out, just like fishing. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean. That poor motherfucker. He thought he was going to go down there and hide. <laughs> And uh, and all, all all Benno did was he latched on, and I was like, "Fucking, we we hooked in our our, our hook, we sunk it in real good." And I just hand over hand and Ooh. drug that dude back up through that tunnel with an eighty five pound dog just pushing on him. About how far of a drag was it? <sighs> 10, 15 meters. Yeah, wow. You know what I mean? So give give or take. Long. Yeah. I mean, long, definitely long enough to rethink your <laughs> rethink life choices. Yeah. Getting uh, getting fucking torn in half the whole way. How mm -hmm. how bad was he when you got him out? He was, you know. 
And where did he grab him? Yeah, yeah, he was the arm yeah. right here on the arm. Um, you know, Benno, <clears throat> Benno was a um, a very intense dog. He didn't have a lot of teeth left in him, right? He had um, he had like two. He didn't have full canines. He had like two mangled canines, a bunch of other teeth that were all fucked up. Um, but uh, but what uh, he had, he fucking laid yeah, it. But what he had, he, he used. And, and the reason why he didn't have teeth is like he would engage people on a bite suit, and then he would just fight the world, right? Like he would get on the bite suit and then he would hold on to the bite and you as the handler come up, he would try to like fucking fight you and hold on to the bite so he would yeah. gator roll. Yeah. And so with a bite suit, like with flesh, that's cool, right? Yeah. That's going to give. With a bite suit, that yeah. material just fucks his teeth up. Yeah, it just fucks his teeth up. So um, I was, you know, f with further training him when I noticed that, it was just one of those things where in my head I was like, does Ben O'Nee bite work? No. Like I'm not doing bite work. Yeah. We'll do odor work. And so that was a really nice thing with that dog throughout the 10, 11, and 12 is that when I trained, I didn't do any bite work. With yeah. Like, we already know he'll do that. Yeah. Like, there's no fucking point. Um, another memorable bite that I had with him is um, I sent him on a bite. He had, he had fucking bit this dude. And I uh, bit this dude in the wrist. The guy was wearing a watch. And, like, one of his smaller molars in the back, he bit it, and he cranked that molar off to the side. <clears throat> we had another guy we had to go getting engaged um I'm, I'm hearing him crunch around something in his mouth after the bite like i pull him off the bite and i'm looking and like i flip open his gum and i'm like fuck this tooth is like hanging on by gum and i'm like oh fuck like how how am i gonna get this out of his mouth because like we still have another guy to go get yeah you know and um I'll, I'll never forget it i was like hey I, I was like hey you have a leatherman <laughs> he's like yeah what are you gonna do and i fucking click it open and i'm like hey sit, stand back everybody yeah. stand back and he was like are you fucking serious and i was like I was like, yes, I am. Oh, and so, like, I had him down on his side, and I, out there like a fucking witch, witch doctor dentist, I fucking really fast grab, grab that tooth with Leatherman and pull. And when I pull, he ba 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 ba. Then he lets go of me, and I turn him around, and I'm like, watch him, find him. And he whoa, launched back out there and fucking smashed that next dude. <laughs> and everybody, everybody in the platoon was like, oh whoa, <laughs> like oh fucking whoa. <laughs> You know what I mean? They're like, wow, Dude, and uh, and so that's when that's when it, like that was that was like a big uh, a pretty cool moment actually oh, within that. You know what I mean? Like I just yanked this dog's tooth out of his head. Oh, shit. You know, and he he did. He didn't bite with purpose. He was just like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And I turned him around. I was like, find him. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. <laughs> so man. that was fucking pretty cool. What a fucking hard charger. <laughs> Holy shit! What a beast. Uh, um, so uh, when you wrap that deployment up, or, or when did you make the shift from from Benno to uh, to Leica? Oh man, so <clears throat> we'll we'll go on with uh, the two Sharana deployments, right? Sharana are probably our most memorable deployments, most most action packed deployments uh, that we did. Sharana is on the um, the far east side of Afghanistan, up where the mountains are, right? Big time mountains, and so uh, every night we were getting into a gunfight. I mean, it was. It was fucking wild. I never still had Benno at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd never seen so much action like this um, ever out of all my deployments. I mean, every night we were getting into gunfights on in in this mountainous area, and the reality was is that there was nobody else within the whole task force that were getting into this. You know, getting into the skirmishes that we were getting into, and once again, that you know the, the people that we were fighting uh, were foreign fighters, right? Like well trained, heavily armed, in uniform. Like, right? Like, they had, like, BDU uniforms on. They all wore Reebok high tops, so, you know, so which strange. was fucking wild. Like, yeah. there's pictures of us, like, wearing their Reebok high tops. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> that, like, that was, like, a that was a thing. Like, we would we would capture a dude, and they would be like, hey, look for Reebok high tops. And they would. Like, we yeah. would be SSing looking for, hey, we found them. And they'd be like, why do you have these shoes? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, everybody we killed had those shoes. It was fucking wild yeah. um did you ever get a uh, connect connection of the dots on that i'm not sure if reebok was sponsored <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by fucking reebok. i'm not Chet sure chechen fighter yeah yeah dude i'm not sure but i mean i you mean you can only imagine right yeah like you can only imagine like they're they're being funded yeah. they're being heavily funded and they're being heavily outfitted St a strange thing to spend money on but yeah yeah Man, especially that like yeah. white shoes yeah. anyway as tactical as you are you guys are gonna have white shoes yeah anywho um so yeah, we were getting into skirmishes. It seemed like every night I actually ended up, you know, and this is this is where I have multiple bites, right? This is where I'm going out at night <clears throat> and we would have a mass squirt X. And uh, that means that, you know, you have more than, than two people leaving the target compound. 
um, I was getting five bites in one night. Wow. You know what I mean? Five bites in one night. And, you know, the, the thing about it was is that if, if you got to the first person on that first bite and they, they were all together at one point in time, right, before they ran, and you got to that first person and you had to kill him because he had a weapon in his hand, um, everybody else was fair game wow. at that point in time. Yeah. Right, just because you don't, <clears throat> you can't take that risk. So, a lot of it was send Beno on bite, kill enemy while Beno's on bite on on that deployment. A lot of it was hey, kill the enemy and send Beno to confirm. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. And so, heavily, heavily utilized. I mean, you're just biting people. I all mean, the time. It, it it got to the point. Um, it got to the point, Mike, where like I prayed that we would go out on a target and nothing would happen because this dog had turned into a fucking monster. Like yeah. you would, like you could lay his kid out in front of him and he would step in it. Wow. Like the legs. And he would be like, you would put it on him and you would put it on him. You would get him on a helicopter, totally chill on the helicopter until 30 seconds. And then he was like, Rrr! you could just hear him. He wouldn't bark. Damn. He'd charge. Rrr! And like, I know for a fact when the dudes heard that dog war cry, they were like, no matter what situation it was, they were like, oh, yeah, we're like, like, like we got this, dude. And um, I don't know about anybody else who I worked with, but when that dog was with me, um, I felt safe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I felt very protected. I felt um, no matter what the situation was, felt yeah. super protected. And this is the deployments that my cousin's flying me in and out on as well. Yeah. And my, you know, Benno, at this point in time, Benno's so ingrained that my cousin would come by and knock on my door and be like, hey, can I take Benno into the, the, the talk and let him hang out with the guys? Like, no problem. People were coming by and taking my dog. Wow. You know what I mean? And just hanging out with him. What a transformation. And, and so I would tell people, I was like, I, this was always the rule. It was always, uh, if he fucking bites you, it's on you. Like, it's not on me. <laughs> yeah. All right? Like, if he eats your to-go plate, yeah. that's on you. If he <laughs> destroys something that he shouldn't, that's on you. Yeah. Just as long as they know that and that I don't yeah. get in trouble for it, like, I don't care. And like I said, at this point in time, I'd, I'd had enough of notoriety and people have respected who I am as a handler and also as, as somebody who's trains and with the success that I had on the target that um, if, if I said something about that dog, it, it was gospel. so, yeah. it was so, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, he's, he's you know, like seven or eight at this point, right? Yeah. He's probably, he's probably, yeah, he's probably seven years old at yeah. this point in time. And so that was the first Toronto trip. He was seven, and so, uh, but, it, you know, this could all kind of fall in line with, with both of them. Um, you know, there was, there was you know, i probably say my most memorable target, and there's actually video feed of it. And if you look through my, my Instagram, you can see it. Um, we land, we land on the, uh, we land on the X. My cousin, he puts the ramp down on top of this um, hilltop, and uh, another, another bird lands down just right below us. And um, as they fly away, they're they're bah! they're hammering it with the minis because dudes are flowing out of this this breach with AKs and everything else. Um, we kill six people outside of the compound. I mean, within seconds of landing, right? Like at this point in time, our platoon's a fucking well-oiled machine with, with everything that we had been getting into. And um, and you know, we go up. Pff, you know, they they we we hit the we hit the compound with um, with two hellfires. Right, and then they're like, they push the send dog. I feel comfortable sending the dog. Been in this situation a bunch, you know what I mean? More than likely, everything in there is dead. Dog's gonna get a lot of good dead prey bites. You know, chalk this up as a win. Um, and uh, as I go to prep, my good buddy who's got all those awards that I told you about, who's now a SRT surgeon, he's like, I can hear somebody in there, right? And he could hear somebody praying in there. And so they were like, hey, canine, send, send the dog. And I was like, yeah, I feel comfortable sending the dog. He was like, cool. Um, so I, you know, prep Benno, boom, 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 put the camera up, throw him through this fucking window. And, um, and he's running around in there. He engages a bunch of dead bodies that are laying all into the floor from the hellfire missile. And, uh, and I recall him back to me. Um, I talked to, I talked to my buddy real fast who, um, whose squad he's going, it's going in there. And I was, I told him, I'm like, Hey, let's flow in there with him and like get a foot, you know, maybe get a foothold and. He's like, Roger. So he asked command. Command's like, Roger, go ahead and get a foothold of that compound, um, inside that compound. We throw Benno through the that breach again, and we we go into the room with him, right? And so we go into the room with him. Um, there's, you know, let's say like we, we go into the big room, and you can see it. There's like a big room, and then to the left, 
you can see where there's a lot of effects of that Hellfire missile and that building's kind of dilapidated and worn down. Um, and you see Benno go in there, and when he goes in there, you can see a red laser, right? So you have the guys that are guiding him from room to room with a laser from inside the compound, which is really cool. And so, um, boom, they, they, they put the laser on a room that he hadn't hit yet. He goes in there, and when he goes in there, boom, he engages, he engages a military-aged male who's holding an AK, and he has a chest rack on. But the AK, the hand that he engages is the hand that the dude's holding the AK in. So, you know, you're looking at a fucking 75, 85 pound, maybe maybe a little bit more weight, fucking uh, malnourished fucking foreign fighter against a fucking... 85 pound fucking <laughs> ass eater. Yeah, a motherfucking uh, street dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the dude can't pick up the AK in order to shoot. And so, like, dude's, you know, cross that corner, bow, bow, kill the guy. And... um. This is this is where it hit me, right? Like they, they shot the dude, dude died, and like Benno erupts, starts dragging this fucking body around rooms, which was kind of his deal, kind of his jam. Just Everybody kind of got off on it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And everybody's loving up on him. And I, I always, I always ask trainers this, and, and people who are in dog sports, I'm always like, because I don't think a lot of people get to see it, and uh, it's something that you can't replicate in training. Um, we, we can all agree that dogs do not understand or have the concept of lead flying through the air, right? So that's something we can all agree on. Um, so when a dog is engaging and is engaging an enemy, a salty dog like that, and he's got multiple, multiple times where he's on a bite, he hears pow, pow, and now there's no more fight and the dude dies. Can we all agree that the dog knows the difference between life and death? Like he knows when something's alive and something's dead. I, I think that uh, in, in a case like that, you know, if you think about dogs' minds working like a calculator, mm -hmm. unlike our minds, right, is that they don't think in a language the way we do, mm -hmm. right? So there's not a, a rationalization. There's there's no reason the way that we would have an internal monologue and think through something. On the same token, that A plus B equals C scenario is that if that formula is correct enough times, just like sit mark reward is, is that enough times of that formula being correct and now it's it's a proven theory it's e equals mc squared yes and so you know to me that while they may not have the the grasp from a rationale standpoint of life and death being in association that way they absolutely understand that a plus b equals c contextual association and, and the mechanism with which life diminishes under those circumstances absolutely um and so it's always a thought process of mine that I would always be like, <clears throat> so does Benno think that we killed him or does Benno think he killed him? <laughs> I would bet he thinks he killed him. Yes. A hundred percent. I know. do too. Uh, that's, that's, what yeah. I, that's what I tell people all the time. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, to me, no different than uh, building uh, thresholds of, of the ability <laughs> to take stress and punishment and bite work and, and overlapping prey and defensive drive to, to build that threshold is that, you know, if I put pressure on a dog in a suit and he responds with pressure and, and, and as soon as he gives me what I want, I take everything away from from him pressure wise and, and let him, you know, basically treat me like a fucking gazelle in a lion's mouth. He's going to make that association with me going forward equals he goes down. And yep. so now he's going to go more and more forward every time. So if there's dozens or in this case, it sounds like maybe even hundreds of, of examples of him biting dead bodies and, and biting people and, and them being shot and killed while he's on them. There's zero doubt or question in my mind that he's making the association that he's fucking that person up that way. But, I think that's what made him so special. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, that's, that's remarkable, man. I mean, and there, there's so few dogs that have been through that many repetitions of, of that real world shit that, like you said, can't be replicated because I, I would argue with, with any canine behavioral expert that, the emotion that the human beings experience, just like his ability to understand this, the seriousness and the gravity and, and act accordingly, is that he knows the difference between you guys running through a house and training and doing it for real and the, the emotion and the adrenaline and the, and the pheromones that are exuding from, from the team mm -hmm. as well as the fighters in real-world scenarios where life and death is taking place. They're absolutely aware of that. You know? Cool, cool. Yeah, uh, that's but, cool. I just yeah. want to get your yeah. kind of get your take on that, man, because yeah. like – I think that's what made him yeah. exceptional. I think that's yeah. what made him one of a kind. So speaking of, uh, of morning routine and really throughout the day, you know, health and fitness and overall well-being is something that uh, I focus on as I get older. I get more and more kind of in tune with what works and what doesn't. Um, and I recently started working with uh, Ketone IQ, 
which is HVMN. Uh, dot com. Um, this product is uh, is a really really good way to start the day, uh, as well as basically just anytime you need uh, a boost from an energy standpoint. Uh, you're getting ready to do something physically demanding, mentally demanding. Uh, you know, before I record, I take a shot. First thing in the morning, I do before workouts uh, to recover after workouts. Um, you know, I, I take it multiple times a day. Um, and it's, I mean, there's no sugar, it's vegan, there's no caffeine, there's no salt, gluten, no artificial flavors or sweeteners. Uh, and it, it works from a, a ketogenic standpoint, uh, giving your brain and body the fuel uh, that it needs to do tasking um, uh, tasks. So, you know, it, it, it's a phenomenal product, uh, an amazing company. That's HVMN.com. And the code is mic drop, all one word, all caps for 20% off. Uh, I can't recommend this product enough for... Um, again, getting going in the morning, uh, pre-workout, post-workout, uh, you're tired in the afternoon. Uh, it's a, a super healthy way to feed your brain and your body from that, uh, kind of glycogen replenishment standpoint that, uh, that tends to crash a lot of people when they're using caffeine products or carb products, et cetera. So, uh, I love this stuff. Uh, I use it, uh, several times throughout the day, uh, and I encourage you guys to, to check it out as well. It's, uh, hvmn.com. And that code is mic drop for 20% off all caps, all one word for sure. You know, he's, he sounds like, you know, one of the most remarkable dogs I've, I've heard of. And I've been very, very, uh, fortunate to, to hear a lot of fucking, you know, amazing stories, similar, uh, similarly. So, um, man, what a fucking dog. How, I mean, how, how did your career with him ultimately end? Oh man, him dying. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah unfortunately, um, you know, we, that, that was my second Toronto. So, <clears throat> During that first Sharana deployment, um, I lost two of my really good buddies, yeah. right? Um, I went home to go see my son get born, right? Now my son's getting born, right? So, like, you know, you look at the, the jump start, right? Old lady's mad at me. She's pregnant. Now my son's getting born. Like, this is, like, this is our life. You yeah. know, it's nonstop. You know, um, it's, it's training cycle deploy, training cycle deploy, training cycle deploy. And, like, we love deploying because we got a break. Yeah. We got a break from fucking the reality of, yeah. of this shit. Bullshit you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, fuck. Yeah. Like, like, it's simple here. I eat, I lift, yeah. I, I fucking hunt. You, yeah, know? you, have, you have one focus. Yeah. yeah. And so I go back to go see my son get born um, on this Sharana trip. Uh, a CAG handler covers down on me because we were all kind of co-located in Sharana. Um, and, uh, and so I find out that my good buddy, um, Jeremy Katzenberg, gets killed, gets shot through and through. Um kind of like, you know, and it, dead at night, get shot through and through, killed instantly before he hits the ground. Um, and uh, and he just had a kid get born, you know? And so um, that, that devastated me. It devastated me, me being home. Yeah. Felt super guilty being home. And, uh, you know. Would you have been with him otherwise? I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't okay. have been on that target. Yeah. I would have been in country yeah. at least, but I wouldn't have been on target. So um, I, that, that was with 3rd Platoon, yeah. right? This is a guy I grew up with as private. And so um, instantly when that happened, like, like son was born, it was like block checked. Cool. And before like my maternity leave or whatever, my leave for my son could be over with, I'm already prepping a flight back. You know what I mean? I'm trying to get back as soon as possible. Um, and so I'm racing back, trying to get back as soon as possible. Um, one, because I want to get back out there. And two, I don't want... Um, like the that CAG handler, I don't want him getting hurt on my target, mm -hmm. right? Like that's not meant for anybody. That's meant. So for he's me. handling Benno at this. Point. No, 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 no. He's handling his own dog. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And his so, his his dog ended up passing. Benno came home with me. Okay. Benno didn't stay in country. Benno, it was it was already very very proven that if I go anywhere, Benno has to come yeah. with me. Right. I'm the only person that he respects. I'm the yeah. only person that can handle him. Um, and so <clears throat> even even when he had surgeries and medical care and stuff like that, the dog actually kept, would come home to me. Wow. Home, come home with me yeah. right and when he would when he was having issues and whatnot um and had like dental surgery and stuff like that so there was a many times he, he actually slept at my house in savannah georgia um so there was a very clear understanding that that dog was was going everywhere with me yeah. no matter what and so i'm scheduling everything and you know benno's living at my house with a, with a brand new child he doesn't care you know yeah. what i mean he has he doesn't care there's no harm no foul done there um, and so we go, you know, I'm making arrangements to get back to Sharana. I make those arrangements, get back to Sharana. Um, and so I'm, I'm back at it. And so I remember I showed up and uh, I hit up the hit up the guy who backfilled me. And I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know I'm here. And he was like, 
he, he was like trying to make deals with me. He was like, he was like, do you, do you need another night to get ready? Because he was like, I, I can go back out if you want. Because my platoon was using the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah, they were using him. It. Yeah, yeah, and he was like, he was loving the action that that he yeah. was getting. Because here's the thing: when Big Brother doesn't want to go do something, they send Little Brother to go do it, yeah. right? And we're Little Brother. Yeah, and so like they would send us all these like Little Brother targets, and we would go out there and slay. Yeah. And then they were like. What the fuck? Yeah, they were like, what the <laughs> fuck, man? They're not supposed to get that. Like, what, what are they doing, you know? Yeah. And so there was actually like a, not not really with me and that dude, but on my second deployment with me and the uh, the other two, um, the other two uh, CAG handlers, there was uh, there was some uh, competition yeah. there. And so, and I, and, I, and I got off on it. Yeah. You know, I like I said, I'm super competitive. Yeah. And um, anyway, he, um, he ended up like, you know, running a bunch of missions, having a bunch of success for me. I showed up. He was like, "You sure you don't need a few more days?" And I'm like, "No, man, I'm good. I'm 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 good to go." And he was like, "Okay, well, if you need a break, let me know." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I'll let you know." Yeah. And so I literally I, I got right back on there and got two bites in one night that wow. night. You know what I mean? I mean, we, like, that's how it was. Yeah. I mean, it was fucking wild, and it was so wild. In fact, that um, we would land on targets, and like I said, I would pray that there would be no action. That I would actually wait until the compound was uh, clear and secure, and then I would go walk out to the field. And amp Benno up like they were somebody out in the yeah. field, and turn the camera on and just cut them loose. Oh, shit. I'd say go find them, and I'd be like, "Wear yourself out. Yeah. Wear your fucking self out, dude." Like, and I would just watch him from a distance. Yeah. And one of my buddies was like, "What if he finds somebody out there?" And I go, "What if? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? At this boy, fuck it. What if? <laughs> more, more likely, he's fucking bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what if? Yeah. So, uh, so, and I would get him back, and he'd be like, fucking." worn out and fucking all that dopamine dumped in his brain yeah. and everything else and he would be good to go um funny story probably one of the funniest stories i have is uh, uh about him is that we so we we hit the we hit this target dry hole nothing cool happens i'm doing my explosive detection search and stuff and uh i see benno eats a fucking massive ball of black tar heroin holy fuck eats it and i'm like like you, like are you gonna fucking die? So I find the medics. I'm like, hey, is he gonna fucking die? Yeah. Like, I, like, do we need to bomb? Like, what, like, what do we got to do here? And they're like, um, hey, we'll just monitor him. You know what I mean? No like, we'll, shit. You know, we uh, like we'll do. And, so it, anyway, it's it was funny because you talk about the most obedient dog on target. That dog was so obedient. And that's, yeah. This is not an obedient dog. Yeah. He was super chill, super yeah. obedient. He was high <laughs> as fuck. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like swaying and shit. Yeah. Like. You know, and, you know, and as you know, like dogs metabolize shit a lot faster. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, still they, though. Yeah. 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 We that's s- a dice roll, man. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't epicac or fucking peroxide them. And-, and that's something that we didn't, we weren't carrying on us. Yeah. It wasn't until after that I was carrying, um, it was the, the CAG handler when I came back. I told him about it and he gave me, um, what do you, Everclear? Hmm. He gave me Everclear and he was like, you don't drink this. Yeah. This is for your dog. And yeah. if your dog gets into shit, you can, yeah. Give him Everclear and then he'll vomit it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's when I started carrying Everclear and, and wet dog food with me on target yeah. in case he got into it. Then he could eat that wet dog food soaked in Everclear and then vomit yeah. it up. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's just super chill, high calm dog, fuck. high as fuck on target, man. Like, thank God we didn't have to use him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just like going and hanging out with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just like chill. He was like, yeah, I'm on target. I'm, I'm chill. I'm laying out. Dude, that's like, crazy. You know, it's cool. And so. Wow. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, so the, the, the next deployment, and I, I, I did, I had a lot of success with him, um, finding explosives and, and really more or less like explosive material, yeah. right? Whether it be HME, whether it be, um, you know, it's not like massive finds, like, right? We weren't finding like hundreds of pounds of it, but we were finding enough of it that could, it could fuck you up. Yeah, it could fuck you up and kill you and stuff like that. I think probably the greatest find we ever had was, um, blasting caps behind a picture. Really? It was just one blasting cap. Wow. And it was behind a fucking a picture. Wow. You know what I mean? And he, like he hit it and sat and I was like, and you, you know, the reason why I say that's the best because it's not a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not, there's not Plus, a whole I lot. Plus, I mean, elevated find. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like there's, there's not a lot going on there. Yeah. So I was like, fuck yeah. There was another time where this was our, okay, so it go to the last deployment, right? Like we're, we're all very in tune machine. It's already been put in place that, um, this is Benno's last deployment. I'm I'm going to go be I'm re-enlisting again for my third time, and I'm going to go be a trainer um, out at regiment and and run this help help run the schoolhouse. And so it was already in tune and ingrained that like, hey, Benno Benno can't go to a police department. Yeah, he's eight. He can't go to a police department. They're he's going to get fired on yeah. site, and he can't just go home with anybody. 
So we had made it really clear that uh, he was going to go home with me or we're going to work out whatever drug deals we had to work out to make sure that happened. Um, So, you know, in in my eyes, I'm kind of like, hey, buddy, this is our last last let's go around. This is our last show. And so um, we go out and we're we're doing the the last deployment um, thing. And was it as busy as the previous? It was the same same area. um, And it was I would say, yeah, I would say it was I wouldn't say as busy as the 11 deployment. Um, it was definitely busy and it was busy. Um, and, and I'll, yeah, it definitely wasn't as busy as the 11 deployment. Going back to the 11 deployment, we ran a mission called Marauder Rapids. Um, it's actually kind of mentioned in a book called Vi- uh, Violence of Action, um, where they mention it a little bit. We are, uh, we do a remain over day and this is a company size hit, right? Um, Unfortunately, um, a, a CAG team leader lost his life in the daylight um, on that mission, um, you know, providing cover fire and protecting, um, not only protecting us, but also protecting his, his squadron as well. Um, and, uh, and that was a heavy blow to them and a heavy blow to us. Um, and this was, you know, they were doing airdrops for equipment and supplies on us, um, but we were probably where Roberts Ridge was at. And they say it was like a five mile straight line distance from where Robert Ridge took place. at. And so like we were in the, we were in these mountains and, uh, and we were fighting. I want to say they used high Mars to send off, to, to send these things off. And like, it's it's so we we were watching these people, right. For like, you remember the mission I told you where Benno got the guy with the weapon in his hands, Mm -hmm. right? This was the following mission. So this mission led to this next one. And so, we follow this vehicle that's been that came to that place uh, and dropped off those weapons to those foreign fighters, and then this vehicle was going out in the middle of nowhere, right? Goes goes meets these dudes on this mountainside, gives them weapons, and we follow it. We follow these dudes that now have these weapons all the way to this massive mouth of this cave. When I say mouth of this cave, I'm telling you, it was a semi wide. That's how oh, wide wow. this cave was. Um, we watched it for two days. Dudes would come out. They would do fucking test fires. They would clean their weapons. They, you know, we had no idea how many people were in that cave, how deep that cave was or anything, but there was just lots of movement in and out of that cave all day. Um, we asked to go ahead and drop bunker busters on it. Uh, we were told no, that there could be civilians in there. And we were like, what the fuck? Like, even us as like war, like war fighters, we're like, what the fuck? There is not a goddamn civilian in there. What are we doing? Yeah. Um, so they said, no, like we're gonna, we're gonna push and, and assault it. Um, you know, or push to get eyes on it. And so they ended up sending, um, a, uh, I want to say a CAG, CAG squadron um, in there with us attached as being like the, you know, the muscle, Black you know what gun. I mean? The, the, the dudes with the machine guns. And um, and I wasn't there at that time. I was watching this from ISR, right? They, this was just the first element that went in. They went in and kicked over a hornet's nest. Instantly, um, our men were over overran by gun, gunfire, right? And like now, now they're in a situation where, um, they're doing a lot of falling back. They're trying to gain ground. They're, they're losing ground as well. And um, <clears throat> this is another uh, objective that was declared hostile right off the rip. So um, casualty happens. <clears throat> the one one platoon gets infilled, inserted in there. <clears throat> they pick up the they pick up the squadron, bring them home, and then they insert us in there as a whole whole platoon unit, actually two platoons they insert in there on top of this mountainside. Before you continue, I mean, what at, at that point, if they, they realize that's the deal, why not drop shit at that point? Why not pull back and just fucking level it? I don't know. That's, that like, seems fucking crazy to me. It was nuts. I mean, just stupid. It was nuts. Yeah. And it was, it was, uh, like just unnecessary. It was beyond, it was beyond like really when you look at it in hindsight, like I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's more <clears throat> commanders and people like that that can give you the, the, the who, what, when, where's, and why's of it. Um, but, you know, when you think about it like that, like you're absolutely right. They could have sent, you know, they should have started dropping bunker busters on it a long yeah. time ago. So <clears throat> we, you know, our, our job at that point in time was to set up a position. We gain the high ground up on top of this um, mountaintop. And now this is a whole company size Ranger element. Um, CAG's now back at home. And, uh, and so you have a whole company size Ranger element out there, BCO. And um, we are like, literally like there's dudes, it's broad daylight and there will be, there would be the enemy that would come out and start shooting the AK at us from down this mountain in broad daylight. And it would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like we were just, we were killing them all day. 
um, there'd be dudes standing eye level with Apache helicopters shooting RPGs at them. You know, because that's how high we were in elevation. Oh. I mean, we were fucking high. There was guys getting altitude sickness and puking. Um, I mean, we were we were up there, right? And uh, so we, um, you know, finally the nighttime hits. I'm the only guy out there now with a dog, right? The other dogs had came out, and it's just me and Benno, and we're out there with the dog and whatnot. And pretty much now I get attached to third platoon, which I didn't have a problem with. But um, they wanted us to clear the valley of the dead bodies, Right, so now they want us to clear the dead bodies and gather SSE. This is after they've been shooting HIMARS missiles into this fucking mountain all day. They actually shut down all operations in Afghanistan for this mission, right? And they lasted well over 24 hours. They had to shut down all operations and all assets got shifted to us. Um, rumor has it is that they even had a B-2 bomber click in on station from Qatar wow. that was prepped and ready to fucking come to us with however many 500 pounders we needed at that point in time. Um, and so my job and my task was now to, anyway, was to clear the valley using Benno up in front of us as a, uh, <laughs> really as, as, a, as a fucking, a magnet for bullets, because that's what he would have been. And um, thank God the, the platoon sergeant that uh, was in charge of it, <clears throat> you know, he took his sweet ass time. Like he, you could you could tell like nighttime hit and like you hear cattle bells going off and they're close and you know they're talking that's like them talking the icom chatter they're talking um flares are going up and it's like lighting up the thing and they're not our flares you know what i mean and so you don't know how many fucking enemy are really there um and so you know all you're doing is just dropping air so at that point in time it's just one of those things where you're just getting the highest elevation and dropping air so you know air air power and air fire and all that other shit on um on targets below. Um, and so anyway, they wanted us to start to clear the valley using Benno um, and the platoon behind me. And, uh, and I remember, man, I remember like it was yesterday. I looked at, I looked at one of my buddies, I looked up at him and I said, Hey man, f this, this is it. Like this is, this is where the, this is where, this is where we die, man. Like this is it, you know? And I, I said that with like full, full confidence. I was going to go out and do my job, but that's, I was prepared. You know what I mean? And, I'm pretty sure my buddy was prepared as well. Um, you know, and every, there was people that were so battle exhausted that we were, I was actually throwing rocks at the medic who was like bobbing for dicks, what we call it. He was <laughs> passing out on target. Like there's explosions going on and this cat's falling asleep. Yeah. He's exhausted. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so we're pushing down and making our way down to through this valley um, to the dead bodies and uh, platoon sergeant starts, you know, he's really dragging his feet. Finally, whoever was in charge of command finally had the bright idea and said, okay, fuck this, we're going home. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So we didn't, we didn't have to go down into that valley. We didn't have to touch that beast. Yeah. Um, you know, is the SSC worth it? Absolutely not. Yeah. And so they ended up picking us up, and, um, and we went back home. Um, but the casualty markers out there, I want to say was well over 200, 236 uh, wow. foreign fighters dead, and that's what they were reporting. The enemy was reporting. That's not what we were reporting. That's what they reported yeah. um, with a lot more missing. Yeah. You know, and so when you're slamming that many missiles and high Mars into that mountain, I'm sure there's a lot of people that disintegrated. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was probably, probably one of the most significant missions that I'd ever been on that I really didn't do anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? But so I can say that I was there, yeah. you know. Um, but it was fucking wild, man. Yeah. Wild. I mean, it, we were infilling and they had declared the area hostile. And as we're infilling, like, 160th is lighting up the mountain. And you're like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Like, this is this is some real fucking Call of Duty shit right, <laughs> right now going on. Right? Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this this is this is it. Um, so, and you, like I said, you can kind of read it in that um, uh, Violence of Action book, right? Ranger book uh, written by a ranger. Um, and it's just stories of rangers. And I want to say it's the very last very last story, but uh, I can say I was there. Yeah. You know, I didn't do a lot, wow, but man. I was, I was there. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, kind of neat on that. So now we'll go to my last deployment. Last deployment. It seems like we were lots of APU. We were letting APU kind of take a little bit more reins with some things. Um, you know, we were still using Benno, um, for isolation and containment, um, when dudes squirted and, and stuff like that. Um, and still had, had a lot of success, um, you know, multiple bites on, on multiple targets, um, you know, bites, bites in which the, the, the enemy died while, while he was on the bite. Do you have um, any idea how many bites he had in his career? 
over 40, over yeah. 40, I want to say 43, yeah. 43 apprehensions, live apprehensions, yeah. um, 10 IED material making um, fines, six combat ropes. Wow. So I've, I roped with him. Uh, I roped with, out of those six times, I roped with him four times wow, on target. And so, um, and uh, I, that's, it's fucking, that's nerve wracking all in itself. Yeah. You know, to have a fucking 85 pound yeah. dog strapped to your hips and you're like fucking woo yeah. at night. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, Hey, let me trust this fucking piece of equipment. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So it was, um, yeah, last, the, the, the last show. And so um, I'm trying to make sure I get everything in, in order here on it. Uh, bottom line, it just, you know, t- two of my really close friends had died the deployment afterwards. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I known their families, uh, you know, I'd grown up with them. And so that was like a really hard, hard hit on me. Um, I was reenlisting, I was reenlisting to take a trainer's position. Um, I really, I needed a break, you know what I mean? I needed a break from it. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that was me. Hey, this is my last deployment. I'll reenlist. I'll go take my break. You know what I mean? I'll go to the training house and take my break. So <clears throat> doing this with, with the expectation that I'll, I'll be having Benno because he's going to retire. And so, uh, running the last, running the last deployments, um, a lot of success on target. Uh, same deal. We're still utilizing him. Red laser, you know, using flashbangs to kind of get his attention and giving him a distance and direction with lasers, stuff like that. Um, dog's still working um, like a well-oiled machine, and um, and so you know I'll go I'll go to the mission in which you know he was he was killed on, um, <clears throat> you know it was it was a target in which you know it was hot outside. So anytime it's hot outside, people sleep outside, and so when I when I look at a target, that's what I look at. I don't really pay too much attention of who we're going after. That's up to other people to figure out. On me, I'm looking at the at what I what I have to attack if somebody runs, and so um, I look and I'm like, okay, it's hot outside. These people are sleeping outside. More than likely, we're going to land, and somebody's going to run. And if one person runs, it might promote them all to run, right? Like there's very seldomly does one person run and the other the other two or three people not fucking follow him or go in a different direction, right? It, they they almost promote it, you know, um, when they do that. So. It was, uh, we landed mass squirt X, um, four, four people ran in fucking all different directions. Um, we land textbook like, Hey, where's the guy? There's the guy. Cool deal. Shine the red laser, red laser on the guy. Send the dog dog runs up the the hillside and it bites him, drags the dude back down to me. Um, pull him off the bite strong. All right, the, I'm looking for sparkles, right, for the AC-130. I check out the battle space. Boom, I see another sparkle. I'm like, cool, headed to that sparkle now. Um, I'm moving to that sparkle. Get another bite. Pff, boom, Benno's on bite. Textbook, pull him off bite. Then I, um, and now, now I'm like, hey, where's, where's the next sparkle at? Boom, there's the next sparkle. There's another squad that's down there putting up containment. And this guy's far away, right? So this, this squad has already reached out there. They're already sitting in the containment there. They're just waiting on me to execute. <clears throat> I'm moving as fast as I can um, down this hillside and to where this, this wadi's at. And I get there. There's a sparkle. This, you know, it's not anything that I've never seen before, anything out of, the, out, of the, out of the ordinary, nothing that really sparked my attention or made me think that, oh, you know, like this, this is going to be something that's high threat. You know, I mean, obviously it is a threat, but. I think at this point in time normal. we perceive we we perceive threats differently at this yeah. point in time. So, um, I I see the the sparkle it's shining on them. Um, I can't see the guy. It's thick vegetation, so I amp up Benno. Yeah, buddy. You know, send him. I I find out where his last point where he went in at right because the laser is getting broken up. And so I ask uh, the guy talking to the bird. I said, Hey, do, does do you mind having <clears throat> ISR sparkle where the guy went in at? right? Because now that's my scent pad. Mm-hmm. And so he sparkles. I say, cool. Psh, I down Benno on the scent pad. You, I can already see he's hitting that odor really hard. I, fi- I send him, find him. Psh, he goes through the woods. Like it was really pretty to see too, because, and he did this a lot. He almost followed the dude's footsteps to the T and you can tell when they do that, right? Yeah. They're almost like walking with them, mm-hmm. you know? And so he follows the dude's footsteps to a T. Boom. He gets on bite. He gets on bite. And then we start moving in to close the gap. Um, we move in to close the gap. We get probably about, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a lot of brush and shit that we have to get through in order to get to him. And so instantly, as I start getting closer, the first thing that I notice is this guy isn't screaming, 
right? Most of the time, these dudes are like, scared out of their lives and shit. He's not screaming. And then what I'm seeing picture-wise is that he's actually starting to, he's actually, it's almost like he's wrestling with the dog, right? And Benno's on bite, but it's almost as if he's wrestling with the dog. Um, as, I, as I come up through the brush and I'm trying to get through there very quickly, I turn on my LA-5 that has my, my aimer and my floodlight on it and everything else. And as I pull up, you can see the guy, he's got a pistol in his hand. And as he has his pistol, and like, this is all within seconds. You know what I mean? Pistol, boom, boom. You know, and then all of a sudden we, we engage, we engage that guy and kill him. Um, I run up, I instantly uh, run up to his body. Um, and I'm like, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. And I'm saying it out loud. Um, and I'm just, I'm trying to go through and I'm trying to see if we got any kind of vitals on him or anything like that. And, uh, and he's clearly dead. He's clearly gone. You know what I mean? And so, um, I check his head. He's got two gunshot wounds to the head that actually exited his neck. And, um, and so I pick, I pick up his body and, uh, and my buddies are trying to help me. And I'm just like, I tell him, I'm like, get the fuck away from me. You know what I mean? Get away from me. And so I get his, grab his body and I'm walking and I, uh, I walk to the other side of the wadi and I lay him down and, uh, and I crack a red Kim on him. And uh, I just ask one of my buddies, I'm like, hey, will you just hang out here with him? Because we got another dude to get, yeah. right? And that dude who just killed my dog just signed his own death wish to, for his buddy because he decided to pull a weapon. Not because he killed my dog, right? But let me make that tactfully. Not because he killed my dog, but because he fucking had a weapon and he used it, right? So now he just, you know, essentially everybody who ran now is now fair game or who hasn't been caught, and that one guy hadn't been caught. So <clears throat> the fourth guy's out there, and we go hunt him down, and, um, and I take the pleasure of neutralizing him off this planet. Um, I, get, I get Benno, I get back to Benno, and uh, I walk him all the way back up to the target compound, which is probably like four or 500 meters away uphill, and uh, like just really just emotionally drained. I remember we got to... The first guy Benno had bit, and I walked up there, and I slapped the shit out of him. I fucking slapped the shit out of him, and then I fucking just went and sat down and was real quiet for the rest, rest of the night. Um, by all means, I mean, you know, my birthday of all days. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was my fucking birthday. And so, you know, and it was funny because, like, as we were infilling, they were like, hey, we got squirters, and I, being a jackass, I come over the radio. I was like, happy birthday to me. You know what I mean? Like, finally, man, finally we're getting some action, you know? And so, uh, yeah, he got shot, and uh, and he died. And so that fucking, that really was a hard kick in the nuts for me. Um, and so we get him back. We get him back to the target. Not to, yeah, we get him back. I get, get him back to the target. We, everything, I, I slapped the shit out of one of the de detainees that he bit. And then, um, and then we send in a helicopter. A helicopter picks us up. Uh, we go back home. Um, there's a Hilux truck there for me and I load his body into the Hilux truck. I'm still not really saying a whole lot to anybody. You know what I mean? Like every, everybody knows where my head's at. Um, and I think everybody's just being really cautious and careful, um, about how they approach me and stuff like that. And so, uh, we get him back and the platoon sergeant, he comes to me and he's a really good stand up man, right? Like there, there's not like when you get platoon sergeants like that, that have been with you for like three deployments, right? And he was with us for three deployments. Um, and he's just that kind of man, like honorable man, like really good dude. Um, just for the boys, uh, he came to me and he he kind of helped things out a little bit. And he was like, what, like, what do you need me to do? You know what I mean? He was the first person to come talk to me. He was like, what do you need me to do? You know, what can I do for you? Um, you know, how do we make this, e how do we make this better? How do we make this easier for you? And I remember I looked at him and I said, you know what sucks, uh, what sucks, Sergeant, is, is that we can't, we, we can't just go to the armory and get another one, yeah. right? Like he's not, like this, this is something we can't replicate. You know, this is, this is, this is it. This is him. It's, it's done. And so <clears throat> I asked him for bolt cutters and he got me some bolt cutters and I cut his, cut his choke chain off of him, unzipped him, de-kit him, um, called up to my people and uh, got him on. Got him on a uh, got, got him on a C-130 that was headed to Kandahar because that's where our spare dogs were at. Um, as I'm out there loading him up onto the helicopter, not the helicopter, the C-130. Oh, I won't, 
I don't want to fast forward through this. Um, so I go and I pick up his body from the morgue. Now his body's at the morgue. Probably four or five hours have elapsed. I'm still kind of in shock. I haven't really processed anything. Definitely not healthily. Um, and so I go to the morgue to go get his body to load it up onto a C-130. To, it's getting flown out to Kandahar um, where I'm going to leave, leave him there with the vets and they're going to get him, um, they're going to turn him into ash, right? And they're going to, you know, turn him into ash and cremate him. And uh, as the C-130 lands, it's a detainee C-130, right? And so Benno's draping an American flag on a gurney. The sergeant in charge comes out. He's like, hey, I want to let you know, like, because it, because it's remains, it's an it's a soldier. He goes, I want to let you know you can you can kick all of us off this flight right now and fl- fly this to Kandahar yourself. And I looked at him and I was like, you know, what? I'm I just trying to be funny. I was like, I'm not going to do that to you. You know what I mean? Like, you got a job to do. I'm not going to do that to you. And I was like, nine times out of ten, this dog has bitten one fucking one of their family members <laughs> or all of their fucking family members at one point in time. Yeah. And I was like, so it's it, it would be it would be my honor to fly back. Yeah. with him fucking in these savages yeah. you know what i mean and he was like all right cool the the regular morgue did a full-blown ramp side kind of ceremony for benno right yeah. and so they did a ramp side ceremony they put a toe tag on him that said uh staff sergeant benno hero and um i just remember in my head i was like what the fuck like they don't have you know what i mean they have no connection with this dog whatsoever you know what I mean? They don't know him. They've never petted him. They've never fed him. They've never, no, nothing. Yeah. Um, but here they are honoring him. And, uh, and that was big for me. And so we get him on the C-130. We get him loaded up. And we, uh, and we get him to Kandahar. I come by, drop him off, um, drop him up at the vet clinic. They're, they're, they don't know Benno either. And they're like, they're visibly sad and they're starting to cry. And that's making me really angry. Right, because it's like, like at this point in time, y'all need to start, like y'all don't even know me. Yeah. Right. Like, and may, maybe that's just where my head was at. I needed to be angry at something. Yeah. But I'm like looking at these some of these vets that don't know them, and I'm like looking looking at them getting angry and watching them cry. Like, yeah. like just fucking do your job, goddamn it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm fucking angry right now. If that, any of that makes sense, you know, like no, like I, you have no connection to this. Like, what the yeah. fuck are you crying for? Well, I think um, it, it, you know, I mean, I obviously wasn't there, uh, but, you know, to me, it, it it stands to reason or, or you know, my first kind of reaction to that would be that um, you knew you had to keep it together and, and it's easier to keep it together when you're pissed off than it yeah. is if you're emotional about something. You oh, know? Yeah. And, and the amount of time that you had wrapped into that dog, the experiences, the amount of tangible lives that, that he saved and, and the bond that you guys had, mm-hmm. I think you just you know, we're in a position where like the one dude slapped you and told you to get to get, like yeah. you just weren't going to allow yourself to, to lose it yet. No. Yeah. And, and, and I think anger is, is the way to, to deflect that, you know, but right. you're probably right. I'm not you're a psychologist. Probably, you're probably right. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be my therapist? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're on the couch already. Yeah. yeah. So Let's grab some tissues. Yeah. That, maybe some that was, baby wipes. <laughs> yeah. So no man. Um, but I do, I do. I think you're right about that. I was, I was rage, rageful. Yeah. And so, I show up and I, you know, I go to my head trainer and he shows me the dogs that, that are kind of there that I have my pickings from. And one dog's named Rico. He's got multiple deployments, never done anything that's very, like, very cool, right? There's a reason why he's done multiple deployments and he's a spare, yeah. right? Like, he's, he's not that good. Another dog named Lucky, who's, we talked about him. He's like a black Malinois that's, by all means, he, do, he doesn't belong there. He's a PTSD therapy dog. He belongs in a nursing home. Um, or a hospice house, um, helping those people out. And that's my honest take on that dog. Yeah. Just super sweet dog. Um, just not a warrior. And then, uh, and then I had Leica. And so, you know, I had known Leica because Leica was the next, right next to Benno's kennel um, back, back in America. Um, she was one years old, or she had just turned one. I remember wow. she was super young. Um, and we were taking her, I want to say she came from Shallow Creek. Yeah, I want to say she came from Shallow Creek, but we were taking from, they were taking her, our head trainer was, and he was pretty much building her, mm-hmm. right? Kind of building her out as a young dog. Um, <clears throat> he told me, he was like, hey, Mac, I, he was like, you know, if, if you know, if, if you want to take her, you can take her. He was like, I know you're going to give her a lot of experience. She's going to get exposed to a lot of things. And he was like, if she has issues, you're going to be able to help take her to that next level. 
And, uh, and I looked at her and I kind of brought her out and she just had these eyes, right? Just very intense eyes. And like anything you asked her to go do, she did it very, very intensely. And, um, and by looking at her, I looked at her and I was like, I looked at the rest of the dogs and I'm like, you won't save my life. You won't save my life. I know that to be sure. You might, you might save my life. Like just by the way you look and like you haven't been tested. Like I want you. I want you like, let's try you out. Yeah. And so with all the action that we were getting out there, I, th that's what I needed. I needed something that was going to save my life, not something that was a mascot, yeah. right? By all means, um, the, the mascot had earned his place as a mascot and now he's no longer with us, mm -hmm. right? Like now we need something that's going to operate instantly. I tell you, to, to take a one-year-old dog with essentially zero experience with you as a handler and, and put it into that environment, like th that's about as thrown to the lion's den as, as exists. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, there was, let me tell you, man, there was a lot of uh, on-target training. No for shit. For like fucking very simple shit. And, um, you That's know. That's incredible. And, and I was <clears throat> I was down to take it, and I was down to do the task. One, it kept me super busy when I needed to be busy. Yeah. Right? I needed, I just, I yeah, needed my mind to be somewhere else. I needed to be super busy with, uh, with her. But, um, yeah, like we, you know, I, I get back. I get back from Kandahar. You know, Benno's ashes and remains are not ready yet. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the guy flying in, um, the next night's going to bring him to me. And so I'm like, cool. Uh, so I go back with Leica. Um, I make sure my mags are good. I make sure everything's good to go. And, uh, and sure as shit, I let the platoon sergeant know, hey, we're good to go. Right. And um, is he like, are you fucking sure? Yeah. <laughs> did, he, did he ask you that? I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure at some point yeah. I was like, hey, are you good? Like, yeah. we have somebody to cover down. And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. Yeah. Like, let's go. And, uh, and so they're like, okay, Roger. That, like I said, at this point in time, like, you've you're eight deployments yeah. you're eight deployments deep like at this point in time you've gained a lot of respect yeah and like you're you know your your, your word you. and the things you say like pe people are listening to you did i did it hindsight did i really need to be out there probably not i probably could have took like another week break or something like that but once again i have issues with and i always have had issues with somebody backfilling me and covering yeah. me on my target and i would never be able to live with myself if they got killed on my target yeah. Like as a handler, right? As a handler. Yeah. Like, I, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I can understand that. I, I mean, I, I actually think that under those circumstances, you, you did uh, the, the best thing for you, not the healthiest thing. Uh -oh. But, you know, to me, it, it's you're kind of forced uh, down one of two roads, which is either deal with it and deal with it in its entirety, you know, and, and completely heal from it or enough to where you can you can start again in a healthy fashion or you do exactly what you did and because a, a week i don't think i think that would have been worse yeah on, honestly than just getting right the fuck back into it because yeah. to me i i see that you know over the years of, of having been out for a little while now and having interviewed a lot of just phenomenal uh warriors over the years and, and seeing you know kind of patterns and uh in similar situations that they go through is that um you can you kind of need to be in a position where you can do the full, full recovery and, and give it um, everything that it needs to, uh, you know, to actually take place, you know, because yeah. if you don't, uh, it's just going to make things worse. And yeah. so you either just keep, keep fucking rolling with it or you, you take the full, the full knee and, and do what you need to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can understand that a hundred percent, but. And uh, so, yeah, I came, came, got her, got suited up, went out, right. We need a, in my head, I'm like, all right, this is real world training, mm -hmm. and we got to figure out what she can and what she can't do on the fly. Yeah, and so you know, first mission out the gate, um, we have Apache kill two men on top of a mountaintop, and uh, and so you know, let's see how she is without laser. You know what I mean? We send her on top of those two dead bodies. We're at pretty much at the bottom. We send her out there. She catches odor. She goes up there. She engages dead bodies. Cool. Block checked. Right? Like, that's how I'm looking at it. Cool, block checked. She'll engage dead bodies. Um, I'm doing a little bit of play, kind of jazzing her up, getting her deeper on the bike, getting her comfortable um, using those cadavers as a training opportunity. Um, <clears throat> same mission. We go back down. Uh, it's like in this valley. There's like this little out hut. And I'm, you know, in my, it needs to be cleared. And it's not a very big room, right? That's not like multi-room room. It's just like a, like a small it's like a large outhouse, if yeah. you will. And so, you know, open up door, send the dog. She won't go in. Breaks, 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 breaks. 
I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, how do we get her in? So I show her the tennis ball. She gets really jazzed up for that. I throw it in the room. Oh, she runs in there after the tennis ball. Okay, cool. Potential, right? Yeah. We need she needs she needs work on clearing dark dark rooms, dark spaces, more success. She needs more success on entering dark rooms and getting bites. That's what we need to work on. And so, in, in my head, I'm making these mental notes. Um, <clears throat> you know, detection wise, how is she with detection? Detection good. Uh, check. If I put a muzzle on her and I walk her past detainees, can I spin her up, right? Well, can she look at them and can I can I spin her up when she walks past detainees? Yes, I can. And I so I went through all these checklists with her while I had her out on my first target. Um, I come back, right? We do an AAR. I let the boys know. I'm like, hey, guys, look. Like, obviously, we're, we're never going to get Benno back. And I was like, but we have a really good dog here, but I need y'all's help, right? And so... They understood the seriousness of it because they had seen so much success come with that dog, right, mm -hmm. Benno, that they all came together as a platoon and they would work. Like we had weather roll in, thank God, <clears throat> and they all came in and they worked with me for like three or four nights straight. And we were doing nothing but like muzzle fighting inside dark rooms, switching the decoy, like her clearing rooms, all this fucking great shit that we were doing. Um, transitioning to do detection, uh, you know, doing hidden sleep bites on her. Like we were throwing the gauntlet at her and, um, and really it was hat, hats off to that platoon for, for really like digging in and, 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 and knowing that that's what, that's what needed to be done. Cause by all means, nobody wants to fucking train dogs. You know what I mean? On a weather call days, everybody wants yeah. to play video games and go fucking, you know, go to their Jack shack and do whatever <laughs> it is they're going to do. Nobody wants to go do that. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> for them to go do that, it just, it was, uh, huge for huge for me. I really, and to this day, I really do appreciate them for that. Um, because it, it really, at the end of the day, it only benefits them. Yeah. Right. It only benefits them because if shit hits the fan, then that's, that's what's going to save your life. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I would probably say like we, I did, I went out with her multiple times. Um, just the, the times that I went out with her mostly, no, the only six missions out of those six missions, we had a dead, dead prey bite on top of a mountain she had found a great find, right? She was really known for a really sensitive nose. She had found um, an ammo can of AK-47 that had been dug in into the side of this dried up wadi. Wow. I don't know how long that shit had been there, right? But like I had her off leash, just letting her branch out, like just letting her enjoy life. And all of a sudden she dropped ass. And I'm like, EOD. Vacuum cleaner. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like Tango EOD. And yeah. they're like, what's up? And I'm like, dog sitting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like I see him bust out shovels and shit. And the whole time I'm like, I don't know if she's telling the truth. Like, yeah. I don't for sure as shit, she was telling the truth. That's amazing. Like, I was like, wow, man, wow. And I was like, so now, then we started giving her the nickname Satin Nose. Oh, she's got a satin nose. Um, whatever that means, sensitive nose. So then there was a, another mission where um, I had sent her into a room. You know, there was nobody to bite. Um, I was just kind of doing my, my uh, explosive detection stuff. And... Um, she starts sitting on like every, like the, the behavior she's showing me is that the whole room's full of explosives. So I start looking into it. I grab EOD. We find like scales and we find like tarps and we find all this fertilizer that's being processed to become HME. You know what I mean? Or, or yeah, yeah. I, yeah. HME. And so um, that they're, that they're making. And so it ended up being like seven or 800 pounds. Wow. Like we had a dread. It took us like, fucking 30 minutes for everybody to drag it outside and we biffed it we blew Jesus. it in place and so that was like that was another huge thing and i was like god damn like uh, yeah. you're doing good girl like we need we need that live bite you yeah. know what i mean like we need that live bite you yeah. know what i mean to solidify this so <clears throat> same deal like yeah the, the mission she gets shot on right like we're we've been watching this target all is it, night is this where the drawing painting comes from no the the painting is actually benno's into the breach oh okay painting. that's that's benno on that okay. painting, and so that's, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that is a specific mission that has to do yeah. with Benno or anything like that, even though we did a lot of satellite breach charges and sent Benno through the yeah. breach. It's uh, just more like a memorial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, more or less, that was like a, a painting for all of, all of yeah. Ranger Regiment. You know, um, it just so happens I had went through shoulder surgery and was able to get put on that detail to where B Benno was a part of that painting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I had told the artist that he had died, and when he had died, he had put Benno's name on his oh, on cool. the name tap on the side. And that's I was awesome. like, because I thought it was cool, right? Because, like, everybody else looks the fucking same, yeah. that whole fucking painting. Yeah. But the only dog with the chipped ear 
and his fucking name tag. You know, the only yeah. thing that's identified in that's Benno. I was that's like, awesome, that's man. pretty neat, yeah, you know. Really and cool. so we, um, <clears throat> so we, you know, we've been watching this target. Uh, we had watched these three dudes make four century into this into this house. Like they forced entry into this house out in the middle of nowhere. And these are bad guys. Yeah, bad guys. And so we're like all right, we're going to go out and get them. And so we had planned to do a long Y, long Y infill. I mean, we were going to land helicopters probably like anywhere from four to 600 meters away from the target compound because it was so wide open, right? Not a lot of places for cover as far as for us. That's how wide open it was. And so, um, you know, we, we ran, helicopters landed, um, isolation, uh, isolation and containment of the compound. Nobody ran from it. Um, we instantly start going back and forth with them talking, hey, you, this is us, da, 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 let him out. Um, you know, after about five minutes of going back and forth, something that's never happened before happened. Um, the, the foreign fighters or the terrorists, they let all the children and all the women out of the house. Really? They let them out. Wow. It was wild. I never, to this day, I've never seen seen them give up that that kind of token you yeah. know what i mean and like you know but they did and so they they let the they let the women out and then the children came out and we're talking to them and the lady confirmed it she was like yeah we're just sleeping they pushed their way into our house we don't even know who they are they have guns they have weapons she's telling us everything they have um and she's like they're mean and they're, like, they're you know they're, they're they're gonna fight and everything else and like they said they weren't gonna give up and like the the dude who's in charge of the Terp is like, hey, Terp, you ask her if she has everybody. Ask her if she has all the kids. If she, Ask her if she has all the adults. Like, you see her, she's counting. And she's like, yeah, we have. She's like, I have everybody. And he was like, have her count again with a white light. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we need to make sure of this shit. So we're counting. Because we, we had gotten stood down from using air support. We couldn't use air support at this point in time. Really? Right, yeah. They would not let us use air support whatsoever. So they counted it again. Boom. The lady's like, we have everybody. Um, they talked up to the command. Command was like, we'll give you air support. Right? Like, everything's been confirmed twice. Boom. Air support comes in. They dropped two hellfires <clears throat> on this compound. Um, <clears throat> upon dropping two hellfires uh, onto this compound, we took some small arms fire we engaged. It, it quickly passed. Um, we figured that everything was dead inside of that inside of that compound. Compound was pretty dilapidated, um, and so you know, the command pushed. You know, wanted us to push to assault it. Boom, push to assault it. <clears throat> it's my time. It's lake is time to shine. Right, mm -hmm. it's your time to shine, baby girl. <clears throat> we uh, we get up to the breach. Um, my good buddy, who's all the SRT surgeon now, my good buddy. He, Pulls out, we do everything textbook. I'm like, hey, show her, show her the thermal barrack. He shows her the thermal barrack as if it's a tennis ball. You know what I mean? Shakes it, pulls the pin, throws it, and like we're counting back down in our head, and she's amped. And the whole time while she's fucking getting intense, I'm like, yeah, girl, yeah, 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 yeah. Like talking to her low, skaboom, it explodes. I send her, right? She sends. She has the the TSC camera closed and it's illuminating her back. Lots of dust still from the um, one from the ASM fucking you know from the grenade, and then you also have the the hellfires that hit it. So there's a lot of debris. Um, she clears her first point of domination, which which we did within training. She goes down to her second point of domination to clear it, and um, and she starts engaging something. And so as I start getting closer to it, I'm getting closer to it, and I see the silhouette of a of a man. Um, instantly in my head, I'm your dude's dead, right? Been here before, been here, done that, dude's dead. Um, kind of do a look over on him real fast. Notice that he's a missing part of his leg. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, fucking this dude's done, done skis. And um, so I start working like on that bite, right? Another great success, cadaver, right? We're putting in the pieces and the elements. I'm, I was like, I'm going to work her on this bite and then I'll pull her off and then we'll, um, you know, and then we'll we'll continue, you know, we'll continue mission. We'll start, you know, we'll get another couple dead prey bites or we'll start doing detection, whatever it may be. Um, as I'm working her on the bite, right, mind you, my weapon is slung. Or she, her body is in between my legs. And I have my head on the back of her collar and touching her ears, right, trying to get her deep and push her onto that bite um, and really get her to enjoy biting that dead body. This dude comes back to life. Right, whether he's high on drugs, just overpressure knocked out, or all of the above, this dude comes back to life and he starts 
shooting, you know, I would say four to six controlled. It wasn't da 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 da. It was pow pow pow. Um, wow. It was so close that the heat of the AK I could feel on my face. The God, heat, damn. and then being whited out by that. I I thought I was hit. I thought I was hit. I thought I had had to be. Um, I fall back right like. Sorry, baby. I can't save you. Right? I can't even fucking save myself right now. My weapon slung. Um, I drop like a go back to my fallback position, which is like maybe 10, 12 feet. Um, Are you carrying a secondary? No, no, I don't. I don't have a pistol yeah. on me at that point. I, not not that I didn't have an option. Um, it's just I just didn't just comfort. Yeah. Maybe just comfort in what I was doing. Like, you know what I mean? It wasn't something that wasn't it wasn't like it wasn't an option for me it was an option it's just not something that went through my head you know um so uh i get back to the fallback and so i turn that old school tritronics up to a six and now i'm nuking i'm like nuking 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 and i can hear her just screaming this is all happening probably within seconds right and uh a buddy of mine who was going through looking through the adjacent window right he could see the dude and had Good sights on him. Shot him. Shot him twice with a scar heavy. Um, killed him instantly. Uh, I get Leica back to me by shocking her. And by the time I get her to me, she actually has what's left of her arm inside of her mouth. And so that round had actually hit the ball and socket of her shoulder, completely decimated that fucking whole ball and socket, shattered the round because um, of the hardness of the bone, and then shrapnel trickled down her rib cage, hit her in the back leg, and blew out the bottom of her foot. Holy fuck. Right. Second round, it came up from her other leg that she has now, came up from her other leg, came in at an angle, hit her in the tricep, blew her whole tricep out. Like, you could hold up her arm in the cache, and you could look through it, like, off of uh, Dust Till Dawn. Remember that vampire movie where, yeah. like, uh, he, Quentin Tarantino can look through his hand? It was like that. Like, you could look through yeah. it. It's fucking wild. And then uh, two superficial wounds that had skipped underneath her stomach. She, she had stayed on the bite through all that? Yeah. Dude, at a year old. Dude, what in the fuck? Yeah. Monster shit, right? Like, that's that talent. That's absurd. Talent, talent. And so I get her back to me, and uh, she's trying to tear her arm off. Because as we know, dogs, Don't animals perceive pers yeah. pain a lot differently. Than she's just trying to get that arm off because she thinks the pain will stop once she gets it off. Um, and so I reach up and grab her, and instantly when I grab her, she... Ah, she she bah, she latches onto my forearm, right? And uh, I'm like, fuck it. Like, my adrenaline's going so hard at this point in time. Um, I'm like, fuck it. You know what I mean? She bites me, and I'm just I'm running her back to the fall, the predetermined fallback position because we're going to drop more shit on this compound now, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure everything's dead. So I run her back. She's on bite. I get her off of me, um, throw a muzzle on her. Lo and behold, Major, Major Fisher's there. You know what I mean? He's always there. Uh, and he starts looking her over. And I'm kind of in a panic, right? Um, my adrenaline was going so hard that after, before I'd even gotten her back to me, my platoon sergeant had to do blood sweeps on me because when he asked me if I was hit, I told him I didn't know. And so he had to check, right? Because I was like, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I fucking don't know if I'm hit or not. And so anyway, she bites me. I get back to that predetermined fallback position and I'm kind of in a panic. Um, and I'm really pissed, right? Like I'm just failure, you know what I mean? Like you, like fuck, man, failure. Like, uh, and that's already sinking in pretty deeply into my head. And um, and so, the first thing I ask him is, is I'm like, is she, is she gonna live? And he was like, I don't know. Hold on. And he was like, let me check her lungs. And I told him, I said, I said, if she's not gonna live, I'll just put her out right now. And so I had every intention to just go ahead and old yell her if it needed to be. If she had anything in her lungs, because bottom line is they're not sending in a medical right aircraft for a dog, not when we're still in contact. Like, that's not happening. Um, and so I wasn't going to sit there and listen to her scream and suffer. I wasn't going to do it. Growing up on a farm, I don't do that. Um, it may seem barbaric to a lot of listeners, but it is what it is, man. I wasn't going to do it. Major Fisher let me know and assured me that she was going to live. And when he did that, I was like, okay. But I had every intention of, he was going to be like, no, she's, she's not going to make it. I would, have, I would have done what needed to be done, you know, um, despite when anybody wants to think of me about that. I, I don't think uh, anybody has any room to judge. You know, no. you, you were the one that, that's there and, 
And I, I mean, I totally get that. Like if, if they're not going to make it, you know, then, then to me, like, yeah, you've got to end the suffering. You yeah. Know? I mean, that, that's the right thing to do. There's yeah. no two ways about it. I'm know? not, I'm not seeing this. I'm not yeah. seeing that suffering through all the yeah. way till it's end now. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, at that point in time, major Fisher, he's doing his thing. He's trying to come up with a determination on whether or not he needs to do a battlefield amputation. Cause he's thinking about amputating that leg right then and there. He's got her so doped up on ketamine and everything yeah. else that he's like, Hey, I might be able to do this. It is um, at this point when she's, got ketamine and whatever else is she kind of subdued and, and chilled out now yeah, yeah. yeah she's super chill at this yeah. point she's just kind of there existing and yeah. yeah. you know existing in high yeah, you know what yeah. i mean like um i would say from the time she got shot to the time the exville bird came was probably four hours wow right so four hours so four so hours she's stable so he's having to re-administer that shit yeah right? yeah, yeah he's having to re-administer but he also has to be careful yeah, as well because too much. well we're still in contact yeah. Right. And so the other bombs go off. Everything drops. What else did you do? I have, a, I have a senior medic with me. Right. And so the senior medic is kind of watching me and Leica. And now his focus switches on the assault. Right. Because if something happens to man, man yeah. he needs to be right there in order to, to take care of our dudes, too, if something happens. So he kind of uh, disseminates responsibility. And he's like, senior medic here. Cool. I'm going to go with the assault right over here. And then I'll be back right when assault's complete. And so, you know, assault was complete. And really what that mission turned into as far as assault goes is like, hey, Q-tips, grab DNA. Yeah. You know what I mean? At that point in time, there's yeah. not nothing left of those. What, what else was dropped on it? Do you know? Oh, uh, I just, I want to say all they did was just hit like four or five Hellfires, yeah. you know, which, you know, and people think those are cool. Like the reality is, is I've seen those Hellfires skip off those compounds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not do fucking anything to them. Yeah. Uh, so, and you know, and when, when I go, when you go back at it, you look at it and you're like, you know, I, I went against all my doctrine, right, that I've ever been taught. Um, and I tell this to people all the time. If it were Benno, too easy. I would have entered, looked at the dude. No no reason to get Benno fired up on that dead body. I would have stepped in, shot the dude in the face, and then I would have pulled Benno off the body, right? Because you're supposed to clear through your enemies, yeah. right? With me, I didn't do that. And I didn't do that for a reason. I assessed it. I looked at it. I said, this guy must be dead. I assumed wrong, obviously. But what I didn't want to do is, is I didn't want her to be doing such a good job and being on that bite and then me come over the top with her and shoot this dude in the face, her come Star off the bite right and never want to bite again. Yeah. Right? I would rather have... No, I can understand. Got, yeah, I'd rather have just gotten her, like, been in that situation before. Had no idea that dude was on that Terminator shit. <laughs> had no idea he was living that Terminator life yeah. that day, you know? So, yeah. you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, I'd have done it differently, but, you know, here we are. And so, um, anyway... We mission complete. They load her up. We get her back to the cache, um, and so the the vets are there. The, the veterinarians, good people. I've met them before. Just you know, need, needing some needing some care here and there. Um, but you could clearly see that when they laid eyes on her, they have they had never they had never taken care of an animal that had um, ballistic you know, high velocity ballistic injuries yeah. like that before you could tell by the way they, they looked at her You're like, right? like you could, and you can see it like yeah. whether professional or not. Like I've been in a lot of situations and I've seen a lot of that shit where I looked at her face and I was like, I don't feel really comfortable with her doing this. And so I, the SRT surgeons are there at this point in time too. And they had known me through Benno and they had all, all these people had really kind of come together. Right. And so the SR, I told the SRT surgeon, I'm like, Hey, I don't feel too comfortable with them working on her. Yeah. You know what I mean? They spent, you know, they spent a good hour and a half keeping her doped up and just shaving her. Yeah. Right. And I, like I said, no, no hate on them whatsoever. Um, they're great. They're great people. They're great at what they do. Um, but I was getting super frustrated with that. Like, how long are you guys going to do fucking shaving her? Yeah. Like they shaved her whole body and I was irate. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys haven't even started working on her yet. Yeah. Finally, the SRT surgeon was like, uh, hey, we're going to take charge. And the lady veterinarian was like, well, this is my patient. And he goes, no. Yeah. Like, you're, he goes, you're a veterinarian. I am a fucking lieutenant colonel. Yeah. This is my patient. Yeah. And he was like, I'm taking charge. And he was like, so I need you to sit down. <laughs> and so she got, she got one up. Yeah. She got some paper rock rank there. And he, he, him and his whole team took over Leica wow. right then and there. He was going through it. Messing on her for about an hour, he looked over to her and he said, "Hey, would you like to, to would you like to join and learn something? You yeah. know what I mean?" And so he started doing the amputation, and he literally gave her the tools and was walking her through it. 
wow. right? Because he was he was doing that as a teaching moment for her, yeah. right? So he, they get her all, they get they get that leg off. Kind of funny, uh, an, an indigenous Afghani came into the cache and he had a gunshot wound to the ass that came out of his calf. And uh, that was the only person that came in and they were like, hey, we have a, we have a human patient. And he looked and he goes, isn't it American? And they go, nope. And he goes, then we're working on Americans over here. Just give them <laughs> drugs. So this guy's over here screaming about his calf the whole time while they're working on Lake. And like, not like his priority right now, yeah. this American's priority. Uh, so I thought that was pretty neat. Um, they do seven hours amputating that leg. And uh, it was cool. I got to sit in on it. I got to watch it. I thought it was, it was very educational for me as well. Um, and then... Um, and then after they got her stabilized and in a stable position, um, lo and behold, um, somebody up on the food chain where we're at that works with us came down and said, hey, go ahead and put her down, right? That's what they wanted to do. And this was, you know, this is one of our guys, you know what I mean? Like, hey, go, go ahead and put her down. And uh, I, got, I got real irate, right? I'm pretty known for my opinions, and um, I'm pretty known to be pretty outspoken and vocal. And so... Uh, I became irate real quick. Um, the SRT surgeons before, I think they read it, and the SRT surgeons told our command that um, it goes against our oath. She's already in stable condition. Yeah. You well, know what I mean? Cool. They're like, we can't we can't help you out there. Yeah. Who was trying to, to so, say that? Um, I don't know. I don't know the name exactly. I know that. Um, Do you know the position? I th definitely, uh, Definitely an officer of higher ranking. Yeah, but I mean, what, like within your command structure, yeah. no shit. Yeah, so, yeah, and so I, <clears throat> so I had, <clears throat> I had gotten like Lake is in stable position. I had gone up after she was stable, she was good to go. She was going to stay there at the cache um, in a medical induced coma uh, until they got her a flight to Germany, where they had to repair her tricep. They didn't have the shit in country to repair her tricep um, in Afghanistan. They had to ship her out to Germany to do so. So they kept her medically doped up. Um, and then they had, uh, I, had, I had went up there to kind of go talk to my first sergeant and talk to everybody, kind of give them an update of what was going on <clears throat> with her and, 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 and whatnot. And so I went up there and I went into the jock, which is the Joint Operations Command. And, um, and fucking, I'm letting my first sergeant know the, the who, what, when, where's and why's of what's going on. And, um, and one of them, like one, one fucking desk nerd uh, opened up his mouth and he said, we should just put her down. And I lost my shit. And when the first sergeant like, Trent, he grabbed me <laughs> and he walked me out. And I was like, who the, because I did, I go, who the fuck are you? Yeah. When he said that, I said, who the fuck are you? I've never seen you before. Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. You know, I'm respond? covered in blood. You know what I mean? Who are you? Did he respond? No. He was just like, Oh well, yeah, he didn't say anything. He just, I was like, who the fuck are you? You know what I mean? He was like, oh, and like, Demon was like, oh, like, yeah. no, 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 no. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. And so uh, him and I talked about it, but like those guys knew, those guys knew that that wasn't going to be an option for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? They already knew that that, like, no, nah, well, so they, they took her and what they did was, is they said, hey, don't worry, Army. We, she won't be y'all's responsibility anymore. We the Air Force was like we'll take her. Wow! And so the air it was a hand receipt. Did they end up uh, taking her to Lackland ultimately yeah. to recover? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they took her to Lackland. So they did another seven hour surgery in Germany. Kept her in the same coma. Woke her up when she got to uh, a couple days after she got into Lackland. Um, a lot of people didn't know what to do with her. Right, this is a tier two dog. They've really they've never messed with like they have their own attack dogs and stuff yeah. like that, but they've never really messed with that caliber of animal, right? They've messed with their MP dogs yeah. um, and SP dog or SF dogs, special for security forces yeah. dogs. Um, was there a designated handler? Yeah. 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 There was a guy that was designated um, and he, he did a great job. Yeah. He did a great, great, great job with her. And I kept up with her all the way until she got to Lackland, yeah. right? Because I, once again, I've got another dog and was running missions. Um, and the dog that I got was like, by no means a, bottom of the barrel yeah. you know what i mean this dog was not saving anybody's life um and so i only had like a month left and so i made sure that she was stable i made sure that she wasn't going to get put down um and then they got her to lackland i was like great i got home man i got home 
July, May, May. So if you think about it, Beno got shot April 27th. Leica got shot May 20, like May, May 22nd, right? Like that's, that's the time frame, yeah. right? So, um, and then June, I want to say we got home June or July. And then I want to say I got her like in August. Oh. So that's, that's kind of the time frame that you have right there that's laid out. And did, you, so, did you go pick her up? No. So <clears throat> we, we did, we did some things that were like hush hush, right? Like I, I had called at this point in time. That's no longer, it's no longer regiment's responsibility. The dog's not right. And so I went ahead and called, um, Blackland Air Force Base when I got home. I said, hey, look, you guys have a dog there named Leica, special operations dog. She's got three legs. And they were like, oh, yes, we do. And I was like, that's great. Um, I'm looking to adopt her. And they were like, oh, we already have somebody that, like, that's the fuck you do. Adopt her. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I said, oh, man, that's amazing. I said, well, I said, well I'm, I'm her handler. And I was like, I was with her when she got shot. Is there any way that I can become the priority in this? And they said, absolutely and then they had this um lady called lieutenant colonel childs i think her name is she gave me a call um we worked it out she was like they were they were uncomfortable with giving her to me because i had such a small child yeah. an infant right and um they really didn't know how to handle her up there either um, i think they were super intimidated by her they did a great job rehabbing her um the one guy did a really good job taking care of her uh you know she ended up chewing her tail off really there. yeah and so you know you got to think like i think when she came to out of her medical induced coma she came to and she was like where am i who are you you know what i mean who where am i who are you yeah. you know what i mean i last thing i remember is getting shot yeah you know we're, we're the people i know you know what i mean and me and her it really hadn't even really developed a bond yeah you know with what like six missions and fucking less than a month yeah. like we have like how, how much how do we really know of each other and so they um you know, they were real worried about, worried about that. And I, I told her, I said, hey, look, <clears throat> I said, I can promise you this. If she bites my child, I will kill her myself. But I said, but give her an opportunity at life. I said, do not let the enemy win. I said, if she dies, the enemy wins. They won that night, you know? Yeah. And so I was pretty adamant about that. And so, um, and that's something I was adamant about uh, at regiment too. And so, um, they uh they did the paperwork i did it all notoriety everything else my command really didn't know what i was doing and so they had put me on a detail and i was like okay i'll go do the detail my good buddy john dixon who um his dog's mika i don't know if you've seen the yeah. some of the yeah john johnny d oh, okay. yeah so john dixon he um he went down there and he was the he was our he was a handler who then turned our vet so he was like our vet tech for oh, nice. our, yeah. so he went down there and picked her up and then, uh, and then he brought her back to me. Yeah. And then, so like, then the next day, like, you know, I was at work the whole time doing details, whatnot, getting ready to go to Benning. And then all of a sudden, like, boom, here's like, a <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. and so I was like, it was, it was, um, it was good to parade her around. Yeah. It was good to parade her around. I, you know, whoever that guy was in the jaw, I wish I knew where he was at. Cause I would love to have brought her in the office and been like, yeah, yeah. See yeah. that, yeah. you know, but that was something that I was super upset about. Cause I was like, man, we don't, we don't, we don't put our dudes down. Yeah. The fuck are we doing yeah. you know what i mean like yeah it's fucked up. like like if we were gonna put her down like should have let me do that on the battlefield yeah you know what i mean like no no yeah. oh no 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 yeah no 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 and so um you know and that's it's kind of how that's kind of how that story kind of went over and like you know like i'll tell you man like the, at the end of it like um i i took her because i didn't want her to get put down yeah. Right. I, that's, that's why I took her. Um, I took her and I adopted her because that was ultimately my teammate. Right. And I felt, uh, a massive responsibility in, uh, in it and getting her and getting her hurt, putting her in that situation. Um, and so that's why, that's why I adopted her. Yeah. What, were we friends? No. Were we, had we bonded in any way? No, not at all. How has, how has that process changed? I mean, because you've had her for a fucking decade Bro. now, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's... Um, I mean, are you as tight? I, I, love, I love that dog. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I mean, are, are you the most tight with her bond-wise? So, is it so it's, it's, it's different, right? Um, me and Benno's bond was forged in blood and combat. Yeah. Right? So different, different bond. Um, with 
her bond and me it's it's forged in um family it's family yeah it's forged in it's forged in love i mean that dog has seen me at some of my lowest points yeah. you know what i mean and uh still been there yeah. you know what i mean like maybe not by choice maybe because like i fucking own her but she's still there and yeah. uh and you can see it and um and I'm, I'm glad i've gotten into a better place but i could see her and she would hold a lot of my stress right because really? they can feel that yeah you know what i mean and she would hold a lot of my stress in her and uh and so not not so much anymore um she doesn't have to anymore and yeah. so uh, and i i tell her that all the time i'm like you don't you know tell her like you don't have to uh you don't gotta fight for me anymore you know so yeah yeah good dog good dog it's uh you know it's it's amazing to see uh you know you walk through the the whole process of of your career as both a ranger and a canine handler and and you know just the amazing relationships that you've had with some world class dogs um you know and, and just being able to to kind of tag along on that journey as you explain yeah. it is uh is truly special thank you and you uh, know like i you know and that's the thing like uh you know, like I, I adopted Leica without, you know, any, any of the notoriety that I thought was going to come from it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was never about any of that. It was never about covers of National Geographic or movies or documentaries or nothing. It was about the love and the responsibility that I had for that animal yeah. for, for bringing me and my buddies back home. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, I had a responsibility there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of inherited the burden, right? I was kind of, you know, forced to. I mean, I was still in the military whenever Lakin made the cover of National Geographic. I mean, I was still in. And so, um, and I was told that, you know, it would be a good, you know, it'd be, it'd, it'd be a good look for, for a regiment and everything else. Um, and so that's how, you know, she, she had made the cover. And, you know, you, when you see it, like the story's really vague on there, right? There's not a whole lot I can tell because I'm, you know, I'm still active duty. Um, and you know, with a lot of the documentaries and stuff that you see me laid out there, man, I am I'm I'm laying it out there and I'm I'm opening it up for um I'm I'm literally like I'm I'm opening up wounds, infected wounds in order, you know what I mean, in order to share this. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's been really tough. This is probably the first time I've ever been in a really good uh headspace being two years sober that I can share this and I can get emotional about it and be okay with it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's not gonna anger me or it's not gonna put me in a spiral. Um, you know, be, being two years sober has kind of given me the power to kind of control my emotions in that way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like, um, and, and th that's really what I would want people to know is that like, I, anything that I've ever done, I've never went to anybody's door or called up anybody and begged them to put me on anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's not anything I've ever done. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it seems pretty apparent that she was kind of cherry picked or hand selected um you know to represent a i mean really a, a country yeah. honestly you yeah. know i mean like and 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 kind of embodies two decades of of war uh and and a and a, an extremely important component of that that a lot of people don't know much about and are equally fascinated by uh, in in yeah. the military working dog especially with special operations dogs uh what in in terms of the laundry list of everything that that she's been picked to do or be on or a part of or whatever. Can you run down that real quick? Yeah, man. So, um, from the start of it, uh, which she, you know, the national geographic documentary, which won a Webby, which yeah. is, I guess like a website award, something like that. Uh, the cover of national geographic. Um, then we did the, uh, hallmark hero dog awards, um, which she won the military dog of the year. And then we did the, uh, national geographic, not national Ge history channels, war fighters, then we did the HBO documentary I did with uh, with Channing Tatum um, called War Dogs, Hero's Best Friend. Uh, and both of them were actually called, the titles were War Dogs, Hero's Best Friend, which is kind of weird. But they, that it worked out like that. It's not by design. Um, and then, uh, you know, multiple, you know, multiple um, news outlets, like, you know, high-end high news outlets stuff, Fox Nation, um, you know, uh, Good Morning America, uh, you know, we were mentioned in Dog the Movie as Leica and Benno being an inspiration to that movie. Oh, that's cool. Um, which is cool. Like, they, they used a lot of my pictures 
um, in the movie, and they just CGI'd somebody's face over him. But a lot <laughs> of those, nice yeah, yeah, but a, yeah, but a lot of, but a lot of those pictures in the very beginning are Benno, and uh, and then they also, um, you know, the the Lulu's greatest hits is um, that's also like that's that's Benno's raw footage taken from his wow. camera yeah. that they use for that. And then uh, there's some quotes in there as well, like unicorn and rainbow vaginas um, <laughs> when expressing war. Uh, and that was just because I, you know, I did that HBO documentary that he produced, and I mean, they they were collectively at my house for like three weeks. Yeah. I mean, just like you know, hammer and hammer and hammer, yeah. and I was just like, oh my god! And they would ask me what they would be like, what what's combat like? I was like, you know, I would tell it to them, and they wouldn't like the answer. And finally, I was like, well, it's not rainbows and unicorn vaginas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the fuck y'all want from me, and so they yeah. liked it enough yeah. that they put it on there. And so, um, yeah, that was that, and it was just you know, it's. Been a, it's been a wild ride with her, man. When yeah. you talk about opening up PGA tournaments and um, PBR, Pro, Pro Bowl Rodeo tournaments, and uh, and just you know everything else under the sun um, that we've been that we've been able to take a part of, and and I'm truly blessed by that. You yeah. know what I mean? But I made it very very clear in the beginning that um, I would not speak about her unless we spoke about Benno. Yeah, I made that very clear to everybody, and um, I I won't do interviews, I won't do anything unless they're willing to talk about and listen to and put out everything about Benno because, you know, that's that's what kills me about it, and always, you know, it's right like, you know, is she deserving of it? I think there's a lot more dogs that are. Um, she's definitely deserving of of something, um, you know, when you try to put it in comparison of, you know, and then you start comparing comparing and contrasting Benno's, Benno's achievements, right, to, on, on target achievements to Lega's on target achievements. It's, you, you no can't, you, yeah, you can't yeah. compare it. You can't compare it. And yeah. so, and so you, you know, you, that's kind of a burden as well, right? Yeah. And, but that's why I don't let anybody speak about, like, like, Leica is a great symbol. Yeah. Leica is a great, you know, she saved, she saved lives. Yeah. You know what I mean? And she is a great, for her to be honored, you know what I mean, with yeah. a, with a statue and everything else, well deserved. Yeah, well deserved, yeah. with without a shadow of a doubt. And uh, you know, I'm truly honored by that. Um, and once again, that's not anything that I asked for. Yeah, um, that's just that's something that came down the pipeline, and um, that, that's that's happening. Yeah, you know, no, I I can certainly see that. I mean, I think it's important to uh, kind of reconcile the the comparison thing. I mean, no different than human beings is that you know certain groups units even individuals within certain entities etc don't ask to be in certain uh, you know positions have had you know a number of um medal of honor recipients on here that are kind of in that that same boat it's like you know that there's you know i i know a bunch of guys that did way more shit than me it's just there was this one four hour period on this one day that i was just the wrong place the wrong time you know or whatever and, and this is what came out of it and, and i think you know, kind of to your point, and, and I think more importantly is that in, instead of contrasting and comparing the two and who's more worthy and, and you know, blah, 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 I think, you know, it, it's really, it's what she represents. She represents an entire community of canine war fighters that have saved thousands of American lives. And, and in that regard, I think she, she's as deserving as any dog, you know. You know, Mike, and I didn't realize that until I got sober. Yeah, I really did. So I'd love to talk about that. Can you kind of? I mean, I, I don't want to. No, no. Um, open up shitty wounds, but no. What, what happened? Uh, so, okay. So, um, I was, you know, going through a lot of personal issues. Had just, um, had just left my daughter's mother, and uh, and so I was, you know, living on my, you know, obviously living on my own, and um, took Lake out to the beach, uh, with a bottle of. Um, it's like a bottle of bottle of whiskey, and I tanked that whole bottle on the beach. Um, I was with, I was with friends, um, or fr friends at the time, and uh, I remember I tanked the bottle, and then I, it's a fifth, and I threw it threw it out in the ocean, and then um, and then I guess I'd gotten into an altercation with a uh, with a police officer, an Okaloosa County Sheriff's Department guy, and um, I had actually confronted him. Um, and so he had asked me to uh, put my arms behind my back. I told him no. Um, he pulled his taser out, and then he shot me with the taser. I was shirtless. Um, and like I said, I was probably like from here to that hat. And, uh, and I looked at him, and, it's just, and I only know this because what I see off body, body cam, right? Like I don't, I don't fucking know uh, any of it. 
or did, didn't remember any of it. But um, but I looked at him and I just said, you know, is that is that all you fucking got? And as this taser is hitting me, and I take the prongs and tear them out of my my chest, and I grab a hold of him and I throw him on the ground. Um, at that point in time, I, I mounted him um, with my knees on on his arms where he couldn't lift them, and I disarmed him of his pistol as well as his radio. And uh, and that's when about twelve civilian um, bystanders took and they they got control of me. Thank God. Um, yeah. Not not my best day. You know, probably the worst day of my life. Um, it needed to happen. You know, I'm just glad nobody got killed or hurt. Um, I yeah, I I needed that in my life. I was. I was a pretty, I was a wreck. I was an absolute wreck. I was up to, I was up to drinking like a, a, a fifth, fifth and a half by myself a day. Wow. I mean, it was fucking crazy. The, 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 the things I was, the things I was doing to cope. You know what I mean? Was it, uh, if you don't mind my, my prying, was it all alcohol or were you doing? It was, uh, it was I'm d- dumpster. I was other things. Yeah. Other things. So, um, you know, you, you name it, uh, pills. Uh, which that's that's my big that was my big vice, especially after my three shoulder surgeries, um, you know, opioid pills and, and you know, narcotics like opioid. Type yeah, 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 yeah. It was and that's like, you know, I, I turned to that to cope. Like if I needed to cope, that's how I would cope. And I would cope, you know, and I, I think that's, you know, unfortunately, I think that's kind of like I had my shoulder surgeries, you know, after I got blown up and I think I coped. I coped. And that's how I coped with the death of, you know, seeing the death of of. uh of that one, you know, of Sanchez and and um, and Jeremy and and Platino dying. I mean, I literally with everything I'm talking about, like I would. Oh uh, nine got blown up. 2010 shoulder surgery, 2011 shoulder surgery, 2012 shoulder surgery. So in between there, I am I'm going overseas, mm-hmm. and so literally I'm recovering from a shoulder surgery and then throwing on kit before I should. <clears throat> You know what I mean? To go back overseas. And so that's just kind of what I used as co- coping. It was used to cope. It used as a fucking crutch. I mean, while you're on active duty still, you're yeah. doing that? Yeah. Uh, overseas even? Um, no. No. Uh, no, 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 no. Over, overseas, that was, that was the break. I, would, I was doing it when I, would be, when I was prescribed it. Yeah. Right? I'm not getting this off the street. Yeah. Right, right? These are literally getting prescribed to me by the hundreds. Yeah. And so, no. It was... was uh, in terms of like when you're taking that break, if you're to the point where you're snorting shit, um, when, like if you're stopping cold turkey and going overseas, are you withdrawing and, and yeah. no shit? Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Yeah. Painful. Yeah. Painful. Because I mean, you, you, painful. you see it and hear about it, but I, I'd love to like. Yeah. You, like you got like restless legs, um, your cold sweats, you can't sleep at night. And that's, you know, you're probably got 72 hours to endure that. You can't, no, no out loss of appetite, uh, flu like symptoms. Um, Flu like symptoms with restless legs, I would say that's what it would be. Like you can't sleep. Yeah. Like can't get comfortable. Um, after about three days, three, four days of it, it goes away. You know what I mean? Especially how much water you're pumping through you. Um, but yeah, man, just you know, and, and alcohol was really never my jam. And then I just started I started coping with um with alcohol because I, you know, I stopped, you know, I really stopped doing the pills and stuff like that. And then I started coping with alcohol and Unfortunately, that's something that runs pretty deeply in, on my dad's side of the family is uh, is addiction, yeah. and so, you know, we, and so now I just like I needed it, and um, and it did. It happened. Uh, they they did the they they gave me vet court, and so they gave me eighteen months, um, which was not a walk in the park. Vet um, court, what was yeah, that? it's a, it's because I was a, a veteran. Oh, okay, um, and this is my you know a violent offense. Um, they gave me vet court. It's 18 months and it is like, you have to go to therapy three times a week and then you get randomly drug tested where you have to call and type in a number on your phone and it tells you whether or not you got to come in. And then, uh, sometimes that could be two, three times a week yeah. that they're randomly doing it. Um, did you find it was, uh, manageable or easy to stay clean during that 18 months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of, well, yeah, because you know, there's so much riding on it. Yeah. Right? There's a lot riding on it. Right. And then. Uh, on top of that, like once you get to like six months, uh, you just feel like this massive weight kind of come off of you, and you're like, "Wow, man! Like I, like what the fuck was I know, doing? Yeah, like where have I been at? You know?" And it was, it was super cool, man. I got to really introduce myself back to myself. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it was, you know, like this, uh, 
You, have you ever watched Lord of the Rings? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like, you know, like, you have the... Remember that king who's, like, kind of cursed by... You know, yeah. he's cursed? That's how it is, and right? And it's almost like you wake up one day, and it's like that curse is lifted. Yeah. And you're oh. like, where have I been at? Yeah. And um, I refuse to be around around drugs. I refuse to be around alcohol. I won't even have conversations with drunk people. Yeah. Like, they're, it's it's mindless. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have nothing to provide. Yeah. And, um, you know, I won't... Like, even... You know, I, I love family. Um, I, I love my brother. My brother had uh, two shoulder surgeries here recently. I had to stay away from him. And I told him why. And he was like, you know, he asked me if I'd come over. I said, I can't come over. And he's like, why? And I was like, you got, you got too much shit laying around your house right now. Do you, do you think that uh, you would be tempted? I think, I think, you know, once again, Lord, Lord of the Rings, Gollum. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you got, there's the ring. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, oh, my precious. You know, I, I don't know if yeah. I'd be tempted or not, but. Just don't want to even try. Yeah, it. why? Why try it? I mean, I saw that shit's wrecked my. That shit's nearly wrecked me. Yeah, as as a as a man, and and uh, you know, nearly that that's nearly taken everything away wow. from me that I've ever accomplished. And, yeah. um, put I put a lot of jeopardy there, and uh, and make no mistake, like absolutely not proud of myself um, for doing that or getting to that point. Um, one, I'm very very thankful that they didn't kill me because I'd have killed me. Yeah, right, right for doing that, like. Pfft, no, yeah. you know ROE like yeah, taser, I mean, taser uh, don't work. Like, yeah, I mean another <laughs> cop coming up on you, yeah. shirtless mounted. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, like there's a good chance you're getting smoked. In damn that right. Position. And yeah. so, and that's what I said in court. Uh, you know, I'm just that's what I did. I thanked him for it and thanked him for the opportunity. And were you able to make amends with that officer? Um, not yet. No, yeah. I'm not. You know what I mean? There's there's some guidelines and stuff like that. Like I just got through with my um, my 18 months last June. Yeah. And so worked worked super hard, super yeah. disciplined, super hard. Um, but I have seen my life just do a complete 180, yeah. and I've just seen so much purpose come back into me. And yeah. um, like I said, I bought you know you see my dog Atlas on my Instagram. That's my sober buddy, yeah. right? Like I like and that's the deal. Like right, like I'm I'm never. I'm never going to go run out and hit targets and f get five bites on one target and fuck destroy bad, bad guys ever, ever again. Like yeah. that's a reality that, that I'm willing to accept. Um, but what I did really miss is I miss being a dog team. Yeah. Right. And like, like is like me and her dog team. Like she's, she's a human man. Yeah. Like she's not, she's, she's, yeah. she's, she's absolute human man. Yeah. Like she's, that's, that's what she is. She's 11. She rules the roost. She does what she wants. Like, you, yeah. there's no commands that you give her. Like if she wants to do something, she'll do it. Like she is who she is. Right. But I miss running a dog as a dog team. And so that's what I did. I, I got Atlas and I created them to do PSA stuff to specifically yeah. do that. You know what I mean? And give, give me purpose as far as being part of a dog team that I can showcase. Yeah. Right. Like, Hey, this is, this is who I am when I, when I have a dog, you know what yeah. I mean? This is what I am when I have a team, Yeah, you know, and I'm part of a team. Yeah. And so yeah that that yeah. purpose behind that it gives you an objective and a, and a goal and something yeah. to strive towards and, and it's never ending you know it's like you can never ch really fully check that box like there's yeah. always always more shit you can do with them you know which is is an amazing thing to to be a part of and um, then uh and then you know obviously like the the swamp fox canine and yeah. stuff like that like uh, you know bottom line is i would have never been able to accomplish any of this um without without sobering up yeah and i'm dude i'm so like i tell you dude i'm insanely proud of myself and yeah. it's been a it long be. it's been a long long time before you know since i can say that yeah you know what no, i mean you, but it was well deserved and you damn sure should be fuck i'm proud of you man i appreciate it yeah appreciate no, i'm it. very proud of you uh so what now <sighs> well <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up <laughs> oh you know man i think you know, we, we, we with New Year's coming up and stuff like that, like everybody, like and they make their resolutions and stuff like that. Um, I don't know really what's next for me. I just know that tomorrow I'm going to wake up and try to be better than what I was today. Yeah, and I think that's the only thing that I can really ask myself and put on myself. I do. I have a I have a 27th, 28th. I have um my my PSA one that yeah. I'm going for with Atlas. So there's going to be a lot of train up to that. Um, you know, I got you know I got my son certified in scuba diving last summer. So I'm fixing to buy him like a, for his birthday, I'll buy him like a full blown scuba diving thing. And we're going to do a lot of scuba diving yeah, this awesome. summer when I get him again. Yeah. And then, um, and then for my daughter, you know, I just got my daughter a three legged Malinois yeah. that's out my, my vehicle. So I'm fixing to go, you know, I'm fixing to go present that to her, um, on Thursday when I pick her up from school. Yeah. And so does she know? No. Oh, it's kind of, and so, and you know, and, and that's the thing, man, like I just, 
my plans right now are just to sustain. Yeah. Sustain. Sustain yeah. happiness. Just keep going. You know what I mean? Sustain happiness. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, and I, I have a lot of people that reach out to me and stuff like that, and they're like, you know, how do you do it? How'd you get sober? How'd all this, all this, that, and the other? And I'm like, I became selfish. I became extremely selfish. And um, and when I when I say that, I mean, I, I became selfish with my time, yeah. with who who I'm hanging around, who I want to be with. Like, I don't want to be around anybody who's who's not willing to, you know what I mean? Not, not willing to give some sort of constructive criticism. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be around somebody who's just going to be, fucking yes me to death or just yeah. tell me what I want to hear. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, I don't want to be around that. And I, I like I said, I, I refuse to be around or have conversations with anybody who's inebriated, whether that's on drugs or alcohol, smoking weed, you name like, it. Like, you know what I mean? I can't yeah. like, we're, it's a mindless conversation. Yeah. Like, there, like no business will be done. No real transactions will be made. Yeah. This will be forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's, that's it. And yeah. so it's a waste of my fucking time. Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for anybody else's time that I wasted out there when I was fucked up, but yeah. I'm now realize it's, it's yeah. a waste of fucking time. Yeah. Is, is there a, uh, both personal and professional things that, you know, uh, aside from the, you know, just being better than I was yesterday, are there any big ticket, like long game goals that you have in either of those categories? Um, I like to put out a book. Yeah. You fuck you should, dude. Uh, I mean, like, honestly, this, this, as long as this is gone, it, we could have done twice as much. <laughs> honestly, I mean, like, the, the fucking stories you have. I mean, I, you know, I, I had high expectations and, and knew this would be a good interview. I, I'm fucking blown away. Awesome. I mean, completely fucking blown away by, I, I by your story and, and your ability to tell it the way that you tell it, man. Thank I mean, you. I, I could not be more proud of, of uh, you know, the man that you are and, and who you've become and, and your ability to communicate that in a forum such as this, I'm, I'm fucking beyond honored. So thank you. Yeah. Um, anyway, I guess back to the question, are there yeah. any, anything? Like I said, like if I, you know, a, a, a book is something I really yeah. want to achieve. Um, and it's, it's, and it's, you know, it's always a hard, it's always a hard play. Do you, do you start till after she's passed or do you start when she's still alive? I'd you start, know what I mean? Yeah. Cause like, you know, I, that's here, here would be my advice. Uh, I actually just had to put uh, my, he was on on paper uh, said that he was it was basically a few hours before he turned fourteen. Wow! Um, and he was kind of that dog for and I, I haven't actually announced this yet. It was on New Year's Eve. I, I haven't been able to to even fucking tell people because he was kind of that same thing. Like you know he he was Rico I, when I originally got him. Um, you know I got him for the purpose of providing him to the West Coast and and what ended up happening is you know we they ended up. You know, there there was a delay, and and they looked at a different dog, and and sixty minutes came, and and he was at this perfect point of me getting him ready to go there to where I could uh, do a lot of demonstrations of all the things that they wanted to do with him. And the same week that the sixty minutes piece aired, my first book came out that within a five day period. Wow! And so it was just like this catapulting into the into the limelight, you know, undeservedly in my opinion. But like the, the instant that happened, it was like, okay, we want to do these book signings. Will Rico, you know, the dog that you, that you showed all this stuff in the 60 minutes thing, you know, will, will he come with you? And I was like, fuck, I guess. And so for like a year, you know, like we did all of these signing tours and speaking engagements and all this fucking press kind of stuff. And like we would do these book signings and I would sign and then I would take the cover off and present it like a bite wedge, and he would bite the spine and put his teeth marks. That's in the fucking book. cool, man. Yeah, and so like, there's thousands of books wow. uh, out there with with his teeth marks and my signature on it. Um, you know, we did, he did the he was one of the two dogs. He was the action dog in Call of Duty Ghosts, the, cool. the original. You know, we we spent you know a fucking four or five days in in Hollywood with this weird lycra suit with reflective balls all over it, doing bite work from every different goddamn angle with him. Um, you know, just, I mean, tons of shit, you know, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. Just so, and it, but the, you know, so all that stuff is great, but what, where he was the most, uh, where, he, where he held the most special place in my heart is that as a father, you know, I, I, and doing this for a living for you know, the better part of 15 years now, professionally, um, you know, he, he was the, the dog that was always there, mm-hmm. you know, um, and from when my kids were toddlers, until they're teenagers, and, and I've I've done a lot of kind of self reflecting. Not to make this about me, so I apologize. Bear no, with, no, no, no. Bear, bear with me, both you and the guests. <laughs> it's the first time I've talked about it. I've even, frankly, been able to talk about it without breaking the fuck down. So, uh, bear with me. But the 
you know, he, he was that dog that was just there and, um, and, and seeing, do, you know, dogs come and go and, and having kids that are like, Oh, you know, can, are we going to keep this one? Kind of like what you're talking about mm -hmm. with your kids and, and always be like, no, you know, Rico's the one, the one benchmark foundational flagship dog. Um, you know, but a, as my kids have gotten older, there, there's this weird, almost de depressive nostalgia that I look back on their childhood. Uh, I don't know if you started to, to run into this, you know, where, where Santa doesn't exist anymore and, and like the magic of Christmas and just that the, their naivete and innocence as they get into teens and later teens disappears. And, and there's, there's a depressive nostalgia that I associate with that, that, that for me is just impossible to shake entirely, especially around the holidays. And yeah. so, you know, he, like, as I'm watching, you know, one getting ready to graduate, the other one's, you know, getting their license, you know, this week, and it's like, you know, you, you stop having to be responsible for taking them everywhere and, and making sure that they're everywhere they need to be every second of every day, like a light switch. It's just one day it's that way and the next day it's gone. Yeah. And uh, and so he was that one kind of link to them as little girls that I that I still had that was tangible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, basically the week after Christmas, I got sick as fuck. He had had a surgery removing a big uh, mass off of his back end that had ruptured and I didn't want to do it, but I had to, cause I know at that age, you know, once they, they get to that point, it's, uh, it's tough on them to have surgeries, you know, and, and just the surgery, they can never wake up from yeah. it. You know, it's just, it's hard on them at that age. And so, um, at any rate, you know, he had, after the surgery, he was okay, but I was having to give him some pretty heavy NSAIDs to, to keep him up. So he was having, having trouble getting up even, even off the ground. Uh, because of his back end being so sore. And I think the combination of just kidney function decline over the last couple of years, the heavy anesthesia, and then the NSAIDs all kind of just came to a head and shut his kidneys down. And uh, so, you know, on, on New Year's Eve, um, you know, it was just Saturday. Uh, the vet that I have that's been my vet for uh, the entire time I've been here has done all of the warrior dogs. Done all, I mean, I've, I've probably put his kids through fucking college. Um, you know, he he came in. It was just him my two girls and, and me and, and Rico, uh, you know, in the back of the vet because it was closed on a Saturday. It's New Year's Eve. And, you know, he, he couldn't have been better just walking us through and, and helping explain things to them and, and kind of making it okay because I was in, frankly, no shape to be able to be that for them. Yeah. As embarrassing as it is to say, I just, I was a fucking mess. And, uh, you know, but so anyway, um, I, I can, I can certainly understand that that component to it. And, and the reason I bring all of that up, one is to, is to kind of let people know, I'll, I'll post about it on social media here sometime soon, maybe before this episode airs. But, but to your question is that I would start now while, while things, while you still have the ability um, to, to be with her in person, mm -hmm. because once that's gone, you, your, your perspective, if you think about doing it with Benno as an example, like the, the 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 perspective you have, the emotion you feel towards him, how you remember him is different when they're gone. Yeah, you know, and and so to me, I, I would do both. I, I would start it now and 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 get what you can while she's still alive and have that perspective, and then finish it uh, after the fact, nice. you know, so that it's you know a complete package and you get kind of the the well rounded perspective of her. That would be my recommendation. Take your time with it. I definitely will. And I, I appreciate you feeling comfortable enough around me yeah. to, to talk about I, I, your, your stuff, man. No, I, Tough. I, yeah, I appreciate uh, you listening. I mean, to me, there's, there's no better guest to have on, uh, you know, to, to tell that story, frankly, because yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's been one that uh, while, you know, I, I was not his handler, he, he never served in combat, uh, but he was my family's dog. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, like he was one of the best dogs I've, I've ever come across. I mean, he was good enough for me to say, I'll send him to the West coast seal canine program. He's family. Uh, yeah. He's you know, family. And, and I'll tell you, like, he, he guarded my kids with his fucking life, you know, for 12 years. Hell you yeah. Know? So, um, you know, yeah, I just felt like I'll be forever grateful uh, that he played the role uh, of being the family dog when, when they were kids. Hell know, yeah. But, well, I got, I got something for you. Likewise. Actually, I got some patches. Uh, get my sack here. Yeah. I got you some. Um... There you go. Got you some. Benno body catcher oh, sticker. Dude, that's awesome. That's that's Leica with four legs. That was just a picture <laughs> of her with four legs that I had made into a patch. Dude, so that's so seen, fucking uh, cool. Benno's on a my cousin's helicopter. That's actually taken off my cousin's helicopter. Man. That picture right there. You this see one? Him? Yeah. That's, I made it into a patch. 
Dude, that's, so that's so the fucking patch. cool, man. <laughs> These are awesome. Well, I, I will fucking cherish yeah, and appreciate the hell out of these. Oh, Thank yeah, you. man. And then um, your Lake, uh, I've turned Lake is National Geographic oh, into a, dude, a fucking awesome. patch, too. I'm going to have to put that up uh, on, on the coin coin thing. I'd yeah, pro- dude, probably do one rad. of each, probably do Benno and, and hers. Because I've got a, a Space Force patch up at the very top. There. Cool. I see that Space Force. Yeah. And he's got a dog on there, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's you wild. Know? I mean, that's, that's a legit actual sanctioned patch, <laughs> Mount, too. Yeah. Mount, Mount Lasers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here, here's a coin. It's got oh, the, sweet. the mic drop thing on Hell it, uh, yeah. as well as my uh, company logo on the back. I like that. And then this uh, Champions Choice Silver, a uh, buddy of mine, John, out in California that works with these guys. Uh, this is a, a, a new component to each guest coming on the show gets presented with, uh, Ooh. Uh, yeah, with a belt nice. buckle with, uh, with the mic drop on it. So, Dude, that's sweet. Yeah. So, mind, uh, if I sh- mind if I no, show? Please, yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah. I yep. think it's cool, man. Yeah. So thanks to John and, and the company for doing that. Uh, can't thank can't can't thank them enough for uh, such amazing support and uh, and and providing that for all the guests because oh, they, they, sure. they they provide all of that stuff. So C- CCS, cool. what does that stand for? That I have no idea. Okay. I'd be I'd be lying. I could make something up real quick. <laughs> yeah. Um. But uh, man, I, I'll tell you, like like I said, oh, it's, that's what it is. It's champions. Oh, there you go, champions. Okay. Never yeah. mind. Yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's on the box. Yeah, it's on the box. Yeah. Um, Read Trent. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I should have known that. Um, I, like I said, I, I've been wanting to do this interview for a long time. Uh, you know, I've known known of you for a while, and uh, and always thought, man, I'd love to to get you sitting on the couch and and have you tell your story. And and uh, even knowing all all of uh, kind of generally speaking what you've been through, I'm still sitting here fucking blown away by your story. And and really can't thank you enough for sharing it, man. Uh, it means the world to me. I know it'll mean the world to the listeners. And uh, and man, I, I'm super fucking proud of you. I'm honored to to have met you and, and being able to interview you. And I wish you nothing but the absolute best moving forward, brother. Well, thank you, Mike. It's yeah. honor. It's honor to be here and and honor to you know be as raw yeah and as no. uh and as uncut as i, I can yeah. possibly be yeah um, no, i appreciate it yeah no it's it's much appreciated on this end if uh and you know from now until my last breath if there is a single fucking thing i can do to help you out let me know i'm happy absolutely. to do it so absolutely yeah. appreciate you man yeah, absolutely likewise thank yeah. you yeah do yeah uh for the listener uh i know you enjoyed that as much as i did uh i appreciate you guys listening and supporting where can people find you and, and get these patches and uh, support anything that you have going on so uh, tr- uh trent t-r-e-n-t underscore k9 is my my instagram and uh you can dm me um reach out to me anytime um i'm pretty quick to respond and then uh and then you know uh, richard hogg uh the the war dog duco project um, if you, you know, if you go, go to my page and you find, um, if you find Duco, uh, Duco on my, on my, as a, as a friend, um, that is, uh, that is the guy who takes care of Lake, all of Lake's medical expenses for the rest of her life. Um, Amazing. dudes, dudes top notch. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I mean, I, I would absolutely do anything for him. Um, so go there. If you got a little bit of extra coin, donate to his cause. You can actually find it um, at Trent underscore canine. Uh, better yet, you'll find it on uh, my bio. It's a, it's the website link on my bio. So yeah. you can just click there and you can donate up. You can donate a penny or you can donate a thousand dollars. Totally up to you. Um, but it goes to a good cause. And what his project takes care of is he takes care of all re- uh, retired special operation canines, uh, medical expenses. That's what the Duco project is there for. Yeah, that's great shit. Thank you for sharing. Uh, again, thank you guys for your support week after week. Uh, go go show Trent some love. Julian Trent. I don't know if you do have a preference. <laughs> uh, JT. Uh, but, uh, yeah, go, go show him some love and support everything he's, he's doing. Uh, he goddamn sure deserves it. So thank you to everybody, and until next time, this is Mike Drop.